Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Standing Committee on Policy and Strategic Priorities, the meeting of Wednesday, November 17th, 2021. This committee meeting is being convened by electronic means as authorized under Part 14 of the Procedure Bylaw, and as such, committee members may participate in person or by electronic means. For committee members participating by electronic means per the recently amended procedure bylaw, please ensure your video is turned on and let the deputy city clerk know if you leave the meeting for the purposes of confirming quorum. If a committee member loses connection during the voting process, staff will get you back online quickly while we suspend the voting process. The staff contact information has been circulated to you. Video of committee members speaking, presentations and vote results will be projected on the live stream when they are available. We begin by acknowledging that we are on the unceded homelands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. We thank them for having cared for this land and look forward to working with them in partnership as we build this wonderful city together. I also want to take a moment to uh, recognize the incredible contributions of our City of Vancouver staff who work hard every day to help make our city an incredible place to live, work, and play. Deputy uh, City Clerk, may we have the roll call, please? Mayor Stewart has <clears throat> a leave of absence from nine until noon. I don't think you're on the meeting. Councillor Carr is chair. Councillor DiGenova. Present. Councillor Fry has a leave of absence from 9 a.m. to one. I don't think you're at the meeting. Councillor Swanson. Here. Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Weave. Present. Councillor Boyle. Present. Councillor Dominato. Councillor Dominato is late. Councillor Blythe. Councillor Kirby Young. Present. The meeting has quorum, Chair Carr. And I do see that Councillor Dominato is present in chambers now. Great. Let's go over the plan for today. Prom speakers can follow along on Twitter at Van City Clerk for updates on the progress of the meeting so you don't miss your turn to speak. Comments on agenda items can be sent to committee members using the web form on the city's website. The link to that form will be tweeted out on at Van City Clerk. I also want to note the City of Vancouver's long-standing commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, including utmost respect for all genders. I remind committee members that when addressing speakers and staff, please use, uh, sorry, please avoid using gendered honorifics and instead refer to the person by first and last name or role or title. We have six items of business on today's agenda, uh, five staff reports and one member's motion. Um, Sorry, one member's motion uh, that was referred from yesterday's council meeting. We will recess for lunch at noon and reconvene in committee at 1 p.m. Should the business not be completed prior to 5 p.m. today, we will recess for dinner at 5 and reconvene at 6. Should the business not be completed today, the committee will recon sorry, recess reconvene on Thursday, November 25th, 2021 at 3 p.m. Finally, I would like to remind committee members if amendments are brought forward, they must be submitted to the deputy city clerk in final written form before the committee member introduces them. Please ensure the city clerk has received your amendments by using a city meeting amendments DL. Um, Council, I just want to also let you know that if there are any motions that come forward that um, might be dealing with referrals um, of items from this meeting, please also submit um, that in written form. Uh, to the council meeting amendments DL. Um, so as chair for this meeting, I'm suggesting for reports that have no speakers and no presentations that we adopt the recommendations collectively in a single motion. We have um, items two, three, and four on the consent agenda uh, for consideration. Does any member wish to hold any of these items for debate or questions to staff? Just a second, I see Councillor DiGenova. Go ahead, Councillor DiGenova. Thanks. I'd like to hold report number three. Um, I just want to make sure it is report number three. Um, 1464 West 7th Avenue, the Vancouver Masonic Center Masonic. Association Liquor Primary Club License. Yes, that is that, that item. Great. 
and no one else is on the list. And I'm holding it for questions to staff. Yeah, that's fine. You're, you're holding it. Um, and uh, I don't see anyone else on the list, um, Council. So that leaves items two and four for consideration for consent. Um, does Move to adopt on consent. Pardon me? Move to adopt on consent. Um, oh, just before that, and, and I've got, I will turn to you next, Councillor um, Kirby Young. Does any member wish to declare a conflict of interest on the, these consent items? I'm not seeing any. Councillor Kirby Young. Go ahead. I'm sorry about that. Move to adopt on consent. Items, that would be in, in items two and help. four. Oh. We don't need a second. Um, right. Sorry, it was a long night. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm getting a puzzled look by Councillor um, yeah, Hardwick. Um, items two and four are on consent, so everybody's very clear. Can we clarify, three. does that include items one, two, and four, Chair Carr? No, item one is a presentation. Um, items two and three and four were all cons for consideration for consent. Item three has been held by Councillor Di Genova, so we are left with items two and four, to which no one has declared a conflict of interest as matters upon which we're voting for consent at this moment. Is everyone clear? Good. Okay, so um, all those in favor of adopting the recommendations contained in items two and four say yay. Yay. Right. yay. Any opposed say nay. Those are carried. So the following item uh, items have been approved on consent. Item two, 2022 land assessment averaging program, notice to BC Assessment Authority. And item four, single room accommodation, SRA, demolition permit for 52 East Hastings Street. Great. We are now on to um, agenda we will proceed with the agenda items, but before we begin, I just want to remind speakers that you have five minutes to make your comments. You should state whether you are in support or in opposition of the recommendations, and may only speak once. Committee members, you have up, uh, we are in committee, so up to three minutes to ask questions of speakers. However, speakers, as uh, you all know, are under no obligation to respond. I will also ask if speakers are residents of Vancouver, it is, if it is not noted on the speakers list. Our first item is the 2022 Land Assessment Averaging Program, Notice to BC Assessment Authority. And we have Patrice Impey, General Manager of Finance, Risk and Supply Chain Management, available to introduce this item. Patrice? Uh, yes, Chair, we, um, this is just a, a regular report that we do every year to um, request uh, averaging. So there's no presentation, just, uh, just the report. Great, thanks so much. Um, so, council members, um, uh, now open for questions. Councillor Di Genova, I, th I think that might be a holdover. You're not really it's, on the list, are you? It's not actually. Um, you had announced uh, 2022 Land Assessment Averaging Program as yes. the title of this, but I thought we just adopted that on consent. That's item number two. Hmm. I believe it's item number one we didn't adopt on consent, although there doesn't seem to be a presentation posted. It's also a report to Councillor Kirby Young's point, and it's you called are. Annual Financial Absolute, Authority. You, you are correct. absolutely, you Thank are absolutely you. right. My notes are, <laughs> I was dutifully following my notes. <laughs> we chatted. Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> no, no, no. Thank you for the clarification, Councillor Di Genova. Uh, otherwise, that would have been very confusing. Um, so we are <laughs> um, looking at item one um, for the introduction, um, which uh, Patrice MP just did introduce, mm -hmm. which is Annual Financial Authorities 2022. Is everybody clear on that, that in your agenda package it is item one? Dean, as I'm on, the only person on the queue, Chair, I'm, and there's no presentation, I'd be happy to move the recommendation. That, that would be very expeditious of you, Councillor Di Genova. We have a mover. And I don't see anyone on the list for any kinds of questions. Um, but I am seeing some curious faces. Sorry, I better get my Council, I think there was a, or, or Chair, I think there was a speaker originally, yes. and that's why it wasn't up for consent. Yes, that's, that, uh, you're absolutely right. Um, so we have, um, is Brendan uh, Washburn here? Ah, great, thank you, in person? That's fantastic. So again, you do have five minutes to address, oh, it's actually right around in between, yeah, where, the, where are the tables going up and down? Awesome. Okay, and you, 
you will have five minutes and council members three minutes each to um, ask questions. Sounds good. Go ahead. Thank you so much. I'm not the usual type of person who would come to speak on a matter like this, but I do feel like I do have some expertise. For example, when the uh, COVID passport first came into effect, I wasn't really on board with it. But one thing I did was I booked a flight to Columbia for six weeks just to see, ride it out, see what would happen. And before I was going to Columbia, I had a car rental business that was booming. I had a show that was just starting out and I was doing, I was doing pretty good. So then I went to Columbia for six weeks and I came back and then the car rental business ended up going down and the show got canceled and basically all I had was the blonde streaks in my hair from the sun. But I did learn a lot in Columbia. For example, one time we were staying in a hostel. It was me, my buddy, and our friend that we met from Israel. And this guy was really cool. He could do magic and stuff. And we ended up going to this place called Castenio Beach because they had a party. And we went there, and the only rule was you couldn't go in the pool. So we went there. We took some surfing lessons, had a pretty fun day there. And then eventually nightfall came, and they had a ping pong tournament. And we had no idea, but it turned out my friend was very good at ping pong. So he ended up winning the tournament, which was crazy because there was actually a lot of people who were really good at ping pong there. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any questions uh, for you, but thank you very much for, for speaking to council. Uh, councilors, um, that is it for the, um, this, the speakers list to this item. Do you need me to move the report again? That, Chair? <laughs> that would be that would be entirely appropriate. Thank you so much, Councillor Di Genova. Um, so we have this item moved by Councillor Di Genova. I do not see anyone on the list for questions. Oh, Councillor Weeb, go ahead with questions. Questions, or can we speak to the report? You can speak to. The, I'm sorry. Huh. You you. It is to speak to the report or um, points of information if you if you wish. But go ahead for up to five minutes. Yeah, um, after a long day yesterday, I want to just thank the speaker for coming to speak. I think it's something we could use on a day like today. So I appreciate that sentiment, and I also think that it's a really interesting report, and I will be supportive. Okay. Thanks, Councillor Weeb. I see no more speakers to this. Um, so, Councillor or McClurk, I think we can get moved to the vote on this. Point of privilege, I'll need a vote assist in favor, please. Great, thank you. I think everyone's voted, but um, yes, thank you. I just wanted to make sure Councillor Fry was noted as absent, which he is now. That is a unanimous decision. Thank you very much, Council. And we are uh, concluding, that concludes item one. Um, so item two, sorry, has been uh, passed on consent. So we are now on to item three, which has been held by Councillor Di Genova. Um, that is West 7th Avenue, second level, Vancouver Masonic Center Association Liquor Primary Club License, private club, liquor establishment class seven, private club. And we have Sarah Hicks, Chief License Inspector, Development Buildings and Licensing, available to introduce this item. Sarah Hicks, are you not up? Oh, there we go. Nice to see people in person in chamber. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, we, we don't have a presentation today, but we are available for questions. Great. I'm assuming, Councillor DiGenova, you held this. That um, do I you... do, but I cannot get on the queue. If you no, can please no add problem. me, I will call tech after. We will. IT after. We will absolutely do that. Thanks so much. I, I seem to recall. Uh, 
the council received, and I've just pulled some of it up, um, some concern from residents in this neighborhood about the noise levels, considering this would be looking at an establishment that, although on the second level would um, permit 351 people, um, and it could host uh, large events that could be quite loud, and with the addition of liquor, could exacerbate that. So I'm just wondering if staff might be able to um, outline what kind of feedback uh, they got during the consultation process, and if that's something that has been worked out um, with the neighbors. Uh, certainly. Um, during the consultation period, we did receive uh, a number of concerns about the potential for, uh, for noise or neighborhood disturbances related to a liquor primary. Um, however, the application, as, as noted uh, in the report today, is a fully contained uh, unit on the second floor of the building on uh, West 7th. Further, that the applicant has also clarified that the intent isn't to host uh, events or host a nightclub uh, within this location. Its main intent is to host meetings for the club members um, and to occasionally allow for, um, in the updated memo you received, for uh, gaming uh, and television uh, events to occur. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I can't see my time, so so please let me know, Chair. But um, yeah. I, did, I did have another question about gaming what what type of gaming and to what extent this gaming would kind of could could you share a little bit more on the gaming side? Uh, we do have the applicant uh, here today as well uh, that can certainly speak to that. But they did remove uh, from the report uh, items uh, for gaming such as darts and billiards. So those have now been removed from the report in front of you today. Okay, thanks. And is there a limit to how many events that they would be? I mean, if they if some, if people wanted to book. Um, all weekends, would that be allowed? Do you know how many um, they would be limited to? Is there a limit within this license as to how many events they can host with maximum capacity in their venue? There is no specified limit. Uh, no, it would be uh, dependent on the operations of the applicant. Uh, and, and their intent, again, is not to, to operate as an event space, um, but to primarily run uh, as, as a meeting space for their club members. Okay. Uh, so, yep, you have I, one I mean, minute. I'd like you, have, to, you have three can minutes. Can I ask left. the applicant um, how, how they're going to address some of the concerns for noise from the neighbors? Which I, I Council, we received several emails on this earlier on. That's fine. We do have the applicant here. So yes. Um, yes, we do. Perhaps I could just move for a second round so I don't limit them to 30 seconds. Is that all right? I won't have any other questions. I want yes. to be clear. You can, you're free to move the second round, Councillor Di Genova. So I'm moving the second round, please. Okay. Um, I'm not seeing anyone get on the list to debate that, Council. Can um, all those in favor? Oh, um, no. You want to, all those in favor? All those in favor, I'm seeing some hands. I, I, Yay. Any opposed, say nay. All right, um, go ahead. We will have a second round. Councilor Di Genova, you still have a, over a minute in this one. Go ahead. With thank your you thank very you. much. Uh, my name is Bert Hick of Rising Tide Consultants. We've been working with Jack Barr, and the uh, who's in charge of the Masonic Temple. Uh, this is an application for a liquor primary license, which is totally contained within the building. And as a liquor primary, it's a club license, similar to other fraternal recreational club licenses like the Vancouver Tent Lawn Tennis Club over here. And the, as a liquor primary license, they are allowed to have a game such as billiards, uh, darts, and that sort of thing, but we will not have that. We do not have a floor plan that's attached to your administrative report, shows a layout of the establishment, and it does not have a, a billiard table, pool table, dart boards, or anything else. The only thing we're going to have in there by way of entertainment will be some TV monitors. Instead, it's my members and guests only. In other words, you have to be a member of the organization to go in or a guest. Uh, there's no outside patio, and so the, and the uh, noise complaints that we received or concerns from the neighbors had to do with the previous operation there when it was under the food primary license. Jack, you want to take over? 
Thank you. We might as well hear from the guy who actually runs the place. My name is Jack Barr, president of the Vancouver Masonic Center Association, and I would uh, concur that any gaming, that's, it, it's not a club, it's not a light night club. It is a fraternal club. Our members go there for lodge meetings, probably at seven o'clock that end up at 10 o'clock. There may be the possibility on a TV screen, we may want to watch the end of a hockey game, or maybe on a weekend, there might be a Super Bowl party where 50 or 80 at the most of our members come in and utilize the space. Again, it is self-contained. There's no outside patios. It's particularly for anybody that knows anything about Freemasons, you've got 40, 30 or 40 guys coming in their tuxedos to have a meeting and sit quietly afterwards. The Masonic Center has been there since, well, the, the club since 1974. We've operated very well for this club uh, aspect and don't foresee any noise issues coming from this liquor primary application. On the uh, floor plan that's attached to your administrative report, the licensed area is all internal. It covers the two lodge rooms and then a lounge area um, for kind of similar to a hotel lobby lounge, something like that, and one uh, boardroom for 54 people for meetings and uh, uh, group functions. We're not renting this space out to the public. So when you say, can somebody book this for a weekend, this is a private area for our members only. Yep. So just, just a further question of clarification, you won't be booking this out even like if it is a member sponsored event, like we see with some of the private clubs, to like weddings every weekend or large group parties every weekend? That is a separate part of this, uh, of the Vancouver Masonic Center building. So there is, on the, on the okay. fourth floor, there is a banquet facility. That has nothing yeah. to do with this license. This is a liquor primary for our private club space only. Okay, and just to clarify, do you think that got confused maybe in the consultation, considering some of the emails I've yes, received? I just wanted I do. to ask you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm satisfied, uh, Chair, with um, that my questions were answered um, sufficiently. That, that's great. We do have, um, I did start you on your second round um, uh, when no one else was on the list, but we do have Councillor Weeb wanting to ask questions too. So I'm going to uh, take you off. If you did want to get back on, you do have two and a half minutes. But um, I'm just I'm back on to move the report unless Councillor Weeb would like okay, to. Okay, that's Thank great. You. Uh, you are on after Councillor Weeb. Councillor Weeb, go ahead for up to five minutes. Yeah, questions to the applicant. Um, you talk about 40, 50 people, but when I look at the red line report, these are these are quite sizable lounges. I mean, we've got 105, 140 person lounges. Like it's a pretty, as someone that's operated businesses like this, this is a pretty intense floor plan. So can you talk about why the need of this floor plan to meet the needs of 40 to 50 people? And how many members do you have that would be needing it's interesting to meet question. this Interesting question. Um, so Freemasonry is a fraternity. The Vancouver Masonic Center houses a number of different lodges. My lodge specifically has 60 members, some of which are in Vancouver or not. We might on an average night meeting get 20 to 25 to maybe 30 people out to our meetings. On occasion, we may have what's a district event. So we may get some Freemasons come from Vancouver Island, come from the interior to join us for a meeting and that's why we've got a larger room. These rooms are way smaller, but they used to be in the old building because of membership, things like that. But these rooms accommodate uh, special afternoon meetings of gentlemen in their tuxedos coming, having a Masonic meeting. So they're there. We've got a large lodge room and a small lodge room. They were redlined when we were uh, asked to apply for this liquor primary. They said that the fire marshal needs to put down, you know, your maximum capacity. Well, based on square footage, that's the maximum capacity and that's how those numbers got there. It's really kind of irrelevant on what's happening there. As I say, on average, there'll be 20 to 30 to 40 people on a nightly basis, but potentially on a weekend or an evening, you might get a few more if there's a, a, a larger um, event going on, Masonic event. Okay, so this is the maximum. It's, it's not a public event. Again, it's, it's, just, yeah. it's oh, just interesting to understand because these are large numbers for, right? Yep. We have board meetings. There's a boardroom for 22 people that would sit around and have a board meeting before a meeting to conduct our business, such as we're doing right here. We have a lodge meeting. We convene. You might have a, a glass of wine or a beverage or a sandwich after, and then you're going home. 
approval. Yeah, and the calculation of the capacity has been done by the City of Vancouver Fire Department based on the square footage of the space and the exiting. And that's the number they came up with, but we always will probably be operating well within that number. And, uh, and the membership of this club, uh, you might want to help me out here, Jack, but I think the demographics are people over 45 years of age, generally, uh, business people. And uh, so they're not the sort of people that go out and they're, they're not the folks that go to Granville Street. Thank you. Great, Councillor Weep, that's good for you. Great, thank you. Thank you for answering those questions. I think we're um, moving on to the um, moving of the motion. So thank you very much. Uh, Councillor DiGenova. I'm happy to move the motion and I just, um, or move uh, the staff recommendations in a motion and we'd just like to ask a point of information of staff, Go if ahead. that's all right. Yeah. Um, I, I was just hoping that um, perhaps our staff could could uh, remind council, I mean, this is a liquor license that we'd be approving. However, I understand there's annual renewal for that. So if council was hearing from the neighborhood that this was an issue, considering the amount of correspondence we received on this um, and the concern uh, for noise and I suppose um, street disorder um, due to the large size of the venue, is there an opportunity uh, for staff to consider reviewing that? Um, you wouldn't need direction for that. That would be considered in annual reviews of the liquor license, is that correct? Correct, because this is a, uh, a liquor primary application, uh, there's also a time limited development permit uh, that goes along with the approval. That, that comes in with an annual renewal and, and should there be uh, a community impact, uh, we work with the operator first to determine whether or not we can work through that. Um, and uh, there may be uh, the potential of not renewing that development permit should there be uh, concerns. The location is also required to submit a acoustic report uh, showing that the facility uh, does meet uh, and come into compliance with the noise control bylaw to ensure that it doesn't create a community impact from, uh, from what happens within. Okay, thank you. So just to further clarify what I hear you saying, and if you could just let me know if this is correct or not, or correct me, is that there are tools to address noise and, and concerns through the licensing process. Um, should there be an issue um, during renewal or before that time? Yes, we do have tools both through licensing as well as through the development process. Okay, then I'm happy to cautiously support this. At the moment, understanding uh, that, that there may have been some uh, misunderstanding in the community about this and the banquet facility, uh, which I, I know uh, offers stunning views of Vancouver. Um, I also though do understand the concern from the neighbors uh, that, th that this could be considering, you know, uh, Councillor Weeb's point about the number of seats um, and, and I understand that it's based on square footage and fire capacity, but for those reasons, you know, I, I, I really did want to ask these questions and make sure that, that the public knew and had this clarification. So I thank the applicant for answering these questions. I hope that this will clear up some misunderstandings. And I'm, I'm very happy to know that there are tools uh, to monitor this and move forward if there are uh, noise uh, concerns, uh, acoustic concerns, uh, or other concerns moving forward. Thank you. Great, thanks, Councillor Dijanova. And I do not see anyone else on the speaker's list. So, Council um, uh, or Clerk, could you take Council to a vote on this, please? And that um, is unanimously passed. Thank you for coming to speak to the item and to council. Uh, we are now moving forward. Um, item four has been already passed on consent. Um, so we are now on item five. Vacancy control regulations in single room accommodation, SRA, designated properties. Um, and I do believe that uh, we have Sandra Singh, general manager of arts, culture and community services to introduce the item along with Sarah Hicks, chief license inspector, development buildings and licensing to provide a presentation and to respond to questions. There's just um, staff are just moving into place council.
morning. Good morning, Mayor and Council. Sandra Singh, General Manager, Arts, Culture and Community Services. Um, as you see in the report before you today, the report responds to Council's direction to staff to explore options to prevent the loss of affordability and low-income tenant displacement by using city tools to limit rent increases between tenancies and SROs. SRO rooms, as we know in Vancouver, are the last affordable housing option for thousands of low-income residents who face limited to no affordable options in the private housing market. The lack of affordable housing, coupled with low vacancy rates in Vancouver, results in increased competition for limited affordable housing and speculative investment in the SRO stock. If the SRO stock is not protected from rapid cost escalations between tenancies, those with the least income and who find it most difficult to secure appropriate housing may find themselves homeless. While the recommendations in the report support the goal of reducing rent increases and protecting tenants, the most significant long-term obstacles for, to maintaining affordability and livability in SROs continue to be insufficient income assistance levels to pay rent and meet basic needs, unmet health and services needs of SRO residents, reliance on this outdated congregate style of housing, and the significant operating and capital investment costs facing many owners. The city's overarching low-income housing goal is SROs with self-contained social housing and staff continue to advocate to senior government for increased income assistance rates and to develop an investment strategy to do this. On behalf of myself and Andrea Law, GM of Development Business Buildings and Licensing, I would like to thank the project team who prepared this report and who are on hand today to answer any of Council's questions. And I would just like to uh, note that what a complex undertaking this has been. Um, it is a, it's a really... Um, uh, complex consideration and I really want to recognize the staff for their exemplary work here. Sarah Hicks, Juliet Moody, Matthew Young of Development Buildings and Licensing, Grant Murray from Legal Services, Celine Mobilis, Allison Dunnett, Hajar Awata, Monica Sis, Chris Puzio and Judy Robbins from ACCS, Grace Chang and Michael Long from Long Range Finance, uh, Risk and Supply Chain Management and Chris Bass from Strategic Business Advisory. It was truly a multidisciplinary effort. Um, I will now turn it over to Hajar Awata, social planner in ACCS, to run council through this presentation. Thank you, Sandra. Good morning, my name is Hajar Awata, and today I'll be presenting an overview of the report shared with council regarding vacancy control um, in SRA designated properties. Next. There we go. Okay. And I would like to start by acknowledging that we're on the traditional and ancestral unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. They have been custodians of this land for thousands of years, and I would like to pay my respect to the elders and knowledge keepers, both past and present. Next. Last October, Council directed staff to develop regulatory options for vacancy control in SRA-designated buildings. And staff have completed this work between January and November of this year, including undertaking public engagement with key stakeholders over the summer. Staff started working in January by conducting juristic, jurisdictional research and initial stakeholder interviews. Then we developed regulatory options, which were taken to consultation with stakeholders. And in phase four, staff conducted financial analysis and refined the policy options further based on everything we've learned and prepared the recommendations for council. And this here is a summary of the key recommendations staff are making to council in the report. That council implement their proposed vacancy control policy for a single room accommodation designated properties subject to 2022 budget approval and to approve the amendments to the license and ticket offenses bylaws to implement the policy if the operating budget is approved. To accelerate current engagement with senior levels of government on an SRO strategy to fund the renewal and replacement of existing SRAs. And finally, to direct staff to undertake a review of the policy after four years of implementation and report back on the following year on the impacts of an ongoing implementation of the policy. And before we talk about vacancy control, I'd like to give a brief um, background on SROs. 
Approx there's approximately 6,700 residents who live in uh, across 157 SRA designated buildings, mostly in the downtown east side. The province and the city have purchased several buildings to protect the stock and its tenants. And we can see in the chart on the left, the current ownership distribution of SRA designated rooms that are currently in use. Half of the stock, 51%, is privately owned, 40% is government owned, 7% by nonprofits, and 2% by Chinese benevolent societies. And this is in addition to approximately 750 closed SRO rooms. The city monitors the affordability and building condition of the SRO stock, and we continue to observe two trends that impact affordability for low-income residents and rates of homelessness. At one end of the housing continuum on the left, we see buildings and tenants in worsening conditions, and on the other end, we see the displacement of low-income tenants and a loss of affordability in the stock. And looking more into the loss of affordability trend in private SROs, the data shows us that in 2019, the average rents in private SROs were at $561. And for those on income assistance, that's approximately 80% of their income. In the same year, only 77 private SROs were still rented at the shelter rates, and over 700 rooms were over $700 a month. It's also important to note that the high turnover rate in SROs enables rent increases between tenancies, making the stock even more vulnerable to speculation and loss of affordability. And this is a critical issue as these rooms are a last housing resort to many of our most marginalized residents who have limited alternative housing options before falling into homelessness. This pie chart here shows the average annual rent increase in private SROs between 2011 to 2019. And as you can see, owners have different um, business models, raising their rents in different manners. 42% uh, of the private stock shown in green is minimally raising rents at between zero to 2%. A quarter of the stock shown in orange and yellow is increasing between two to 4% annually, which is similar to between at the average inflation rate and the average rent increases and the general rental stock. The third shown, shown in orange are increasing the rents at higher annual rates between four to 17% a year. And this accounts for 28 buildings or just over 1,000 rooms. The orange stock here is where we see the rapid loss of affordability and displacement of lower income tenants. And looking closer at that section on the right, we see that almost 70% of these buildings have been newly purchased over the last 10 years, and only 30% are long-term owners. Vacancy control could discourage that model of investment and slow this rapid rent increase. And next, I would like to show a case study of a 17-room SRO building in the downtown east side, which shows the impact of speculative purchase on tenant stability and room rents. So this building here, between 2011 and 2014, average rents were stable at between $377 and $400 a month. A new owner purchased the tenanted building in 2014 and carried out some minor cosmetic repairs that didn't require an SRA permit and raised rents at turnover. By the next year, in 2015, average rents were at 562 by 2019, the rents went up to $750 a month. So rents overall increased 88% over only after four years of being purchased, or at an average of 13.5% a year. This case study is not a unique scenario. It's actually typical of many buildings within the SRO stock. Our data has shown that following sale to a new owner, rents increased at an average rate of six times faster than buildings that were not sold. And between 2011 and 2019, over a third of privately owned SROs were sold in the private market with seven buildings being sold more than once. And if the current trend continues, the average rent of a privately owned SRO room could be up to $769 by 2029, compared to the current $561. And this context here informed the, vac the vacancy control policy that staff developed. Staff recognize that the scale of the challenge in SROs is significant and can't be solved with a single regulatory option. The, sing, uh, the most significant obstacle to maintaining affordability and livability in SROs continue to be insufficient income assistance levels, unmet residence needs, and significant costs facing many owners. Vacancy control can deter speculative investment and discourage tenant displacement. Staff and government partners are also clear that applying vacancy control to the broader rental stock may discourage investment in purpose-built rentals. But given the SROs are a very small, outdated section of the rental stock and that new ones can't be built currently under city regulations, vacancy control limited to SROs doesn't carry the same risks. 
Staff continue working with senior governments on an investment strategy to support the longer-term replacement of SROs with self-contained social housing and developing options to support private owners to renew and retain their assets while maintaining affordability. And the city also continues to advocate to senior government the need to raise the shelter component of income assistance, which is currently at $375 a month, and offers and partners in several grants and subsidies to support the stock. At Council's direction, staff explored vacancy control as a new tool to protect SRO tenants from the impacts of speculative investment and further losses of affordability that we see at the far end of the continuum. Staff researched other jurisdictions that implemented vacancy control and found a range of regulatory options used to implement the policy, such as a range of uh, rent restriction levels, additional rent increases under circum certain circumstances, building exemptions, and different policy durations. Staff also consulted with different stakeholder groups to inform them of the work we've been directed to do by Council and to get their feedback on the draft of regulatory and implementation tools, which were further developed following consultation. This is a high-level uh, summary of what we've heard. SRO tenants, advocates, and nonprofit operators were generally supportive of the policy and see it as a crucial step to protect the stock and prevent homelessness of some of the most marginalized tenants. Private owners, on the other hand, were generally opposed and expressed that it could lead to disinvestment and building closures in the stock. Nonprofit owners and Chinese benevolent societies were generally supportive of the policy, but had concerns it may create additional administrative burden while they already offer low rents. The residential tenancy board at the provincial level were generally supportive of the policy for this particular stock, recognizing the unique challenges it faces. It is staff's position that the city is authorized under the Vancouver Charter to regulate businesses through the license bylaw and impose conditions on business license holders. And this can be done through the creation of a new license category. It's important to note that this would be the first time that the license bylaw is used to regulate rents in this manner and that implementing vacancy control would not conflict with provincial RTA regulations. And now we'll move on to, th to the strategic analysis undertaken by staff. Staff started this work by developing four key principles to guide the policy development work, with the first two being the key principles to be balanced with one another, prioritizing the affordability while mitigating further disinvestment. The other two are about the effective implementation of the policy from a compliance and fiscal responsibility perspective. Before going into the policy options, I'd like to explain at a high level what vacancy control in SRO buildings would mean. On the left, we find Suresh, who's living in room 208 in an SRO building, and he's paying $450 a month in rent. While under his tenancy agreement, any changes to his rent are regulated by the RTA at the provincial level. On February 1st, he decides to move out and Fumiko moves in instead. If vacancy control were in place, it would regulate the new rent the landlord could charge for Miko. Currently, without vacancy control, a landlord is entitled to raise the rent to whatever the market allows. Staff explored a number of options for increases between tenancies. And this chart here highlights some of these options. They fall under two categories, a single rate that would apply the same allowance across all SRO rooms and a tiered approach that would have different rates based on the rooms of affordability. And as you can see, we explored a range of strict, moderate, and more relaxed models. We then looked at how these models could impact the economic viability of these businesses and how they satisfy the guiding principles. Starting with the financial piece, one of the key goals of the policy is securing affordability while limiting negative impact of reduced revenue on business viability. And to understand the diversity in the SRO stock, our finance, our finance team pulled together data collected from building owners and public records, and also drew on the city's experience operating SRO buildings. We developed different building profiles that covered the most common building models in the stock and also used conservative assumptions to ensure that we're not understating the impact of the policy. We looked at if, at if any of these buildings were um, we made a profit under any, would make a profit, sorry, under any of the vacancy control options over a 20 year period. And the analysis showed that under these conservative assumptions that we've made, 85% of these scenarios were still able to make a profit. However, the strictest vacancy control options resulted in more SRO buildings having a negative cash flow. Also, some of these buildings were projected to experience deficits at certain points within the 20 year period, even without vacancy control in our model. This may be attributed to the conservative nature of our assumptions. 
Overall, the financial analysis paints a picture where vacancy control reduces cash flow for owners as we expect, which may create a risk that some owners may be unable or unwilling to invest in, in improvements in their buildings. This financial analysis and its findings are contained in more detail in Appendix F in the report, and now um, we'll look at how the policy aligns with our guiding principles. Looking at the first guiding principle, we find that vacancy control can be a significant deterrent to speculative investment in SROs and can provide a varied level of affordability protection depending on the option chosen. Also, monitoring the implementation of the policy would give an additional recourse for tenants. However, its implementation could make some owners become unwilling to house more marginalized tenants with additional needs, and it would also be difficult to address any off-the-book payment arrangements. The policy would also need to balance the protection of affordability with needed investments. Allowing a rent increase at turnover can provide a balance between affordability and recouping these costs, and this is also supported by the financial analysis as shown earlier. It's important to point that even without vacancy control, deterioration and unsafe conditions are already experienced in some SROs, and if vacancy control um, is implemented, some owners may cite this as a new barrier to addressing unsafe conditions in their building. However, staff see that vacancy control can actually be an opportunity to incentivize landlords to, to carry out necessary capital upgrades without impacting affordability and to recoup some of these costs um, through city and senior government programs. When staff are considering policy approaches, it's important to ensure maximum effectiveness and fiscal responsibility. Looking at implementing vacancy control in the SRA stock, we expect similar policy compliance regardless of the vacancy control option selected, but we also anticipate some early compliance confusion and resistance that can be managed through close monitoring and education. And from the fiscal perspective, the implementation of the policy would require dedicated staffing and resources as it is a new business area for the city. These costs, however, are modest compared to the high cost of homelessness if the loss of affordability continues in the stock. And this policy assessment led us to the following recommendations. To implement vacancy control on SRA designated properties to be enacted pending approval of budget allocation, and to approve in principle the proposed amendments to the licensed bylaw that outlines the vacancy control policy and enables its monitoring and compliance frameworks, and uh, the amendments to the ticket offenses bylaw that outlines the offenses and sets the fines. Staff are proposing that vacancy control be implemented in a tiered approach with more allowance for rooms renting below $500 a month, which is close to our current average SRO rent. Rooms renting below $500 a month would be allowed a rent increase between tenancies equal to inflation plus 5%, with rooms renting above $500 a month allowed up to inflation only, which is approximately at 2% 2, 2 right now. And this comes, however, with some limitations. This increase could only be applied once a year, regardless of how many tenancies happen during that period. And this increase couldn't be stacked on top of the annual RTA rent increase in the same year to remove any incentive of evicting tenants after applying the RTA increase. The other aspects of the, of the proposed model are that it wouldn't apply to government-owned SROs as they can't be regulated through the licensed bylaw However, this is not really a concern um, to the effectiveness of the policy as these rooms are rented at or close to the shelter rate as it is. The creation of a new SRA accommodation operator license category um, is also a, a crucial part of the uh, monitoring and implementation. And that category would be deemed to anyone providing rental housing in an SRA designated room at no cost and uh, without any application process. And the province have re has recently, through the RTB, created a process for landlords to increase rents on tenanted units to support critical capital investment and extraordinary operating expenses. And this proposal recommends allowing a similar relaxation process for vacant rooms in the same building. So how would this work if we implemented it? Next slide. Thank you. This shows, that at a, this shows here at a high level how staff would work with landlords and tenants to implement and enforce vacancy control. Going through the top line, landlords would be required to submit an annual rent roll, which staff would proactively monitor and review. Moving to the lower line, our new tenant Fumiko could submit a complaint to the city if she suspects her landlord isn't abiding by the bylaw and is overcharging her. Staff would review this complaint and investigate accordingly. Triggered by either path, staff would then resort to the appropriate enforcement option if a bylaw offense is confirmed. 
This policy can't be implemented within existing resources and requires an annual budget of $500,000 a year, which includes the hiring of three additional staff. These staff would be responsible for monitoring the annual rent rolls, overseeing compliance, and ensuring stakeholders are well informed of the policy and its implications. When, it's, when it comes to enforcement, staff have a number of tools that can be used, including education, ticketing, license orders, and prose prosecution, depending on the situation. If these recommendations are approved by Council today, we propose that the bylaws come into effect immediately after the 2022 budget approval that will be discussed in December to avoid the risk of evictions if implementation is further delayed. And to conclude, in response to Council direction, staff have explored vacancy control as a tool to protect low-income tenants from displacement from the SRO stock and have brought forward a model for Council's consideration. We acknowledge that vacancy control will not solve all issues in the stock, but their proposed model can deter speculative investment and loss of affordability and allow current owners to recoup some critical capital investment costs and extraordinary operation costs. And staff will continue discussions with senior government on an intergovernment strategy, um, investment strategy that can support the replacement of this aging stock with government-owned self-contained uh, social housing. And before um, we start the questions period, I would like to highlight the public feedback received on the policy between October 14 after this morning. We received a total of 231 emails, 230 in support of the policy and one in opposition. And this included letters from the following organizations which were all in support. BC General Employees Union, the Downtown Eastside Neighborhood House, Living in Community, Spec Theater, Aboriginal Front Door Society, Rent Strike Bargain, Vancouver Tenants Union, Union Gospel Mission, and a group of low-income Chinese tenants currently living in SROs in the downtown east side. Thank you. Great, and thank you. Uh, Council, uh, sorry, Chair Carr, if, if yes. I may just very quickly want to follow up with one particular comment uh, to the presentation that's provided. And first again, just to acknowledge Sandra's comments of the, the work that our team has done on this file, it's, it's been exemplary. Um, and noting the, uh, that Council has received an extensive amount of correspondence on this issue, it's obviously a matter of considerable interest um, there's one issue that I've noted in, in some of that correspondence um, where I think the, the, the challenge that staff have spoken to in SROs, the, the dual challenge of affordability and livability is essentially um, blamed on, quote, bad landlords. Um, and for sure, uh, we have had and have problem landlords um, managing some of the SRO stock in Vancouver. Uh, but I would suggest that's not an accurate characterization of the real challenge here. Uh, and I would go back to Sandra's uh, initial comments where she mentioned the fact that uh, tenants, um, particularly tenants on income assistance, simply can't afford market rents in Vancouver. But that doesn't affect what we're talking about here. These are private buildings. We are, society, governments are relying on the market to house people um, who are essentially living on income assistance. That's, I think, a, a really fundamental piece here. And notwithstanding some of the issues with the landlords that we have, that's a systemic challenge. As, as uh, as you referred to, you know, a 375 um, shelter component of income assistance is totally disconnected from the actual cost of housing. That, that is a very fundamental challenge. And I think long term, um, this is a really important tool and our staff have done a good job of balancing the interests here. But in the long term, this is not a solution um, to the issues that we have in Vancouver in particular with private SROs. Um, and if we are expecting that, um, you know, individuals that are low income are uh, housed at, at a, a rent that they can afford given their income, there is going to be required additional public subsidy. Uh, and I think that's, that's well beyond the city's capacity to provide. It's as staff have talked about, I think we're working hard with our partners in senior government to address this issue. Um, but I think until we've resolved that, whether it's purchase of these buildings or replacement of these buildings or additional income so that people can pay rents that are closer to the actual cost of housing, we're going to continue to struggle. So I think this is a really important tool that Council is considering today, but it isn't a long-term solution to the challenge. So just wanted to um, kind of add those comments and again, thank the team for their work on this. Thank you. Appreciate that, Paul Mokri. Um, so we, um, that presentation, I believe, has ended. Uh, you're now open for questions. Great, you have quite a few councillors um, with questions. First, Councillor Kirby Young. Councillor Kirby Young, up to five minutes. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and good morning, staff. Thanks for the presentation. I want to start off um, with respect to the feedback from the Chinese Benevolent Associations, and you had referenced that in your report that um, ostensibly this report is targeting so the private sector and 
some of the challenges we've had there in the SROs, but the CBAs are, are particularly unique in terms of the fact that these are cultural and historical assets and they hold these buildings for a long time. And in fact, they have had their rents sometimes in some cases significantly lower even than shelter. So my question there is that um, after consultation with a lot of the stakeholders, there is an opportunity um, potentially, I wonder if staff can clarify to add an amendment to this report um, that the SRA designated rooms that may be below the shelter component of, in of income assistance could be increased um, their base rent um, upon vacancy to the shelter component of income assistance. And that, that could be amended to the report and, and still be workable within the model staff are proposing. Is that right? Go ahead with your response. Yes. Um, Okay, thank you. Um, yes, thank you. Um, we have um, been uh, uh, um, in discussions with legal and um, we have provided some comments back to, to the proposed amendment through the city manager um, and uh, are supportive of generally looking at uh, making that exception for rooms that are renting um, below 375. Okay, and there were two different, because I was also going back and forth with legal and there were sort of two different um, solutions being explored, one being potentially a category exemption uh, for those buildings owned by um, not-for-profit CBAs versus this alternate approach of um, bringing the opportunity to bring the rooms up to shelter rate upon vacancy. And can you explain why you feel that, that this is a better route to go than exempting the CBAs as the other option? I think we would want to look at, um, the proposed approach in the policy is to look at, at rent thresholds and we would want to ensure that um, there might be instances where rooms are renting below 375 to people that are potentially not eligible or on income assistance. So our recommendation would be to um, stick to the below renting at 375. Um, and should there be a turnover in tenancy that that rent be increased to 375, but not tied specifically to a type of owner um, or use. Okay, and, not, and maybe just to clarify, not tying it specifically to type of owner. Can you just reiterate that? I, I wasn't fully clear on the response because yeah. our, recommend, um, our recommendation is to tie it to the rent. I think requiring that someone be on income assistance would make it difficult to verify um, that they are receiving income assistance. And I think tying it to the rent simplifies it also in terms of the administrating uh, uh, that change to the policy. Okay, because in the other scenario of exempting the category, you're suggesting you would require verification of income assistance. Correct. Correct. Okay. That's clear. Um, thank you. Um, the other question that I wanted to ask is really with respect to the administrative cost that staff have estimated um, a need for $500,000 to implement the program. Why does it cost half a million dollars to do that? Um, staff have done a lot of work to look at, um, I think, the, the need to um, implement the policy, um, collect the rent rolls, um, look at auditing um, the rent rolls and the owners as they come in, as well as, as looking at the complaints and monitoring the stock, that there are costs, so staffing costs associated with, with implementation, um, as you'll see from the report. And another major component is, is kind of the education and informing owners of the new policy as well as tenants. So there is some, some need to provide funding to, uh, to support those activities. Okay, follow-up question to that. Um, it says in recommendation B that half a million dollars is to implement. Is that envisioned to be a one-time cost or an ongoing cost? What is the source of funding and what are the options for source of funding? Sandra, do you want to speak to that? Sandra Singh, General Manager. Um, so that, uh, that would be a, um, a consideration for Council in the 2022 budget deliberations. So we have submitted this amount, the $500,000 for that for that process, and the source would need to be the operating budget as it is ongoing operating funding that's required. So Sandra, just for time, is that an ongoing cost every year or is that envisioned to be a one-time implementation cost? Yes, thank you for clarifying. It is it, it would is envisioned to be ongoing because we would need to be managing and monitoring the bylaw every year. Okay, and Chair, can I move for a second, move for a second round of questions? Um, absolutely. Um, yes, you can. All those in favor of the second round, say aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. That's fine. Councillor Kirby Young, you've got that and you're out of time on this round. Thank you. Councillor Dominato. Uh, thanks, thought. Chair. I'm going to go through my questions quickly. So I have quite a few. Um, first question is, can you just confirm for me that with the proposed policy framework that it would apply to the 382 privately owned 
uh, rooms in the 15 Chinese societies owned rooms. Is that correct? Correct. So just over 400. Okay. Um, and then I'm curious if you could comment on um, the risk that was identified in terms of cash flow and the uh, inability or potentially willingness to continue operating uh, some of those buildings. And I'm curious specifically about the risk of maintenance. We know many of them are already in disrepair, um, but I am um, curious about how we will handle that from an enforcement standpoint. So not enforcement of this policy, but the building maintenance, um, as well as the liability aspect of that. I might ask our colleague Sarah Hicks to respond to that. She's on the line. Yeah, thank you. Good morning, Council. Um, uh, in terms of managing the uh, items such as standards of maintenance, we'll continue to work with owners um, with uh, with those requirements. Uh, that the bylaw uh, and safety is absolutely paramount in that regard. Um, and uh, it will certainly be something that, uh, you know, would be considered if this is enacted uh, in terms of the review uh, that is uh, expected to happen with, uh, in the next uh, three to four years. And is there any risk of um, the city being found liable for um, building maintenance in light of um, the proposed vacancy control? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if that's uh, something that I, I have the information for today. That's certainly something that uh, that we can look into. Yeah, maybe it could come after because I think we have quite a few speakers. Um, I want to uh, a couple of related questions. I want to circle back to a point that Councillor Kirby Young was raising around um, the ongoing expense of half a million dollars for this. Is is there an opportunity for the renter's office to play a role in um, monitoring the renter, the, the roles that are submitted and the enforcement? So we just implemented that and I think there was a number of FTEs added. So I wonder if that was looked at as an opportunity or a means to support this policy work. Um, staff certainly did an assessment of existing um, staffing resources capacity um, and feel that in order to implement this policy, we, we would require the additional positions as well as the funding for the educational component. Thank you. Um, and, and then I'm curious, and I don't know if staff can comment on this. I know that the mayor has been having ongoing conversations with the province and the Minister E.B. around um, the province engaging in further purchase uh, of uh, SRAs uh, in the city. Um, that's been done in, under a number of governments now, and I'm curious if we have any indication that they'll be pursuing that further. Um, we're actively working with both the provincial and federal government on developing an SRO uh, investment strategy. Uh, I think Council will be familiar with that. It's come here before. We are working to develop a strategy towards the end of January. Um, I think there's a lot of interest right now. Um, also, I think the pandemic shone a light on the inadequacy of these rooms. Um, so we are hopeful that uh, uh, everything will come together and that there will be some movement on replacing these with self-contained social housing in soon, hopefully. And then last question is, and maybe this all have to come after through legal, is whether um, we see, again, with the, the risk around cash flow with some of the owners, that this is a pathway leading to a pathway of further expropriation, potentially, uh, of these buildings. Um, I, I think the conditions in SROs are, are an ongoing challenge. Um, as you'll note in the uh, in the report before you, we have made an exception if there are some significant major building system failures. There is now a process for owners to apply to the residential uh, tenancy branch for some exceptional expenses to increase rent. So our policy is aligned with that. Um, our, our intent is, is uh, to ensure that we are supporting those major important um, capital upgrades, but at the same time implementing a policy to, to um, slow the speculative investment that we are seeing in the stock. I'm not sure where I'm at with time. Or you've got um, 35 seconds. Okay. Um, I'll pause there. I know we have a second round, so thank you. Great. Good. Um, just before I move on, um, just in response to a comment you made, Councillor uh, Dominato, there's no second round of questions after we hear from speakers, but I would move into debate and decision if, if um, recommendations are moved, and you can always ask points of information during that time. Okay. I thought Councillor Kirby Young had moved a second round of questions. Did I misunderstand? Uh, that comes first now. I thought you said maybe after speakers, but Oh, I'm, sorry. Yeah, just okay. to, to uh, remind Council that um, after speakers, it will then be through points of information. Great. Thank you. And Councillor Bly, over to you. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, and thanks for 
the work on this report, I actually just had a follow-up question to Council Dominatos, and Adams, and it's regarding um, more um, sort of individual unit uh, upgrades that are made and that, the, as you mentioned, the RTB, the landlord, and the tenant both can leverage that process in order to make sure that they are being treated fairly and also that they can... So basically, at the end of the day, if they invest or require upgrades that go beyond maybe what the 5% increase, as one example, would cover, and the RTB allow that or, or sort of support the, the landlord requiring a greater increase beyond 5% as one of the examples. How does that work with this policy in terms of sort of what, what, goes, what comes first, the, the RTB supporting the, the landlord or our policy restricting um, in that circumstance? The RTB, the RTB process would happen first. Um, typically, any type of upgrade like that would require an SRA permit. So if they came to us and provided the evidence that they showed and that they were successful at the RTB, we would then permit that through our SRA bylaw. Okay, and how do we feel about the, I don't know, efficiency and efficacy of that process and making sure that between tenancies, landlords are able to actually get those upgrades um, sort of adjudicated and completed in order to have a new tenant and do we just do we expect or have any concerns around unnecessary delays in that sense? Um, I think I think it will be an ongoing process. In particular, it is a new policy, so when it's implemented, I think there will be a, a bit of a, a learning phase and learning curve. Um, I think we have uh, with our through our property use inspectors. Um, again, um, should uh, council approve the recommendations in this report, some additional staffing. I think we'll have some more um, boots on the ground, so to speak, um, to to understand more what's going into the building, as well as we have. Um, Again, organizations that are very much involved in the hotels and, and uh, advocating for both tenants and landlords. And also, I might just mention that um, we also have other tools. This is a stopgap measure. We have SRO upgrading grants and other tools that we can also use to support owners. Maybe Alison Dennett wants to just speak to that as well. <laughs> All right, Alison Dennett, uh, Senior Planner, Supportive Housing, ACCS. Just to be clear, Councillor, um, the RTB process is really focused on significant building upgrades, mm -hmm. not the kind of attendance out for a week, I need to clean some things up in the room. This is really them taking significant upgrades they've made into improving the building. Um, and so that is specified under the RTB. So we still see landlords being able to, under the current system and under vacancy control, they should be able to paint the room, you know, get it back into good nick uh, for the next tenant. But this would really be about a more extensive uh, investment into the building. Okay, I, I, okay, that's helpful, thank you. Um, uh, okay, I do have uh, some follow-up there, but I might go back on the list for that. Um, I'm curious about the um, the RAP program, the Residential Rehabilitation um, Assistance Program, and I've heard about it actually through the SRO Collective, talking about really advocating to bring this back because it allowed federal and provincial investment into um, SRAs, essentially, and then that would restrict rents from increasing over 10 or 15 years. That makes a lot of sense. Why is that program not available in the same context anymore? I know it is still available, but not in the same context. Yes, that was a, a federal program um, that did see a lot of investment uh, in SROs that secured um, rents for a period of time on the basis um, of a for forgivable loan to business owners. Um, it's something definitely that um, I think um, at the City of Staff we've advocated for, and I know the SROC has as well, um, and something that we will be um, hopefully having a conversation uh, with, with our federal colleagues as we develop the SRO revitalization strategy. Okay, and so in the, like I'm thinking, um, you know, FCM is an example that works a lot on advocacy around housing at the federal level. Is there any ongoing conversations happening there? Do we need some direction to sort of push that forward in terms of opening up the toolkit, so to speak, in terms of what options are available to us for advocacy? Yes, I think that would be great. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll leave it there. I'll go back on. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Councillor Bly. Councillor DiGenova, up to five. Thanks very much. Um, and I'd also just like to start by moving that we have a round of questions after we hear from speakers. Let me just check with the clerk. I'm not sure. Here, I'll, I'll just check first to see if that's in order. One second.
Uh, Council Chair Nova, that, that's not going to be allowed. Um, in conferring with the clerk, you um, can ask questions of speakers, of course, during the, the process of hearing from speakers, and you may, um, after those speakers, as I uh, mentioned um, to Council Dominato, uh, you may ask points of information in the debate and decision. Could, I, could you restart my timer? Is that was more about point of procedure? I'll restart it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I will look at suspending the rules of procedure by law to see if we can do that um, but uh, for later on. But I'm, I'm just wondering, um, for staff, right now, um, staff have calculated the time and cost to the city, I understand, to be um, roughly half a million dollars and some new staff also. How much time do you estimate this will take SRO or SRA owners every month? on a monthly basis to prepare all of the information they need to send into the city? Um, we are, um, uh, the policy would, uh, as proposed, would uh, require um, an annual submission of rent rolls, um, unless there was- Oh, I know what it requires. I just wondered if you had figured out how much time on average you would expect that that would take um, for nonprofits, I, especially, that are working in other areas right now, if um, they'd have to hire additional staff. Um, I, I, I would uh, I would assume that any landlord would have a, a good record keeping of rents and that it would be a pretty standard process to submit those as part of the business license renewal. Okay, so you're not asking them to submit anything they don't currently submit or that would be onerous to put together? Correct. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm wondering if BC Housing has re endorsed these recommendations and this report before it was finalized. And I have the same question for nonprofits that fall into these categories. I'll let Alison Dennett answer. Um, we consulted on the recommendations with BC Housing and the nonprofit uh, sector because, in their capacity as um, owners of SROs, um, and the nonprofit partners um, who attended the session definitely had questions about how they would um, participate in this, um, but were generally supportive. Um, and BC Housing has been generally supportive of our efforts uh, to protect low-income tenants from displacement into homelessness. I understand that uh, and appreciate that, but I'm wondering if they endorse this report. I know we've had re reports before that have been endorsed by BC Housing, so have they signed off on these final recommendations and endorsed them? Um, Sandra Singh here, Councillor. Um, given that uh, BC Housing and government-owned SROs are exempt from this bylaw, we did not seek any uh, formal endorsement from them for this. Okay. Um, do they fund the nonprofits and some of the rent supplements, though, for people living in SROs? Uh, typically, for many of yes, they fund operations. Yes, but but the rents typically the rents in those SROs are at three seventy five. Thanks, and sorry, I'm just, I, it, it's like a lightning round here because I'm trying to get through all my questions too. Even with the second round, it will be hard. But um, under the City of Vancouver bylaw number 5462, standards of maintenance, and you may recall I had moved forward a motion um, to look at how we uh, enforce our maintenance and also recovering the cleaning costs that the city gave to private owners, uh, which I suppose probably could have more than covered these costs that we face now of implementing this program. Um, I'm just wondering if staff might be able to, to share um, how we're doing on that bylaw, 5462, standards of maintenance, and are we enforcing that as the bylaw says, and how many um, SROs have faced fines of uh, 250 to $10,000 per day in the last year? Um, I might ask my colleague, Sarah Hicks, to respond to that. She's on the line. Good morning, Council. Uh, that is uh, unfortunately information I don't have at my fingertips at the moment, so uh, it is something that I can uh, look into. Thank you. I might ask you as a point of information at the end then and, and see if you may have some of that information. I do appreciate it. Also wondering, um, I mean, is there a concern that we're already not enforcing? Um, and that, that was my understanding uh, when I asked points of information in this previous motion that was brought um, last year. I'm wondering if uh, there's any concern that we're not enforcing all of these bylaws that we already have before looking at creating new uh, obligations and bylaws. So um, I think to Councillor Dominato's point, which pointed out everything I've laid out in this previous motion, 
um, you know, the standards of maintenance that address things like uh, thoroughly clean and sanitary condition, free of pests, including insects and rodents, fixtures and appliances in good working order and repair, floors, stairs, doors, walls, windows. Do we face any liability that we're adding layers of, uh, you know, uh, compliance to something when we're not even enforcing the bylaws we currently have? So just before you answer, um, Councillor Dijanova is out of time, but per, but oh, she can go, go back, back on, on the list. Thank you. So if you want to take note of that question, I'm sure she'll ask it again. Um, I appreciate, Councillor Dijanova, that you um, indicated that you may ask a point of information and specified what it was. I think that's helpful for staff generally um, if they, uh, so uh, city manager. Um, can you stop the, my timer pretty please? Thank you. Uh, this doesn't matter because you're you're over your time anyway, so you're fine. I mean, okay, but you can't. Round two. Okay, you, you're going you. to go on in round two, Councillor Dijanova. Um, if councillors are thinking they might ask a point of information after um, the uh, the speakers, uh, would it be helpful for them to either email and if so, to whom, or state it during their time now? Yes, thanks, uh, Chair Carr. It would be very helpful, and I'm happy to have those questions emailed to me, and we can work with the team to. Great. Thank you. Thank you, City Manager. Um, Council, if you're all aware now of, um, of questions you may want to pose later, please send, send them in written form to, if, if at all possible, to the City Manager. Great. And we're now on to Councillor Hardwick. Go ahead, Councillor Hardwick. Thank you very much. What is the percentage increase allowed currently on an annual basis by the Residential Tenancy Branch? 1.5. 1.5. Okay. Um, so what is the legality of the City of Vancouver superseding the jurisdiction of the Residential Tenancy Branch? Um, I'm hoping Grant Murray is, is on the line. That should, legal should answer that question. Grant Murray, are you in the line? Yes, uh, I'm Grant Murray. I'm um, a lawyer with the City of Vancouver. Uh, my understanding of it is that we can create regulations in relation to businesses, provided that they don't require you to breach the Provincial Tenancy Act. My understanding of our program here is that nothing that we're doing requires you to breach in any manner the Residential Tenancy Act. We're authorized to regulate businesses. These are businesses. We're proposing regulations in relation to businesses. And uh, generally, the test, as we understand it, is that it's called the test of impossibility of dual compliance. Does what we do require you to breach another statute, a provincial statute? If that was the case, we could not do that. My understanding is that we're not doing that here. In fact, we're, you're, if you think about it in the classic, the residential tenancy branch requires you to wear a belt. We're making you wear suspenders, and now you'll be wearing belt and suspenders. Does this change the fact that uh, they could increase uh, rents by 1.5%? No, it does not. Okay, that's important to know. Um, you know, we've talked about the fact that we don't want to, to uh, punish good operators, because obviously there is a spectrum of uh, folks that are, are running these businesses. Um, I think, as you stated earlier, the problem uh, is that uh, income assistance hasn't increased uh, beyond 375 a month for how long? When? They they have increased the overall income assistance rate, but the shelter rate hasn't changed in in many many years. Okay, be, I'd li like to know how many years. That should be fairly straightforward to find out. But if 2007. 2007. Okay, great. So. Um, our problem is that we haven't increased um, income assistance consistent with inf the rate of inflation and the rate of, uh, of rent increases. Is that an accurate characterization? Yes. Okay, so the real problem is that, that income assistance is not increasing. Um, so with private, um, with private owners, I mean, they, they are businesses that... that uh, you know, even if it was characterized as profit, but positive cash flow, is the objective of this ultimately to put private SROs out of business? 
Uh, no, d no, definitely not. Um, what uh, the aim, the intent of the, uh, the policy is, uh, should it be adopted, is to um, deter um, the speculative investment that we're seeing in the private stock. What we're really hoping is that uh, good landlords, and I assume many of them, maintain their tenancies over a number of years and would be eligible to increase the rents as per the, the Residential uh, Tenancy Act, annual allowable increase. But this is really to target that speculative investment that we've seen um, increase over the last few years. I understand the the uh, the comment about speculative investment, but our the question is ultimately: Are we punishing uh, the SRO operators by virtue of this policy? I think again, it's a stopgap measure. We do have other ways that we are supporting uh, supporting owners, and I think the approach that staff are recommending the re in the report is a is a moderate approach. There are some increases permitted in between ten tenancies um, to to strike that balance. Has any other municipality in Canada attempted to do this? I suspect not. I'll let Hadra answer that question. She's done the, the research. Hi. Um, yes, the, uh, Vancouver actually did have uh, a form of vacancy control in the between 74 to 87, I believe. Um, the dates, the exact dates are in the report. And also uh, on the east, um, there are a few, a few cities that have also uh, a form of vacancy control. Toronto? No, um, in, 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 New, in Nova Scotia. In Nova Scotia? Yes. Okay. And, uh, and the appendix in the report has a lot of details about them. Okay. Um, I'm pretty much out of time, so I'll come back on. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Councillor Hardwick? Councillor Weeb, over to you for five minutes. Um, yeah, I guess my first question is, in the report it talks about the full-time workers are going to help with negotiating and reviewing applications, helping with government revitalization. Can you talk a little bit more about how they can help revitalize these buildings and ensure that they don't fall on the lower end of disrepair and so how they can help get funding and how they can keep the buildings in order, recognizing that a third of our overdose deaths are happening in SROs, so we really need to ensure we bring up these buildings to a point that the health and safety is meeting the needs of our residents. Yes, Councillor Reeve, uh, apologies, I missed the first part of your question. Uh, in the human resource section of this, it talks about how the three members won't just be um, enforcing this work, but they're actually going to be helping with applications and working with the buildings to look at uh, partnerships with senior levels of government for revitalization of the stock and other work. So can you talk about a little bit the other work that this team will be doing other than just enforcing the vacancy control, but looking at helping support, lift up the stock. Yeah, yeah correct. I mean, I think um, uh, council and, and staff, we've been working um, um, in SROs for a number of years. Um, and so this would really uh, provide some additional complement to all of the work the city already does in SROs. So again, working with tenants, information, um, ensuring they're accessing necessary resources, working with owners um, on potential other, you know, should a, a wrap <laughs> program come back into place for SROs or other potential um, funding or, or services that they could use to support the tenants in their building. So, so there is kind of the, the implementation, the monitoring, the enforcement component, but definitely also a, a kind of a relationship building information education component to, to the staffing that would be in place. And that would also help with programming, ensuring we have trauma and culturally aware programming to lift up and support the residents in need. Um, my second question is, you talk a little bit off the book or the hard to house, which are two elements or two s groups that might struggle with this type of program. Can you talk about how we're going to help ensure that those people are being taken care of um, and people that want to be off the book or people that are considered hard to house? Um, recognizing my stepbrother was one of those at one point, and so I want to know how this program is going to ensure that the people that might cost more for an owner to house will be taken care of. Um, we we um, we definitely recognize the importance that this stock plays um, in in housing folks. Um, I think this policy per se, per se doesn't really get at the 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 supports that would be needed for, for those tenants. I think um, staffing being in those buildings and maybe working with owners if they do have a tenant that needs some more supports could connect them back to other city resources like our outreach team or connections to um, our uh, uh, services provided by our provincial partners. So that would be a, an ability to have a bit more insight into what's going on with the buildings as well as working with, uh, with advocates that are in those buildings and understand what the needs are of some of the tenants. 
Okay, yeah, no, it looks like it's gonna make a big difference. My last one's on, because um, I was shocked we went from 705 shelter rate in 2003 to only 77 in private stock. How many do we still have that are vacant? And do we have a policy or do we have something that's really, I saw a little bit in there, but how are we gonna to work to get some of those back online? Hi, Councillor Beep um, and Council. Um, we have approximately 750 SRO rooms that are not open uh, and tenanted at this time. Um, and we're working uh, on other fronts, as uh, Celine mentioned, with our provincial partners to move forward on um, redevelopment of buildings that have come to be closed because this stock is so important. Um, and so that, that is another stream of work going on at the city and, and with our provincial and federal partners. Okay, so that's part of the SRO investment strategy is to look at how we can get those 705 back on stock. Exactly. Perfect, great work. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Weeb. I'm moving on to um, Councillor Fry, up to five minutes. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, and, and really great work on this. Um, and I appreciate this new presentation that we're seeing uh, today. Um, I'm just, I'm curious, First off, if there's any uh, thoughts around, I, I'm seeing this sort of correlation between some of the new investors and cosmetic upgrades and high toner turnovers and increased rents. Uh, so I, I'm sensing it's a, it's a definitive business model that's being explored by some. Have, has there been any contemplation around where that kind of business model may turn to next um, as this unfolds? Sort of the unintended consequences side of the flow of least resistance? Um, we haven't um, thought about necessarily, but I think uh, the SRO stock um, and just given the trends that we've seen um, is is that unique um, part of the private rental stock um, that made it attractive for that speculative investment. That's kind okay. of okay, and 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 further that the that the the, the SRO bylaws really look at the the form of housing rather than the tenure right now, and that's why this is so important. Correct. Uh, second question, uh, and this is um, more to the, the situation with the Chinese benevolent associations and recognizing that, that um, you know, that um, I've been to a number of the benevolent associations and their the tenants are quite elderly and, and often the operators are quite elderly and I don't necessarily sense that they have the, the capacity to, to deal with a lot of the sort of opportunities that might come through other granting and 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 I'm curious how how well engaged have they been? How well engaged will they be moving forward? And um, and and it, and if there's concerns around, around, are we making that appropriate connection? Recognizing this is an incredibly unique kind of housing vernacular um, that is somewhat separate, but obviously connected. Um, yes, uh, Alison done it. Chinatown is a really important uh, SRO partner for us to work with, with the Chinese Benevolent Associations. Staff in ACCS work closely with the planning staff working on Chinatown transformation. We've actually adapted uh, specific uh, granting tools to work with the Benevolent Associations uh, in partnership with the Chinatown transformation team. We also do uh, consultation um, in, in native language and ensure that we can uh, work with operators. So. This is a priority group, um, and they are getting, I think, the uh, equitable and focused attention that they need, and we look forward to doing more work around this in the coming years as the city works around the UNESCO efforts and other pieces. Okay. I understand there's a there's an SRO table, a, a three-level government SRO table. Will, will the CBAs be included in that capacity? Um, I, I will say the government table has been doing pre-work right now, um, and in some of our workshops, we have actually had the staff working on the Chinese Benevolent Association redevelopment come and specifically present their work and their goals and vision that have come from community to CMHC, BC Housing, and the provincial government. So they're very much acknowledged and noted as a key stakeholder and a priority for the work. That's great. I really appreciate that because certainly that we've heard in the past that they've been sort of marginalized from a lot of these conversations. So I appreciate that attention to the, that from staff. Thanks. That's it, Councillor Fry. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Um, I wanted to follow up on the source of funding conversation because um, we started to get into the amount being an ongoing one, but 
I'm looking at the renter's office report previously that indicated, for example, one of the recommendations further that council allocate $2.4 million to resource the City of Vancouver renter advocacy and services team for three years, source of funding to be the empty homes tax revenue reserve. I wonder if you can explain why the empty homes tax is not a, a possible source of funding for this work. Sandra Singh, uh, Sandra Singh here. Um, so the the challenge with the empty homes tax is because it's a uh, um, it's a unpredictable each year and it's a diminishing tax. The goal of the empty homes policy is to eventually not have empty homes. Is that to rely on it for ongoing operations? is a challenge. So with the renter office, for example, we are going to have to come back to council shortly um, in the future year around ongoing operating funding if council chooses to continue to offer that service. So with a, with a bylaw like this that we're, that we're implementing, our recommendation is that rather than create a future uh, budget scenario where we have a service that's expected that we can't fund anymore, um, that we, we start this one out of the uh, ongoing operating budget. But it is possible, following up on that, and thank you for that, it is possible that council could take a similar approach to the renter's office and fund this work, say, for three years from, from that, um, from that uh, source of funding, correct? I think we would have Sorry, to... Sorry, it's, it's a Grant Murray. My understanding is that the law department's position on this was that it was not, uh, did not fit into the... Uh, did not fit into the requirements in the statute for the way that the empty homes tax can be spent. Can I get expansion on that and however much you can give me now and if there's a written follow up on that because we also have bylaws that council enacted such as an enhanced and strengthened TRPP, tenant relocation protection policy and, and other policies um, for the um, Sandra Singh's comment um, in order for the rental folks to do this work. So I'm just not clear on the distinction. Um, unfortunately, I did not uh, provide any advice on this, but I'm aware of what the position was, so I'll have to get back to you on it. And if, if you can reply, Grant, and also provide um, indicate then whether or not that renders that um, funding um, to be incompatible or actually contravening the EHT report um, in terms the, of funding the renter's just, office. Sorry, just for clarification, Councillor Kirby-Young, what's the other funding that you're talking about? It's gone to the new rental office. It's the report that was titled Renter's Office Report Back, May 31st, 2019. Okay. Um, and uh, it's recommend a number of recommendations where it references the EHT, but there's one specific large one that refers to recommendation C, for example. And it includes uh, a specific EHT and it specifically indicates that it's going to move towards staff and the intention, yes, it's time, time limited, but it specifically indicates an intention to also carry on that work. So I don't see how that could be in order. I'd like some information back on that because if we can do it for that one, I don't see why we can't do it for this. Okay, I'll look into it. Thank you. Okay, that would be very helpful. Um, and then I guess my other question is we haven't had um, a report back on that renter's office work and I believe there are about seven, uh, seven and a half um, FT equivalents that were added to do that. And I'm just again wondering why this work could be integrated in that if a lot of to the comment were rent rolls are available and provided by staff and the number of different buildings you'd be checking. Is that not feasible that those seven and a half approximate FTEs could be doing this work? Um, just for cl clarification, Kirby, um, Councilor Kirby Young, are you asking whether the renter office staff could be doing this work? Yes. Um, the the renter office has a full program um, at administering grants. We've got the renter inquiry line. We're doing um, a feasibility analysis right now of the um, proposed renter services center that uh, council directed us to do. Um, and we will be reporting back uh, in the spring on, on work to date and next steps. Um, but that is a full work program at this point. Okay, do we know when council are gonna be getting any kind of report back on that? Um, we will be coming back to council in the new year with the next uh, phase of recommended grants. And in the spring, we'll be coming back with a feasibility analysis of the proposed renter services center. And I think Alison Dunnett would like to. And just for clarification on the new staffing positions proposed, um, they are uh, more akin to say a property use inspector or an on the ground uh, staff member who'll be going into buildings as they will be documenting issues and leading up to enforcement. It's an incredibly different role than we have in our policy teams in the renter's office. Great, and okay. thank you. And that is it for your time, Councillor Kirby-Young.
Councillor Bly for your second round. Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, just a quick follow-up. Is our renter's office team fully staffed right now? Yes. To, since um, part of the COVID response, financial response was to perhaps hold open headcount. I'm just triple checking that we didn't that we that wasn't necessary with the renter's office and it's fully staffed. It wasn't necessary with the renter office because it was funded through EHD. Okay. Um, and just further to the questions, and not to go too far off of track here <laughs> with the report in front of us, I just am curious how. And maybe this is a note that can be sent later. We have a lot of speakers, but just in terms of how the empty homes tax um, monies have sort of changed over the course since its inception, and then also given the three percent, the increase to three percent, just what we're anticipating with that. So I know it's outside of this specific, but we obviously have a pretty salient question here coming up around funding. My recollection is that the empty homes tax annual report will be coming to council shortly. So I'll uh, refer back to Patrice and Pete, <laughs> our CFO, to um, to see how, how that information is included. Okay, great. Uh, so back to the report. I just have a question on slide 16, um, and I appreciated the visual. I'm not sure if uh, the slides can be brought up again or not by our clerks, but I'll just reference the one I have in front of me. <coughs> There's sort of an indication just by the, the, the visual um, that that further loss of affordability is on the right side of um, talking about the policy intent. So worse condition buildings, mid buildings and investor buildings, further loss of affordability risk is in the investor buildings. So I'm inferring from this that this report is really going to help us target those investor buildings more than anything else is what I'm getting from this. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'd like to just add one more thing, um, Hadjer. Um, also earlier, I showed a pie showing a green section, a yellow, and an orange. Mm -hmm. um, that was on slide um, on slide 10. And that one there, so what we're trying to do is trying to prevent the orange third from getting bigger. And that's where we're seeing increases from 4 to 16, 4 to 17% a year. So we want to lim we don't want that piece of the pie to get any bigger. Okay, so what I'm just trying to reconcile is the concern with um, our liability and we're, we've discussed that so far with other councillors' questions. We've talked about violations and monitoring that, that this policy, although those can come up for sure, they're, they're not as common in the policy approach here in terms of the BART buildings that this particular policy intent is targeting. Yeah, this is targeting a lot of them, the, similar to the case study that I had shared, mm -hmm. where a building is purchased and it just suddenly a couple of some paint and minor repairs and bam, it's just $200 more. So we're talking about buildings where they're not necessarily simply housing people who may be um, unemployed. We're, we're talking about buildings where you'll have international students and, and others who are employed um, also looking for affordable housing mixed in with other folks that may have more traditionally been housed in an SRA. So that's how we're seeing the tenant population shifting towards those that are employed, and that's why those rents are justified at seven or eight, nine hundred dollars a month. Yes, I, I, Allison Dunnett, just wanted to say to the pie chart that Hadger was showing you there, it really is about protecting the entire stock mm -hmm. because what we are seeing is buildings that are in the green and in the yellow being purchased and being pushed up into that orange slice of the pie. So a building uh, may currently have a low income tenant base, a more traditional SRO tenant base long term, purchased, those tenants are moved out. Uh, and then you see that building over time up, move up into that orange slice. So the protection has to be across the stock to slow that movement so that we don't see that orange slice growing so much. Right. Okay, uh, just one last question. Do we have a sense of how many SRO buildings are on the market right now for sale? I think the last time staff looked, I don't have that number today, we can follow up and present it to council, but I think we were monitoring uh, between 10 and 20 buildings that were up for sale. Out of how many again? 156. 10 to 20. Yeah. Yeah, it would be really helpful to know which closer, to which range uh, and that would, that is. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that's it for me. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Councillor Bly and Councillor Hardwick. Thank you. Are we not concerned? I mean, we've said that we want to protect stock. 
Are we not concerned that by uh, our, our objective pro to uh, protect stock is being contradicted by potentially pushing private operators out of business? Um, this, the SRA bylaw manages the rate of the change in the stock by requiring an SRA permit for conversion of a de or a demolition of a room. This policy is targeted to um, slow the, the increase that we're seeing in speculative investment, so it's targeted to the rents. Yeah, but um, if, if I were an operator uh, faced with, with uh, smaller margins and, and just being able to continue to exist, um, I, I would get out of the business. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how that protects our stock. I find it contradictory. Mm -hmm. we, we do, uh, again, um, to read it, we do see it as a stopgap measure. Um, and it is one of uh, many tools that we have available to private owners. And ultimately, what we do need to see is see the stock replaced with self-contained uh, social housing. So we do want to put them out of business. We, we, I think there are a, a variety of owners that are out there and owners that have longtime tenants, they can continue to look at those rent increases. Um, we, um, we have options to support owners that want to continue renting. Um, some owners that uh, may want to get out of the business, um, I think that's just probably a natural course um, across, across any, any type of owner. Imagine. Well, yeah, if, if their margins are, are um, going into the negative, um, uh, related, so the vacancy control is part of this report. The other one is the request for half a million dollars in a headcount increase. Um, what has been the headcount increase in ACCS over the last five years? Um, Councillor, I don't, Sandra Singh, I don't have that information at my fingertips, but I can um, get that information for you and respond with the other questions. Right, because I'm just looking at this report, there's, there's the... Um, uh, several different sub-departments that are affected here, um, homelessness, the SRO and supportive housing group, FP&A. Um, I think it would be um, informative for council to understand how this department has grown over the last five years in particular. Um, and uh, councillor, if I could clarify, are you looking at the entire ACCS because it's quite broad or just in particular housing and homelessness? And, and housing. Okay, thank you. Thank you. That's it for me. Great, thanks Councillor Hardwick. <laughs> Councillor Swanson. Yeah, in terms of implementing the recommendations, have staff um, talked to the Ministry of Social Development about could they share their, um, I know they, sp they pay a lot of rents directly to landlords, so they would probably have a list of the rent rolls of most, in most of the hotels for most of the people. Could we do some sharing thing here to make it easier. Uh, uh, Councillor, uh, if the question is in relation to the uh, amendment that was being discussed around um, adding in. No, no, just in general, in terms of getting the, uh, the rent rolls. If the landlord didn't have the rent roll or something, could you get it from the ministry? We do have, for most yeah, we do. We do have conversations with ministry about information and data sharing. Um, it is a complicated area, particularly around freedom of information um, and people's personal data. So um, we have structured this policy to address that um, and ensure that we're not uh, contravening um, freedom of information and uh, information protection. But we do work closely with the ministry and um, I think there's lots of opportunities for collaboration uh, on uh, supporting tenants. Okay, thanks. Um, Staff have said a couple of times that the purpose of this is to deter speculative investment. Um, I know I've seen ads for SRO hotels for sale where they advertise, instead of saying this is an SRO building, they say micro suites, and then they list all the fancy restaurants that are nearby. Um, is this something that, um, you can, can you explain a little bit more about the speculation part of it? Like I also know of landlords who have actually paid their low income tenants to leave so that they can raise the rent, like $1,000, $2,000. Um, when, when I was uh, working before I got elected in, in Carnegie um, as a volunteer, a lot of people came to me who were being offered money to leave so the landlords could raise the rents. So I'm just wondering if you've encountered this and 
Can you expand a little bit on the speculative investor concept? Um, yes, I, I definitely, um, it, that is something that we are hearing and um, also seeing uh, in particular through our outreach office where you will have a building that sells, uh, the new owner uh, sees it as an investment opportunity to, um, to, to, to increase uh, investment potential and in, or rent potential in the building. Um, so what you typically you'll see is uh, if a tenant leaves the building, <clears throat> they might do some upgrades and paint the room or perhaps add a hot plate and, a, and, a, and some other, um, uh, you know, basically improving the unit um, and doing improvements that, that don't trigger the SRA bylaw um, for the existing tenants, many of whom still have the, the lower rents. Um, they might be offered a buyout. Um, they might be required to pay for perhaps a FOB or, or other costs associated with the building that they can't afford. So there's pressure to move them out so that that vacant unit can then, uh, the rent can increase for the new tenant. So that, that is that, that, that what we're seeing. It's a, it's a kind of a change in the tenant mix and the rents are increasing substantially. And when we say we want to preserve the stock, it's we want to prefer, preserve the stock for the existing low-income people who need it so they won't be homeless, right? This, this stock does play uh, an important housing of last resort, recognizing that, uh, that it is inadequate and our, our ultimate goal is to replace it with self-contained social housing. So this is, this is a stopgap measure. Okay, thank you, dear. Thank you, Councillor Swanson. Councillor DiGenova. Thank you very much. Um, could I start by asking, Chair, would you mind stopping my timer? I have a point of procedure. Done. Go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for. I won't need the whole five minutes for my questions. I hope. But just the point of procedure is, um, I understand that for those following along in the proceedings, that it's difficult often to hear names of speakers sometimes when they're called, um, or to keep accurate accounting and list of that. And I'm wondering if there's anything that precludes us from sharing the list of speakers online, understanding that speakers can sign up with whatever name or email they want, and we require no proof of identification. But I'm just wondering, as it's always been posted in the third floor um, foyer of City Hall, if there's a reason we can't be sharing that, especially as the um, speakers' names are read aloud publicly. And I'm just wondering if we could share it publicly so that everyone has access to it. Okay, the um, City Manager. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, we're aware that this concern has been raised uh, by the member of media, so we're looking at this right now. There, there are some privacy issues here, but yeah, under, understand the question, and we can follow up with Council uh, once we've had a chance to just reassess that. Thanks, and can I just, on a further point of procedure, ask, do you have a time frame as to when you might be able to follow up with us on this? Yeah, discussing it with staff uh, right now. Um, so I, as, um, my hope would be to have an initial answer for you kind of by this afternoon, um, and then subject to kind of that assessment, we'd be able to give you a sense at that time whether it's something we can address immediately or whether there's other things that we would need to put in place. Um, Thanks, that's wonderful. That. Just wanted to make sure it wasn't waiting until another council meeting. Thank you. And now I do want to okay, follow so, up on Okay, so you're, so you're done with you. your, you're, you're starting now with questions? Yes, All right. I'm starting with my questions, and I'll start with the point of information that I had asked um, staff as to uh, the, the current bylaws that we have that we can implement to make sure that there is cleanliness to rooms. Um, right now, under uh, lodging owners, section... 21 of the City of Vancouver bylaw number 5462 standards of maintenance. Um, I I'm, will ask afterwards after speakers for the question I had before about the $250 to $10,000 per day, how many fines have been issued. But I'm just wondering, why aren't we moving forward to put time and energy and this money into implementing this and the cleanliness and quality of life and looking at that in these SRO or SRA rooms, considering we know many people from the encampments preferred living at the encampment over their room. Could you tell me what we're doing to make sure that we're upholding the bylaws we currently have before implementing new ones? And I'd ask uh, Sarah Hicks to potentially answer that question if she's on the line. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Council. Thank you for the question. Um, in, in terms of the enforcement of the standards of maintenance, uh, it, it is uh, a bylaw that is uh, you know, regularly enforced by our property use inspectors and which will continue to be done. 
end that the proposal in front of you today is separate from that in order to curb the speculative investment as well as the rapid rise and in increase uh, to ensure that individuals can continue to afford to, to live in these spaces as well. Um, as highlighted by uh, my colleagues uh, earlier, uh, the policy does also include opportunities for owners uh, to seek further rent escalations um, from the province, both for um, capital investments as well as extraordinary uh, increases in their expenses so that they can continue to provide for uh, and, and maintain their rooms in a livable fashion uh, and to ensure that they're both in compliance with the standards of maintenance bylaw as well as providing a livable space for their clients. Thanks. I'm, I'm just on a follow-up question to that. How often do we have our city enforcement bylaw officers going through these SROs to make sure conditions 1 to um, A to F in section 21 uh, for compliance required by lodging owners is indeed um, in working order and that they are in compliance with their bylaw. How often would you say each SRO is visited by a city staff person to uh, consider um, section 21, sections A to F? I, I will uh, ask my colleagues uh, in DBL uh, for information related to that answer and we'll provide you uh, information through email. Thank you very much. Or if we could even have that after the speakers, that would be really helpful in helping me to make my decision. Um, also wanted to ask a, a question about uh, looking, looking at this in, in the larger context of trying to protect SRO space. Um, I'm just wondering what precludes someone, we've heard these stories before at Council, a, a lot of them were last term, um, we've heard them from a number of people, we've heard them I think even from the Vancouver Police, I remember reporting on this at some point in time, that people were in fact handing over their you know, rent money or checks and instead they were receiving an exchange of some type of goods or substances and so they were they had paid their rent or used their full rent money, although they didn't have a place to stay, but their name technically could be on that room. So is there any concern that that could happen? I remember when we talked about this, we were talking about SRO um, owners or SRA owners now, um, renting these rooms several times over the same room and accepting the money for that room more than one time a month. So I'm just wondering what stops them from having someone who is on shelter rates and social assistance, putting their name on that room, but not actually living in that room. Do we have any type of system to stop this? And I've asked this before, but I'm asking again here because I think it's appropriate. Um, I, th I think ultimately, I, I don't, uh, I think ultimately that's a, a residential uh, tenancy branch issue. Um, I know that is something through our outreach office, for example, that, that we do sometimes find those pieces. We work closely with the ministry on those issues as well, especially if an income assistance check is going to a building. But um, I, I think that's, that's an ongoing challenge in some of the buildings. I, I don't think necessarily that this, this piece would, um, would address that, um, but it is another tool in our, our toolbox. Great, and that's Thanks it for your time. time. Yep, thank you. Councillor Dominato, over to you. Uh, thanks, Chair. I um, wanted to just circle back on a question with respect to the role of the province in, in this work and recognizing that the, you know we're doing this under our own jurisdiction, um, within our ability uh, with business licensing, but I'm curious if there is an opportunity, because I know we were talking about this in the context of the renter's office of co-location and, and working with the province around the administration of the renter's office, of the province playing a role in some of the administrative um, parts of this um, policy. Um, I, I think over the years we have we have asked the province to consider um, vacancy control as we're proposing here today um, um, through their task force. They, there's even though they acknowledge the kind of unique character of SROs, they've not gone ahead and done that. I think the the the, the cost associated with implementing that we're putting forward in the report is really necessary in terms of that ongoing kind of monitoring and enforcement. And I don't see the province as potentially having a role. That being said, we are working together in the intergovernmental working group, and there are other opportunities for collaboration. For example, through the RTB, um, if there is an issue where where where. Uh, a residential tenancy agreement with the tenant is being impacted or something's happening in a building. We are partnering with them on that front, but in terms of implementation of this proposed po policy before you today, I think that would be um, specific to the city as it would pertain to our bylaws. Thank you. 
That's great. And then uh, one last question I forgot to ask earlier was I noted in, I think it was the presentation of the report uh, in the consultation that was undertaken, uh, which included some of the property building owners, um, there was seemed to be a range of feedback where others said that this would be catastrophic and others said that this was manageable. Could you just sort of tease that out a little bit for me? Because obviously there's a number of different SRO owners out there, but just the perspectives, what you heard from them on this in terms of managing maintenance. Yeah. Maybe I'll defer to and Allison. whether they will divest or not. Is the Allison would like yeah. to. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Um, yeah, we did hear a very wide variety of, of reactions um, and speculations, um, and some of that feedback was both uh, individual owners uh, giving us a sense of where they thought they might go, but also their view on the stock and, and other uh, owners. Um, and so we did hear from some that they felt this was not going to be a significant issue. Those were more typically owners who's, who have already gone through a kind of escalation of rent scenario and are renting to uh, a non-traditional tenant uh, in their SRO buildings. And so while they may be um, maybe difficult to have the inability to raise rents, they didn't view this as a significant impact on their business model. There were others who maybe uh, based on the current rent model they have, the business model they have, um, or an intention to move towards that, this might frustrate that model. The, we also did in the finance work, as you'll see in the appendix, look at things like whether or not the buildings had mortgages still on title, whether they had a business at the ground floor. That's often a, a strong cross subsidization for some owners. So it really is, and I, I think staff have tried to stress this, this is such a diverse stock. Uh, it has very diverse tenants. It has very diverse, diverse um, units in it um, where some rooms are quite challenged and, and difficult. Others are, are quite clean and, and, and great homes for low income people at the stay. So we've really tried to run the gamut of that and consider all of those different owners, but each one will be impacted differently. Great, thanks for clarifying that, appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. That's great, thank you. Um, that is it for uh, questions to staff. Um, thank you, staff, both those in the chamber and those online answering your questions, very much appreciated. Um, Council, I just want to remind you that um, uh, that if you have qu uh, questions that you believe uh, right now, you or over the course of the next um, time period as we listen to speakers, you want to address as points of information um, in the period following the speakers, please do send that if you can in written form to Paul Mokri, our city manager. Um, so we are um, now going to hear from speakers. Um, speakers heard by phone will be patched through by a moderator when their turn comes up. For in-person speakers, the clerks will ask you to come forward to the podium when it's your turn to speak. Uh, you can um, take comfort in the fact that the podium will be sanitized in between speakers. Our first speaker on the public representative bodies list is Tanya Webking, co-chair to the Renters Advisory Committee. Tanya, if, the, if you're on the line, just um, state your name and then go ahead for up to five minutes. Hi there. Good morning, Mayor Stewart and City Councilors. I am Tanya Webking, and I'm here representing the Renters Advisory Committee as co-chair, and I'm speaking on their behalf. Our committee believes in supporting vulnerable renters in the city, and therefore there certainly isn't more vulnerable population of tenants than those living in single room accommodation. Therefore, we fully support vacancy control regulations in single room accommodation designated properties. SREs are the final stage of housing before homelessness as they are the last affordable housing for many on fixed incomes. Without this basic protection, the tenancy of 4,000 of the most at-risk renters are on the line. And how will the city address 4,000 more homeless individuals when services are already stretched beyond capacity? This measure will only slow down tenant displacement. It's intended to de-incentivize uh, tenant displacement. Uh, individuals on fixed incomes cannot afford rent increases. It's untenable. Any increase in rent is a pay cut, which is difficult for most, but it's incredibly harmful for the residents who are trying to survive on social assistance. How would other residents in the downtown core feel about an influx of thousands of more homeless individuals on the streets? If these measures are not implemented, this is the inevitable outcome, as these at-risk tenants will not be able to transition into market rate housing with the average cost of $18.55 for a one-bedroom apartment in Vancouver. We definitely need to push the province to increase the basic benefits and to provide support for the private owners of SRAs to maintain this vital housing stock. The small measure doesn't 
doesn't address the livability conditions of these units. They're unsanitary, unsafe, and we should be ashamed as Canadians that this has somehow become an acceptable standard of housing. SROAs are a public health issue. It's a humanitarian crisis. Yet here we are still fighting for these units and these residents because there is nowhere else for them to go. Vancouver Coastal Health refers to these buildings as two-person buildings because they're so violent and unsafe. Vancouver Coastal Health workers are not allowed to enter these buildings to see clients on their own due to the serious safety of escalated level of violence, including violent attacks on workers. The Vancouver Charter has broad powers over licensing and businesses, so these recommendations could certainly be exercised under this guidance. Private SRA investment groups will continue to displace vulnerable tenants in an effort to increase profits the nature of capitalism. The private market will never make decisions based on tenant needs, and so this must be recognized and responded to accordingly. SRA vacancy control does require administration and oversight, but implementing these measures are not excessive expenses, and caring for people should always be in the budget. People before profits, always. Now for some recent research. According to UBC, in a first ever national study, so that Vancouver is the eviction capital of Canada at a 10.5 eviction rate compared to Toronto's 5.8 and Montreal at 4.2. We have a major issue in Vancouver and it's your job to find creative solutions. The Canadian Real Estate Association also announced that housing prices increased over 14% over the past year at an inflation rate of 4% and quote, the fastest increase in cost of living in almost 20 years, almost unquote. We're in a crisis and we need a response that matches this. We also know that social housing, that housing is a social determinant of health and we need to care for all residents of Vancouver. We need to remind everyone that the cost of housing people at this level is between 14,000 and 22,000 a year uh, compared to the cost of 53,000 to care for a homeless resident. People without homes draw significant costs through our social services, according to the University of Manitoba. And finally, a 2018 report from The Economist determined that Vancouver real estate is overvalued at 65% higher than it should be, making us the fifth most overvalued market globally. This community is suffering. We need to stand up and speak for them as they cannot speak for themselves. To quote Thomas Jefferson, the measure of society is how it treats the weakest members. The Renters Advisory Con Committee will continue to speak up on behalf of marginalized renters. As a self-proclaimed city of reconciliation, it is your fiduciary duty to protect the most at-risk community, which have zero protections against predatory developers. I would like to remind you that over 30% of the residents in the downtown east side are Indigenous, and the city must honour its duties to this community. As an Indigenous woman, I cannot stress enough the importance of decolonizing housing. This happens to be the city of reconciliation on unceded lands, so we need action. Decolonizing housing simply means that no one is homeless. This is where reconciliation begins. You need to make peace with the stewards of this land by taking care of all in need, by ensuring housing for all. A few hundred years ago, capitalism didn't exist on these lands. Homelessness didn't exist on these lands. There's currently an art installation in Minnesota by Indigenous artist Courtney Cochran called Never Homeless Before 1492. It's powerful. It's moving. To truly walk with reconciliation, there must be housing for all. No one must be left out in the cold. And vacancy control for SRAs is a vital piece to keep 4,000 at-risk tenants housed. Please de-incentivize greed. On a personal note, I'm oh, the Indigenous actually, Tanya, Manager. Excuse me, Tanya. Um, you have gone quite considerably over time, but you do have questions. Um, so thank you uh, so much. I, can I just, I, I ha I'm just wrapping up. I have one more small paragraph. Oh, um, perhaps you can work it into it. I mean, happy to ask it in my question if you'd like to. Yes, hear. thank you. Um, we're going to sure. yeah, yeah, wrap up with so your paragraph. Just a second. Um, we're going to advance Councillor Di Genova, who's asking questions. She's uh, she's asking you to wrap up. Go ahead. Okay. No, Masi Cho, for your time today. I'm ready for questions. No, you can you can repeat. You can say your your paragraph. That's fine. Oh, I just um, 
I'm, I'm the Indigenous Case Manager for AIDS Vancouver, and part of my position is outreach, and I spend a lot of time in the downtown east side and in these SRA units that we're discussing today. I first started working in the downtown east side in the 1990s, and I thought the conditions of these buildings couldn't possibly get worse, but here we are. I feel very protective for my community, and I'd like to point out that there is a huge population of seniors living in these units, and we need to take better care of all of our elders. Implementing these recommendations is the bare minimum possible that the city could do to protect the most vulnerable renters in the city. And we, as the Renters Advisory Committee, are asking that you approve and implement SRA vacancy control. Masi Cho, for your time today. I smudged for all of us this morning. I hope that we all walk in a good way. Haichika. Thank you very much. And thank you for accommodating that, Councillor Deidre Nova. Go ahead with questions. No problem. I, I did also have a question for you. And uh, it, it's similar to a question that I'd ask our staff. And, and considering um, you're here representing the, uh, the Renters Advisory Committee, I'm wondering what do you think about um, our action right now as a city on the maintenance bylaw 5462 that I'd mentioned? Some of, some of those pieces, you know, include uh, making sure that the, the SRAs right now or SROs are clean and in sanitary condition, free of pests, including insects and rodents, fixtures and appliances in good working order, floors, stairs, doors, walls and windows in good working order, heating system in good working order, and so on. So there's different compliances and the owner can currently, under our current policies, be fined 250 to $10,000 per day on this. So do you think that we also should be focusing on implementing that and using the tools that we have to make sure that these living conditions are better? And I have a minute left, but I wanna leave that to you if you don't mind answering. Oh, I really appreciate the question, Councillor. You know, having seen these units for 25 years, we've never actually had any full compliance, but I always feel that everyone deserves safe housing uh, and one that has heat and the basic necessities for survival. Um, I was not part, I did not get to listen to the full meeting. I am calling in from work, uh, which they are accommodating me for this time, uh, but definitely improving the lives of all renters in Vancouver is definitely uh, something we're concerned about. So with the last, the last few seconds I have, can I ask, do you think that it's just as important to implement this bylaw as it is moving forward with the last one to make sure that owners are complying or a lien could be put against their property? So I, you know, these owners are not victims. They purchased these buildings uh, with full knowledge of the condition. I can't imagine anyone buying a building uh, with that cost without uh, assessing it. So uh, there has to be a little ownership here for uh, for the property developers. Uh, there is risk in every investment. And when you invest in something knowing that it is going to require uh, a lot of money to upgrade, uh, you know, we do need to work with them, but there also has to be, uh, they, they did make a choice. And thank, and that's you. My time. Thank, you. thank you so much for that answer. Thank Thanks, Great. Chair, for giving me a few extra seconds. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Councillor DiGenova. Um, and, uh, Council, I just want to remind you that it is three minutes to ask questions of speakers. Um, thanks so much. And we are now moving on to our public speakers list. Uh, speaker one is Norm Leach, Executive Director of Vancouver Aboriginal Community Policing Centre. And if you wouldn't mind, uh, Norm, stating your name um, to begin with. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Norm Leach, uh, Executive Director at the Vancouver Aboriginal Community Policing Centre. Also, uh, uh, I'm also Chair of the Board at the Aboriginal Front Door Society and uh, Co-Chair of the Metro Vancouver Aboriginal Executive Council. So I speak in favour of this motion and I commend Council for calling for this report and also the staff for uh, developing uh, quite a comprehensive report as well. And I presume that in asking for this report and uh, giving ample time for it, that there is general support for this direction, which again, I commend. So the, our office serves the urban indigenous community in Vancouver in all areas that they face injustice. And unfortunately, there's many 
And of course, we're overrepresented in all of those areas, uh, including homelessness, including poverty, including violence, including murder, including uh, COVID, including overdose deaths. And so when COVID struck a year and a half ago, uh, most agencies closed, but a few agencies kept going in the downtown east side uh, in order to serve the uh, the people who are going to be hardest hit by everything and have been hardest hit by everything. And what they discovered was that these people are amazing survivors. They are probably the greatest survivors that this society has or has ever seen. And the resource that these people represent is unimaginable. And also that they tend to occupy these SRO rooms which are the last resort before homelessness. And the SROs were developed as a place for resource workers in British Columbia to live while they came into town and get their pay and spend a few weeks and then go back out into the, the woods and the fisheries and the, and the mines. So that business model is gone now, but the SROs remain and, there's a, and they serve that final purpose and place for people to live as best they can within the means available. Unfortunately, global market forces have forced prices to rise and neither council nor the provincial government nor the federal government can control those forces and affordability is becoming an issue for everybody, but most of all for the people who are down here. So what we also found downtown with all the other agencies that we work with providing food, shelter, uh, supports, is that there's a wealth of experience and expertise on these issues and many others. So there's now a group of agencies working together to solve these issues and to bring together the people who have the greatest interest in solving these issues. And that's the citizens and the residents in the community and the agencies that have served them for five, 10, 20 years now. So we're happy to see this come forward. We're happy to help now uh, and with, with all our many community partners. So, but this is just really the first step that's needed in order to close this door and to provide these people some hope and opportunity and option until something more lasting can be developed. We're very encouraged and inspired by the people and the ideas that they have in the community. And we, all we want is a, a bit of time and that this motion will provide in order to continue the conversation and help not only the city, but the province and the federal government develop a long-term sustainable solution for, for housing in this community. And, and, we'll, and we always propose a, an indigenous, a cultural, and ultimately a decolonized approach and solutions to, to these things. But we're very encouraged and inspired by all the input that we've had and all the support that we've had. And I believe that by our count, there's more than a thousand letters in support for this motion today. So that's encouraging for us as well. And we're very committed to uh, continuing uh, this work and this conversation. With that, I thank you for listening and hope that we uh, are successful. Great, thank you very much. Uh, you do have questions, so if you wouldn't mind re remaining on the line, Councillor Swanson with questions up to three minutes. Yeah, um, thanks so much for uh, calling in, Norm. Um, really appreciate it. I'm just wondering what you would say to the folks who are thinking that this these recommendations would uh, penalize the investor landlords too much. Well, investors are by nature investing to get a return. Uh, this business model really doesn't exist any longer. Uh, to invest in this business model is not a wise investment decision, and I don't think it's council's job or any government's job to, to protect businesses from the market. Um, it was, I think previous speakers have said, it, it, it's, it's a speculative investment. And by that nature, that's the way it goes. 
um, the, these are property owners, people who can afford to, to buy and, and hold property. Uh, I don't know that they need to be protected from their own tenants. So. Okay. Uh, they're, they're, not, they're not investing in this property, they're investing in, in a different business model. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much for calling in. Great, thank you, Councillor Sponson, and thank you so much, Norm Leach. Um, there are no qu more questions. You were very clear in your presentation. Thank you. Um, Council, we don't have enough time left um, to hear one more speaker um, before lunch, uh, so um, I think we should just call the lunch break now uh, and, um, and resume at 1 o'clock. Have a good lunch, everyone.
Good afternoon. This is the council chamber checking to see if the TELUS line is working. Are you able to hear me, Carlos? Yeah, I'm able to hear you. Perfect. Thank you very much for your assistance. You're welcome.
Welcome back, everyone, and um, I uh, hope everybody had a good lunch. Uh, we are going to continue with our speakers on the public speakers list to item five, vacancy control regulations and single room accommodation, SRA, designated properties. And we are beginning with speaker two, Wendy Peterson. Uh, good afternoon, City Council. Can you hear me? Perfectly. Yeah. My name is Wendy Peterson. I'm the director of the SRO Collaborative Society. I want to thank Norman Tanya for the opening speeches. I have so much gratitude for the work that you do and so many people do to help get us all of our eyes on the same line on the horizon. I also want to acknowledge that I've lived here most of my life um, and I'll always be a settler and visitor in the downtown east side from other lands. And I want to pay my respects to the land, which is our first ancestor and to the matriarchs, elders and hereditary chiefs of this territory. I'm addressing my comments to the council, but also my peers in the downtown east side. I also want to pay my respects to the displaced Indigenous people in the community, past and present, and to their families. So many tenants have lost their lives in the hotels because of the social conditions related to, to um, race-based race systemic violence. And that history is still playing itself out today, and they're always um, in our minds. So I'm pleased that today, our data and objectives are aligned with the City of Vancouver, and I thank the city staff for their work. I thank Councillor Swanson for her five decades of leadership on this issue. And on behalf of the Estero Collaborative Society, we support the staff's recommendations for this new legislation. I have two points to make about the issue before you today, and I may not get to my second point, um, which is about landlord escape hatches. But the first one is, um, Right now, there is a partial form of rent control in place in the SROs, which is the main driver of homelessness in our neighborhood. So people are very upset about homelessness. And this is why you got over 1,000 letters from individuals in support of the staff recommendations and so many letters from groups. This is an important historical moment. 35 years ago, XO 86 ejected hundreds of SRO tenants onto the street when SROs converted to tourist hotels. Olaf Solheim of the Patricia Hotel died. The coroner wrote on his death certificate, death by eviction. The community rallied for 15 years after that and finally in 2002 got the SRA bylaw to slow the conversions to offices, condos, and tourist hotels and prevent more evictions, homelessness, and death. But the S3 bylaw did only half the job, and the pipeline to homelessness remained wide open, and because of it, homelessness continued to grow. This time because of a more invisible and softer form of conversion related to the weak rent control in place and the ability of landlords to significantly increase rents between tenancies. So it's time to reset the market's expectations around what people can do with low-income people's homes again. Let's not conflate the property rights of landlords with the right to maximize profits, especially when it's at the expense of people's lives. I'm very sad that it's taken us this long to get here. To be honest, in the meantime, we've lost so many neighborhood residents to the process of displacement that this policy is trying to prevent. This has created a lot of unnecessary chaos in, their, in tenants' lives and in some cases, death. And for the most part, we try to stay not bitter as you all know, um, we try and we carry on with hope that things can get better. So my second point is about whether or not landlords can cover their expenses with this plan. I spend a lot of time with downtown Eastside landlords and I feel I can speak with some certainty around this topic. In terms of the impact on landlords, vacancy control is a tool that's working in the provinces of Manitoba and Prince Edward Island and the landlords are not going out of business there, or we'd be hearing about that for sure. This plan may deter speculators and flippers, but the landlords that want to make a modest profit will still survive. I'm not talking about the benevolent society here, but honestly, a good chunk of the SRO landlords that I know are putting their profits into buying more property, and they need to stop using those profits for portfolio expansion and clean up what they have already. The report talks about exemptions. If any of, the, any of the landlords make an application for an exemption around the ra raising rents for major repairs, I'm very pleased that they will have to open their books at the RTB. That makes sense to me, and it's more a, fu a more functional approach to raising rents 
compared, compared to the backdoor poach that's happening now. The best escape hatch for landlords by far, in my opinion, and it's referred to in this report, is a partnership. I'm hoping the landlords will be knocking on our door to collaborate on wrap agreements. We want those housing agreements with private landlords. And then tenants can easily get serious upgrades in their building. Um, we have a great idea about how to bring this program into the 21st century and support tenants to get more active in their buildings. And there was an article in Vancouver as often yesterday, I don't know if council's seen it, about the federal, the federal housing minister's interest in putting money towards purchasing hotels and wrapping them. Yes, I just sent it to you now through my email. I remain hopeful of what to come with the federal government coming on board. Right, and, um, and Wendy, uh, Wendy, I hate yep. to interrupt you, but you are well over time. However, you okay. do have questions from counselors and look forward to that email with that, um, that article. Um, but your first questions yep. are from, for Councillor Kirby Young. Go ahead, Councillor. Hi, Wendy. Um, thanks for your advocacy and for speaking to council. Um, I assume that you were listening to the introduction this morning and the questions from council? I was. Okay. So the question that I have then is sort of based on that discussion, and you had mentioned the benevolent associations as well in uh, your comments. And just wanted to clarify, following off on the discussion this morning and acknowledging that a lot of those benevolent associations are unique. They're not sort of the problem landlords, but a lot of them have actually been providing some of the most affordable rents that um, you can you confirm if you would be supportive of the amendment that was discussed with respect to upon vacancy, allowing a CBA to be able to increase the rent to the shelter level so it's sort of commensurate with the rest of the stock? Wendy? Clerk, do we still have Wendy on the line? Hello? Yes, okay, we can hear you. Did, okay. you, did you hear okay, the question? Sorry. Um, the question was about the benevolent societies. Could Councillor Kirby Young just repeat the essence of it again? Sure, and maybe Councillor Carr will indulge me with just a little bit of time to do that. Um, yeah, the question was if you heard the conversation this morning and acknowledging um, the SROs have, or sorry, this the benevolent associations have been providing some of the more affordable rents, but given that they would be subject to this same um, bylaw, would you support the amendment that's being discussed to enable them upon um, vacancy to be able to raise their rent to the shelter rate so it was on par with the rest of the stock. Um, that makes sense to me. I think there's a speaker coming up later in the list that you may want to ask the same question to. Uh, I do think that um, we need to give resource to Chinatown groups uh, more and they deserve more wraparound support so that they can get into these um, agreements with government and not uh, and make sure that it's culturally sensitive and done appropriately. And I think it's, you know, I regret the racism and classism that's been, you know, playing into that so that they shouldn't be in this position of having such low rents and, and um, buildings that need um, so much repair. So it kind of make, it makes sense to me, Councillor Kirby Young, that they should be able to raise their rents if a tenant ha is on welfare and moving okay. into their place, they should be able to raise it to 275. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that, and I and I appreciate how you framed sort of the racism and classism that's been sort of that's underlied sort of this, where we've got to today. So thank you for the for speaking. I appreciate. It. Okay, okay. Councillor Kirby Young. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on to Councillor Swanson for up to three minutes. Yeah. Um. Thanks for uh, phoning in, Wendy, and for all your work on this. Um. There's been some concern that if this passes, landlords won't be able to keep their buildings clean or do normal maintenance and repairs. Do you have a response to that? Yeah, I have kind of a counterintuitive response. What I, since I've been doing this work in 2015 till now, I, I've I've come to the conclusion that tenants, and I've noticed from many times of trying that tenants really can't ask for a repair um, without risking a backlash, a potential eviction, a rent eviction, a cascaded, cascade of evictions in their hotels, and even building closures in the worst case scenario. So I actually think putting in some rent control, a stronger rent control and vacancy control is going to take away the economic incentives that landlords have have to evict their current tenants. And it'll 
give those tenants a bit more opportunity to take some leadership in terms of asking their landlords for repairs. I've seen this. There's one building in the neighborhood that has a wrap agreement, has a housing agreement, and that's working exceptionally well. Uh, where the where the tenants can ask that landlord for repairs, and the landlord is is in a better position to be able to do them, and um, and it works really good. So I think this is going to take out some of the the incentive that landlords have, or the some of the power, frankly, that landlords have, um, and. Uh, and even the sales a little bit, and just even getting the basics like getting garbage cleaned up and toilets unplugged. And, you know, Councillor Swanson used to take pictures of toilets plugged. <laughs> and so, you know, I think I think ten it's going to give tenants the edge. Okay. Um, is, are there any other um, escape hatches for landlords that you wanted to talk about? Well. Just to reiterate, the main one I think is lining up in that Vancouver's awesome article with the federal housing minister and the um, provincial housing minister, E.B., and mayor lining up to get that, and your council that that voted for that billion-dollar acquisition and, and rental rehabilitation um, fund. I think that's the key to this, although, like I said at the beginning of my comments on this section, I think the landlords can do it without without the grants. Uh, it, you may chase away some of the speculators and the flippers, but the ones that can make a modest living are going to stay. And uh, some of those landlords actually don't raise the rents on their tenants because they want to keep those tenants because that's their business model is to not have a bunch of unpredictable people coming into their buildings. They, so I think things will settle. It might feel like a sting. Uh, initially, but I think things will smooth out very quickly. Right. Thank you so much. Um, so that's your time, Councillor Swanson. Um, and those are your questions, um, Wendy. So very much appreciate um, uh, you coming to speak to us at, and for all your work. And great interview on CBC this morning. <laughs> Thank you so much, Councillor Carr. Speaker three, Nicole Baxter. I don't think they can hear me. Yes, I, I, we can hear you. We can hear you talking right now. If this is Nicole Baxter, just state your name and you. Yeah. you... This is Nicole Baxter. Um, hello, Mayor Stewart and City Councilor. Um, vacancy control is a very emergency matter at this time. If we don't act now, we will lose all the affordable low-income housing that's left in the city. There's not much. And as for hearing somebody earlier on saying that people on welfare or social services don't pay 700 a month, that's a lie. There, I pay the same amount as everybody else that's uh, working. I was working before COVID. I'm now on income assistance due to it and failure to my health due to the contaminated water in a previous SRO I lived in. Um, repairs are very difficult to get out of landlords now, and they're jacking the rent unaffordably. I pay 85% of my income to my rent at this time. And with COVID issues, the homeless folks can't protect themselves. They, The numbers are going to rise if uh, we don't get people that are in homes at this time see um, if they end up on the street they're gonna actually raise the COVID numbers you're gonna end up with a lot more um, overdoses due to people losing hope uh, despair they're gonna like resort to other means of income and uh, numbing the pain they're gonna self-medicate I know this for a fact. I've seen it personally firsthand, and I've been living in an SRO now for about four years. And with the support and organizations I work with, I get uh, food programs in the SRO I currently live in, and I've built a excellent rapport with my neighbors. We look out for each other, and with this. It reduces uh, loneliness. It reduces um, the chance of 
harmful things happening. Like we get we get everybody together a lot faster. Less problems go wrong. We haven't had any overdoses. Um, we there are very few sick. It's been great. Like because we have that community within each other. We can't keep that if the turnover keeps happening. And if there's no rent control, there is going to be continuous turnover. So I urge all of you to pass this motion. Thank you for hearing me. Great, and thank you for taking the time. There are no speaker, uh, sorry, no questions to you, but um, you were very clear in your presentation. Thank you so much. Um, speaker four, Tom DeGray. Hear me? Yes, uh, go okay. ahead. You can just state your name and go ahead for up to five minutes. Okay. Uh, I'm privileged to be able to talk to counsel and mayor on this issue. I'm focusing uh, uh, actually, on Tom. Tom, if you could speak a little more directly into your phone, you are getting you're sounding a little bit cut, you know, cutting up. Uh, I'm speaking specifically about harassment. And, uh, self-experience uh, uh, victim. Uh, I live in a very old SRO with 12 units in Strathcona, historic dwelling. Uh, it's in the process of being forcefully converted. Uh, the suite in the front is going for $1,100 now. It went from 275 to 1100 I'm paying slightly above welfare rates. Needless to say, I have a target on my back. There's been a number of uh, efforts to legally evict me and um, my other neighbors who are lost on the What does that feel like? Well, it can't be <clears throat> harassment. In fact, harassment is part of the process of the legal eviction typically. They want to uh, make your life so miserable that you will accept the uh, illegal eviction. I've uh, seen that happen time and time again. Sometimes they use what we call a, a carrot and a stick, so they'll harass you and then they offer you a hand for the money. And eventually your life's so miserable you take the money and leave. I might add that extra income gets eaten up very quickly on the new, very likely more than that is rent. So it's, it's not a good idea. Um, the difference between being harassed in your home. Another experience of harassment is something that I've, I've uh, thought about. I mean, uh, you perhaps had a bad boss, a bad work experience, or was bullied at school. When you're asking your own home, you can't get away from it. It becomes a daily part of your life, and it's a tremendous stressor. Now, I might add that stress is not good for your health either, along with uh, poor housing. I was very bad. And this is part of the daily life of many people in that world. So I think I can conclude on that point. This is I'm passing the mic. Do we have more questions? Oh. Okay. Oh, sorry, we the speaker was dropped. Oh, okay. Ask her what, if there's any questions. Are there sorry, any questions? Uh, sorry, um, there, there are no questions, um, but thank you very much for taking the time to sp speak with us. Uh, it was very, very much you're you. welcome by council. Um, thank speak, you. Speaker five, Erica Grant. She's not here. Okay. Thank you. Um, speaker six, Richard Schwab. Yes, my name is Richard Schwab. I'm a researcher for the Right to Remain Collective. I'm also on the board of directors of the SRO Collaborative. Um, I have seen the model that the prior landlord had set up in uh, the building I live in, which I won't name at the moment, because of uh, maybe backlash. Um, the model that our prior landlord had was uh, one where um, we don't change uh, tenants very often, so maybe one tenant a year might be gone, but he would keep it so that we all 
understood what we were paying for rent, and most of us paid similar rents. Um, this model that he had would keep the tenants, the tenants um, housed here, and people would stay. I've been in the building for 16 years. Richard Schwab, are you still there? Uh, is Richard, Richard Schwab still there? And there's uh, some background noise um, on the line that's being used. So. Can you hear me now? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> Go ahead. Okay, I just wanted to state that uh, the new landlord is uh, different in his uh, approach to uh, his, his model for how it should be done there. And unfortunately, people have moved out and people have been kicked out. And the rents have all pretty much gone up by about 25 to 35%, depending on which room. And I think with this, the uh, control, vacancy control would stop this from happening. Um, <clears throat> I like the model that uh, we were shown from the uh, presentation that City Hall did, the staff there did, which was really nice to be able to uh, be on that and, and see it. And uh, just to close, I would like to say, please vote yes. Thank you. You, you do have, if you don't mind staying on the line, um, you do have some questions. Um, and uh, Councillor Swanson, go ahead, up to three minutes. Yeah, thanks for um, phoning in, Richard. That's great that you took the time to do that. I just wanted to ask you one question. Um, some people are saying that it's the business model of getting rid of old tenants to get in new tenants uh, and raise the rents. That's the problem. And other people are saying that if you can't raise the rents a lot when the tenants change, then the landlords can't keep the place, operate the place properly. So when you had your old landlord, was your place kept clean or was maintenance done? Is Richard Schwab there, still on the line? Looking to Richard Swab to answer the question from Councillor Swanson. Clerks, do we still have that line open? It's okay if he's not there. No. Okay. Sorry about that, Councillor Swanson. Uh, hello. hello. Is it possible for us to use this other phone for Richard to continue? Hello. Yes. Hello. hello. Oh, is it possible for us to continue? We got cut off on another phone. Can we continue on this phone? Uh, just a second, clerk. I'm uh, sorry. Uh, this is um, who is this? <laughs> this is Wendy, and and I was sitting in the room with Richard, and his phone died and was inter getting interfered with. So, could we? Could he finish getting his question from Councillor Swan Swanson on my phone? Yeah, sure. Just put him on that phone. Okay. I'm sorry, Councillor Swanson, I did not hear your question. Councillor, would you okay, mind so repeating your question? I'll stop your timer while you do that. Yeah, just basically, was the maintenance in the plate before you got your new owner who jacked up the rents? What was the maintenance like in your building? Was it clean? Did repairs get made? Stuff like that. Yes, actually, it was impeccable. Uh, we had um, <clears throat> the uh, caretaker slash manager come in and clean the floors, the toilets, the stairs every day. Uh, when uh, maintenance, if something happened, like a sink gets clogged up, it would be worked on within a day or two. If the toilet's clogged up, it would be fixed that day. And for something like the uh, hot water heater, 
that took a little bit longer, but that was probably due to just uh, labor and uh, probably finding somebody that was really good at doing it. So now that has changed. That has changed a bit. It's not. It's every other day that uh, somebody's coming in and cleaning, but it's been maintained. Not okay. As as it was, but thank you for the question. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for answering. Okay, and that is it for your questions. But uh, again, appreciate that you got back on that line uh, to answer Councillor Swanson's question. Thanks so much for calling us. Um, Councillor Carr, could we use this phone for the next speaker as well? Because the the other phone had trouble. Look, I think that's fine, right? They're in the same location. Great. Yes, absolutely fine. So, Speaker Seven is Joshua Gillian. Um, hello. Yes, hello. Yes, hello. Just here. just state your name, and then you have up to five minutes. My name is Joshua Gillen, and I live at the Lion Hotel. My building is one of the last hotels under the Residential Rehabilitation Assistance Program, the RAP, which gave the landlord a large forgivable loan to fix up the building in exchange for keeping the rent low. The agreement ends in a few years. I have heard that landlords say under this vacancy control they won't be able to maintain the buildings. Well, in my building, I, um, I do clean the building and help keep the shared area tidy. Given the opportunity, the tenant can contribute to um, helping to keep up of the building. Right now, my building is the only private SRO with stabilized rent, and that makes, that makes me feel trapped. If I were to move to another building, I would lose all protection I have right now. So with vacancy control, I will have the freedom to move to another SRO, and rent would still be affordable. That's it. That's all. Great. Th thank you. That was very clear. Um, there are no questions for you, but you were, you were very, as I say, very clear in your statement. Thank you. Uh, speaker hey. eight, Kevin Nanakewitang. Speaker eight, Kevin Nanakewitang. Clerk, do we have that speaker on the line? Do we know? I'm just double checking, Chair Carr, if you could give me a moment, please. Great, thank you. I think he was on that original line that went dead. I'm hearing that the line is disconnected, right. but uh, just a moment I'm getting, and they have not called back. Great, thank you for confirming that. We will move on then. Speaker nine is withdrawn. Speaker 10, Jeff Masuda, I believe has sent in a presentation. Um, so uh, speaker 10, Jeff Masuda could uh, recognize it there. Um, that, that, uh, here and uh, we can get that presentation up and just, Hi there. Yeah, if just, yeah if you just want to state your name and then um, we're just getting hey. your presentation up so I'm not going to start yeah, your timer just, till it's up that's fine it's, it's just one slide oh just one. Uh, yeah thank you mayor and counselors for the opportunity to speak to you today in support of vacancy control uh, my name is Jeff Masuda I'm not a resident of Vancouver but like some of the tenants that you've just heard from, I'm a member of the Right to Remain Collective, and I participate in that as a professor in the School of Public Health and Social Policy at the University of Victoria, and I also hold a Canada Research Chair at Queen's University. From this background, I think I have three insights that I wish to share with you today that I think build on the strong economic case made in your staff report. These are community stability, health, and racial and colonial justice. First, I'll just reiterate what we wrote in our letter to Council, and that was mentioned earlier today. There is indeed strong precedent for vacancy control in the very buildings under discussion today. Vacancy control in Vancouver's private SROs is not new. It was part and parcel of Vancouver's largely forgotten downtown housing upgrading program, which ran from 1981 to 1989, where hundreds, if not thousands, of SR units that were protected by 15-year vacancy control agreements that preserved affordability into the two early 2000s. I would also add that the Standards of Maintenance Bylaw referred to earlier, 5462, was actually tailor-made for this program by the city. In fact, it was the main part that the city played in this program, and the city led uh, with uh, that the city led this program, and, and that leadership brought the federal government to the table at the time. Some buildings still benefit from this now defunct program even today. 
The city's own evaluation from 1989 confirmed that this policy preserved affordability and improved community stability in SROs. Not only that, it benefited owners. The program allowed them to support improvements in their buildings through the very same grants that we know you're advocating for from senior governments as we speak. My second point speaks to public health. Vacancy control will save lives. As a researcher with a track record of scholarship on public health policy and practice in Canada, I can say that your vote on vacancy control today is going to be watched very closely and favorably by a public health community that has for years lamented the neglect of housing as a priority determinant of health. Once upon a time, it was actually the city's own public health staff and leadership that regulated SROs, promoted their habitability, and held landlords accountable. Unfortunately, the city's health leadership pulled stakes from housing in the early 1980s at a time when it mattered most. Your decision on vacancy control will set the stage for the restoration of public health attention and action on housing, both here in Vancouver and beyond. It will set a new precedent for recognizing that the right to life trumps the right to make a profit off of those lives, mobilizing public health to get us back in the game. The last point I wish to make, I would submit to you that vacancy control is a matter of racial and colonial justice. Like thousands of Japanese Canadians, three generations of my father's family spent over a quarter of a century living and working, playing and praying and building many of the SROs in the downtown east side. Then their lives were irrevocably disrupted by the racist policy that expelled them from their homes and banished them east of the Rockies. For many of us, vacancy control in SROs is the first real concrete action that follows on your predecessor's 2013 apology for the city's regrettable role in executing this policy. It's been eight years since Mayor Robertson pledged that the city will, and I quote, do all it can to ensure that such injustices will not happen again to any of its residences, or residents, thereby upholding the principles of human rights, justice, and equality now and in the future, unquote. Our research sheds specific light on the significance of that expulsion to the problem of SROs today. I refer you to the figure that I hope you're seeing. Um, it depicts the distribution of lodging house business licenses held by persons with European, Japanese, and Chinese surnames just prior to World War II. Unlike most accounts of this story, this map doesn't tell us about lost ownership. It's a story of caretaking, of community building. What we see here is that nearly 50% of all business licenses within the boundaries of today's downtown east side, depicted in blue, housing fully 3,279 people were lived in and managed by Japanese Canadians. Their sudden and irreversible eviction under the auspices of restoring a white society on Powell Street wiped out layers of social, economic, and material infrastructure that had been carefully built up over decades. This was the original sin that set the stage for decades of injustice that's been upheld by mismanagement, inaction, half measures, and broken promises. The lack of vacancy control and once Japanese Canadian occupied and managed SROs in the context of today's housing crisis, in which fully one third of tenants are Indigenous, not only upholds, but it amplifies this injustice. Forced expulsion by raising rents on the poor is an act of colonialism. In this light, vacancy control is not all you can do, but it's the least you can do to enact the city's pledge for justice. So we are on the eve of the 80 year anniversary of the city's violation of the human rights of Japanese Canadians, 150 years of violating the rights of indigenous people to their own lands and livelihoods. I urge you to begin to undo, un undo this long legacy of racial and colonial injustice, to begin to address the public health crisis before us, to begin to restore tenants, our neighbors, ability to stabilize their lives and build a sense of community in their SROs, Vacancy control will buy us the time that tenants desperately need to continue to work with you to create a more permanent, equitable, and dignified housing system that will serve the needs and aspirations of this historic community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and you have questions. If you could stay on the line for a second, that would be great. Thank Councillor you. Swanson, up to three minutes. Go ahead. Yeah, that was a really powerful presentation, Jeff. Thanks so much. Um, I really appreciate the solidarity that the Japanese community shows with other folks that live in the downtown east side. It's so amazing. So 
I guess the biggest concern that I heard for the questions that the other counselors asked was that this might make it hard for the vacancy control and the SROs might make it hard for um, the owners to keep conditions half decent. So how do you yeah. respond to that concern? I, I mean, I think others have spoken to this point. I, I am pretty confident that vacancy control is going to usher in a much more willingness of senior levels of government to get into the game of, uh, of providing the funding that's desperately needed to restore uh, the basic habitability of these buildings. Bottom line. <laughs> okay, thanks so much. Um, and uh, thank you so much. Um, that was a great presentation. Um, but that's it for your questions. Uh, next, uh, we have speaker 11, Stephanie Smith. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm calling in to support the SRA vacancy control policy that council is considering today. Um, I'm Stephanie Smith, and I'm a resident of the downtown east side. I worked as a poverty law paralegal for most of the period from the late 1990s until 2019 uh, in and outside the downtown east side representing tenants in all types of rental housing. Uh, and during that time, I provided legal advice and representation to many tenants of SRAs. I was able to observe firsthand how the SRA bylaw unfortunately did not protect my clients from displacement when their buildings were purchased by speculative investors. This is an unfortunate product of limitations in the SRA bylaw and the persistence of investors who want to change the quote unquote tenant type in their buildings and sharply increase rents. Uh, the SRA bylaw, while laudable, it did not contemplate two things. Uh, first, that de facto conversions could take place without substantial changes to the building and without removing units from the inventory. And second, the ingenuity of speculative investors and landlords when they are trying to evade the bylaws security of tenure provisions. I think when the bylaw was created, the assumption and purpose was that protecting the stock would protect the tenants living in the stock. And this unfortunately has not been the outcome. My experience working with tenants who were long-term SRA residents is that the purchase of their buildings inevitably resulted in attempts to displace them and functionally convert the units. In some cases, those de facto conversions took place when cosmetic work was done on units and they were rented out to higher income tenants. In other cases, landlords carried out work that should have triggered the conversion provisions of the SRA bylaw in uh, 1.2 sub E, uh, repair or alteration to designated rooms. But they've done so without applying for conversion permits or issuing notices to end for landlord use. In order to do this, they have to secure vacant possession of the unit some other way. And I've seen a number of strategies employed, but generally the investor landlord pattern is offering financial incentives to move. Um, for tenants who are extremely poor, several thousand dollars can represent you know, four months income. Finding some other pretext to evict tenants. Uh, often there's a flurry of eviction notices for cause. Um, or making living conditions intolerable. These three, three strategies are often employed in concert with one another and they're very effective. I, I can say that I have actually seen an investor landlord empty their building, even when they were engaged with the city in a permitting process, units were not being removed from the inventory and the city was provided with a rent roll. But because the methods that they've used to get vacant possession are at least nominally legal, uh, eviction for cause or mutual agreement to end the tenancy, the, the bylaw is not triggered and the landlord is essentially free to do what it wants to increase revenue. Faced with this relentlessness, there's really only so much that even the most determined tenant and legal representative can do. In my view, this cycle of displacement can only be interrupted by vacancy control. So long as speculative SRA investors are able to impose unlimited rent increases between tenants, they will ensure that tenants paying affordable rents are forced to move. In my view, any tenant displacement should be of concern to the city, but these tenants and this accommodation merit special protection and consideration because the consequence of displacement for these tenants is almost inevitably homelessness. I have worked with tenants who were stably housed for more than a decade, who took buyouts and ended up living in parks waiting on BC housing wait lists, who were evicted and disappeared, tenants who died. 
we have abundant good evidence over many years that the displacement of low-income tenants from SRA housing stock has led directly to increased homelessness and, in my experience, to death. I think that we have a moral imperative to act in the face of the humanitarian crisis. I also appreciate that the city must consider the financial implications of this program. When doing so, we should take into account the enormous cost the city incurs because of homelessness. It, to be blunt, it costs less money to keep someone off the street than it does to get them off the street. Every attempt to improve living conditions and SRA accommodation comes with some kind of risk. I have worked with city staff as they've tried to improve the living conditions of SRA residents while dealing with the omnipresent risk of units being removed from the inventory. It's not an easy task. I think they've done an exceptional job of balancing potential risks of tenant displacement via loss of SRA stock with the ongoing risk of displacement and homelessness via eviction and soft conversion. I would like to thank city staff, uh, downtown Eastside community organizations and council for this, their work on this file and urge council to vote in favor. Thank you. Thank you, that was perfectly timed. Um, I actually have some questions for you if you, um, if you would be on the, be willing to answer them. Um, Certainly. Yeah, I'm very interested in what you said about um, the, you've seen, um, you know, empty rooms and yet a rent roll um, actually uh, provided, I guess, to the city or whomever. So I'm curious about that in the context of um, the ask that is coming forward with this report is to increase some staff um, in order to actually monitor on an annual basis the rent roll, the, you know, the number of units rented the <coughs> rent and at what rents. Do you think that that is um, a useful and important thing for the city to be doing to avoid the problem you mentioned? Very important. You know, when, when I spoke with city staff about the building in question, it, they were actually surprised about what was happening because they received a rent roll, but then it was incumbent on the landlord to sort of advise them if they had you know, issued a notice to end for uh, uh, landlord use. Um, so w without uh, monitoring and more proactive reporting requirements for landlords, the landlord was able to just, you know, uh, uh, evict people for cause or, um, you know, accept their, their move out notices without ever bringing this it, it to the city's notice. Uh, so, um, with the, the structure that we have in place now, um, um, there, there weren't the resources and there weren't the obligations on landlords to ensure that the city could adequately monitor what was happening. Right. Um, so more, re yeah, more resources and monitoring, I think, are really important here. Right. Okay. That's, that's good information. I mean, um, what I'm gathering then is uh, as without the city monitoring, then uh, really it's uh, civil society as individuals like uh, the, in the role that you were providing information of their own volition to the city rather than it being a comprehensive regular checking. Uh, uh well, exactly. I mean, of course, and that always, almost always happens when it's too late. You know, one of the 30 tenants who's lost their home might walk into your office, right? By the time it comes to your attention, a lot of them are already gone. Um, so it's very, it's very stopgap, and and it isn't sufficient uh, to protect the tenants in that housing stock sort of as a group. Right. Okay, that's it for my questions. Um, thank you very much for both speaking and uh, to council and answering my questions. Thank you. Uh, we're on to speaker 12, Kathy Shimizu. Hello? Yes, if you just wouldn't mind stating oh. your name and go ahead, up to five minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Kathy Shimizu, and I would like to begin by acknowledging that I live and work on the stolen and occupied traditional territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh uh, peoples, and I'm grateful to them for being able to live on their land and support indig Indigenous sovereignty and struggles for justice. I am a member of the Japanese Canadian community and work with the Powell Street Festival, We Press, and Downtown Eastside Response, but I'm not speaking for them. I'm calling to voice my strong support for implementing vacancy control and SROs. I would also like to express my gratitude to you for previously passing motions to support SRO tenants and to staff for producing this really great report. And I would like to thank them for their hard work and for working so closely with the SRO Collaborative and the community. As we all know, SROs are the last stop before homelessness, and I want to thank the SRO tenants who spoke before me for sharing their personal experiences of the stress and challenges they face every day. Hearing about them is heart-wrenching and demoralizing, which makes passing this motion all the more urgent. 
We also know that homelessness will continue to increase if vacancy control is not implemented and the possibility of 4,000 SRO tenants ending up in shelters on the streets and in encampments is totally devastating and would be astronomically costly. Saving SROs as low-income housing is only a stopgap measure, but one that is critical to buy us the time we need to implement multiple strategies for affordable housing. These strategies must prioritize stable, decent housing for the people most marginalized by our, our existing system, especially those who are Indigenous and Black, people of color, seniors, and those struggling with trauma, mental health issues, and addictions. Even though we know many are in terrible condition, we need to save the SROs while new shelter rate and seniors housing is being built, but also while the community works to find new solutions and create housing using holistic models and as Tanya and Norm mentioned earlier, decolonize housing and center the well-being of tenants. Um, and as Jeff mentioned, some of the SROs are also historic Japanese Canadian buildings, and many of us are working to save them to support the low-income community. Since COVID hit, organizations, ad hoc groups, community members have all been collaborating to meet the immediate needs of the unhoused and precariously housed. We have been collaborating with frontline grassroots organizations to create networks of mutual aid working together and sharing information and resources. And although we came together because of COVID, we're working on long-term solutions and have been collaborating to get funding for everything from food sovereignty to funding to pay for work that's led and done by community organizers, often called peers. And there are multiple standing meetings that involve many nonprofits, social enterprises, BIAs, city staff, and I attend these regularly. And you can see we are, um, continuing to work on these issues and the big picture in the community. COVID has also ushered in a new spirit of cooperation between the city and the community that hasn't been seen for many years. So we really need this motion as a first step so that we have the time to implement our projects, including the ones for which we, we've already secured funding um, for, for from the Real Estate Foundation of BC and CMHC for a two-year project. And thanks to the Vancouver Aboriginal Community Policing Center and NORM, we have hired a full-time outreach worker who is Indigenous and two full-time staff so that we can work on a number of things, um, supporting the SRO Collaborative's work with the working group on SROs that involves the three levels of government, bring funds to Chinese benevolent societies and landlords committed to low-income housing in their buildings to work with us to understand the cost of maintaining and operating SROs so that we can work with them to advocate for maintenance funds from the feds and implement tenant-led programs in their buildings that will help both tenants and to reduce costs, support tenant-led programs for SROs by the SRO Collaborative, do the outreach to gather more groups and tenants as well as landlords to engage in this work, research community land trusts and help educate tenants and organizations about them and how they could work for us, find out from community what they want regarding their housing and owning land and or buildings and how we can make it happen, work together to advocate to the province for higher social assistance rates that covers SRO operations and maintenance. So we're thinking about how we can pull privately owned SROs out of the market so they can be owned by the community and run by the tenants that live in them. So I really hope you will pass this motion so that we can continue working on the big picture and long-term holistic housing solutions and at the same time protect low-income tenants and help reduce homelessness. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And if you don't mind waiting on the line, you do have questions. Councillor Swanson, go ahead with your questions. Yeah, thanks so much, Kathy, for uh, signing up to speak. That sounds like awesome work that you guys are doing. You talked a couple, you mentioned a couple times you mentioned tenant-led programs. I wonder if you could just expand on what those are like or would be like in your dreams. Well, they're actually already happening. Um, I think Wendy mentioned it, al uh, it already, and, and Nicole spoke about it. Um, Nicole uh, and, and, uh, and, and Tom and Richard, the, those folks are tenant leaders. So that's our collaborative already working in a number of uh, privately owned SROs, engaged tenants who are, um, uh, as Wendy puts it, um, they've really, they find, they um, have connected with people in buildings and find out who the connectors are. And then those folks, connect with other tenants. And, and um, so we've been doing um, work around uh, food sovereignty. Food's a great way to connect with people. So we, uh, meals, amazing, delicious meals produced, um, uh, create, you know, created by Watari Latinx Community Kitchen are made and they bring them to SRO tenants. And, and um, 
that's a one way of engaging people. But now they, the the tenants in the building know each other. They've been helping each other. Um, and helping some of them also not get evicted, like some of the folks that maybe hoard a bit, you know, and trying to manage some of the minor maintenance things in the building. The tenants, um, like Wendy said, in one of the buildings, their one of their tenant leaders knows the name and the room number of every tenant in her building, and they support each other. So these are, um, you know, the, the idea that Norm talks about, um, decolonization is actually, it's not a service oriented model. It's actually thinking about our responsibility to each other and connecting each other socially so that we can, um, neighbors can help each other and we can, um, and we, and really, um, you know, it's a way to help the landlord as well. There's less reason to, you know, there's less conflict. There's a lot more de-escalation in the building. And so the, these things are already happening and what would be great if they could, if it could be happening in more buildings. And you need vacancy control as a prerequisite for the, this. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely, because one of the one of the issues is that sometimes the, these things are hard to do if the if um, people are worried they're going to get kicked out, um, uh, so that the landlord can raise their rent between tenants. And so the vacancy control brings a level of stability to the housing stock um, that allows this work to happen. And you know, I think. Um, uh, there are the, the who the landlords are is a very diverse group, and some of them I think, um, uh, and the ones that that the Ethel Collaborative already knows, um, there's a lot of cooperation happening. So um, the vacancy control just just allows things to stabilize so that this collaborative work can happen. And that is it for your time, okay. Councillor Swanson. Thank um, you. Yeah, and thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Kathy, for um, being able to speak to us today and answer those questions. Very much appreciated. Appreciate it. Moving on to speaker 13, Nicholas Brom Blomley. Hello. Hello there. Um, yes, just state your name you and me? go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Nicholas Blomley. I am professor of geography at Simon Fraser University. I am in favor of the vacancy control proposal. It's a timely, thoughtful, and intelligent intervention into a vital housing sector. I'm also a member of the Right to Remain Research Collective. We seek to uncover the story of Vancouver's SROs while amplifying the voices and fighting for the rights of the tenants who live within them. We support tenant organizing for improved safety, habitability, affordability, and sustainability in SRO buildings in the downtown east side. And I'd like to draw from this work to address two issues that have been raised by SRO owners. First, one argument that has been raised is that if vacancy control is imposed, landlords will evict so-called hard-to-house tenants, propelling them into in homelessness and would cease investing in their buildings. Research reminds us that this is an old rhetorical ploy without any apparent substance. A peer-reviewed research paper of, our, of ours recently published in the International Journal of Urban and Regional Research documents an earlier history of the deregulation of downtown, SR, downtown Eastside SROs in the 1970s, when SRO residents were exempted from protection under the Residential Tenancy Act. This placed them in a highly precarious condition. Landlords could evict summarily and raise rents at any time. One immediate outcome of this was, of course, the mass evictions during the run-up to Expo 86. Now, community pressure to bring residents under RTA protection continued through the 1970s and 1980s. Similar arguments to those we see today from the owners were made. In 1977, it was warned that such protections would have, quote, serious implications, unquote. Many hotel owners would close hotels, it was said, if they were forced into the RTA because their operations were already financially marginal. Forcing landlords to provide better standards was doomed to failure, it was argued, as landlords, quote, are in deep financial trouble and are unable to absorb more losses. At the very least, they will fight the changes and the tenant will be the loser, unquote. It was also argued that, quote, those who are difficult to house would find themselves expelled from all hotels, which have been more tolerant of them than any rooming houses. These people who are hard to house will be without shelter, unquote. I think we can learn some lessons from this history. Firstly, it is, of course, a deeply immoral argument that devalues and denigrates poor people while denying them state protection. The logical consequence of such claims is that poor people deserve poor housing and that poor people are too vulnerable to be protected. 
Second, the fears raised in the special pleading of almost 50 years ago, so reminiscent of current complaints, did not seem to be borne out. SRO residents were brought into the RTA in 1989, and the sky did not fall as threatened. And there are many other historical examples of this special pleading whenever regulators try to rebalance the relationship between landlords and tenants. One example is the adoption of fire sprinklers in SROs, where landlords made similar chicken little claims. The second argument, which is evident in Appendix E in the report, concerns property rights. Private owners suggest that, quote, vacancy control is an assault on property rights, unquote, and is thus unjustifiable. We don't need to recognize that the private property of owners is reliant on the theft of stolen indigenous land or the dispossession of the many Japanese-Canadian lodging house owners in the 1940s to see that this is a specious argument. Property rights are not an end in themselves, but must be justified in terms of the values that they serve. If they serve only the power to extract, evict, and discipline, they cannot be justified. Property has always been regulated, although such regulations must, of course, meet defensible goals. Vacancy control meets many valuable policy goals. It also, of course, protects the property rights of tenants. Vacancy decontrol, our present system, incentivizes landlords to evict or to make conditions so unbearable that tenants self-evict. Vacancy control, conversely, recognizes that not only owners, but also those who live in their buildings and pay their rents have rights too. So I encourage you, therefore, to approve the vacancy control policy and work closely with tenants to realize its full potential. Thank you. Um, and thank you um, very much. Um, uh, Councillor Swanson, are you on the um, queue for some questions to this speaker? You are on the queue. Uh, um, I wasn't, but I love extract, evict, and discipline. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, Councillor Swanson. Um, and so that is it. There are no questions, but a very, a very thorough presentation. Very much appreciated. Thank you. We're on to speaker 14, Council Beverly Ho. Hello? Yes, Beverly, um, we can hear you clearly. Just state your name and go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, my name is Beverly Ho. My Chinese name is Ho Yingnan. Um, I live and work in the Chinatown downtown east side area, um, situated on the unceded, stolen, traditional, and current lands of the Skoltmish, Tisliwa, Tooth, and Musqueam peoples. Um, and I'm here, I'm calling in to speak in support of the vacancy control motion. Um, I grew up in the neighborhood as a second generation Chinese settler and my dad's family immigrated and settled here beginning in the late 60s running Fung's Grocery, um, which is now Finch's on the corner of Jack Jackson in East Georgia. So we've always been connected to the neighborhood and I'm really honored to um, continue to have and make those connections with um, seniors in, in Chinatown. Um, I currently work at Euro <laughs> Society in Chinatown, um, and we offer basic housing, health, and income services to Chinese-speaking seniors um, who have typically linguistic and cultural um, and, and financial barriers to accessing these kinds of services from other service providers. Um, and we've been working in conjunction with the Downtown Eastside SRO Collaborative to better support Chinese-speaking tenants living in SROs. This motion would be life-changing for many of our community members, including elderly, low-income, and Chinese-speaking women living in SROs. Quite a number of these tenants are also disabled um, and binners on fixed income who rely on subsidized services from organizations like Yarrow and the SRO Collaborative for groceries and health support. Um, and as you know, Indigenous folks are also overrepresented in privately owned SROs and in the ongoing opioid crisis. Um, Chinese-speaking seniors in SROs are extremely isolated and marginalized, um, and they don't have a lot of resources. Um, they're living in some of the oldest buildings in the neighborhood, which were originally crowdfunded and constructed by early Chinese settlers who um, came here as, as laborers. Um, and currently, these tenants have nowhere else to go. This is the only affordable housing left in the city. Um, and particularly in, in this neighborhood, which many of them consider their community. There are lots of long-term tenants. Some have lived in their units for upwards of 20 or 30 years, which is um, pretty rare in Vancouver's rental market. <coughs> and 
some tenants also do not receive government pension. Um, they don't qualify for it and do not wish to move into social housing because the rent there is higher than, than in the SRO that they're currently living. Um, and my last point, housing is a human right. Uh, protect these low-income renters from rent evictions and support our community and support benevolent associations so that they can continue to run um, their SRO buildings without raising the rent. Um, we've seen that housing directly affects health outcomes. We work with precariously housed and houseless seniors, including seniors who are staying at shelters. Um, and the stress from housing or financial stress um, very negatively impacts their, their mental and physical health. Our elders are the living heritage and heart of the neighborhood. They deserve to age in place in their community and to have safe, dignified, and affordable housing. Great. Well, that's, that was very clear. You don't have any questions, but uh, thank you so much for taking the time. That was great. Uh, speaker 15, council has withdrawn. Um, so we are on to speaker 16, Brian Jacobs. Um, hello, can you hear me? Yeah, just state your name and go ahead. All right, thank you. Um, hello, City Councilors. Uh, my name is Brian Jacobs, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak in favor of this motion to implement vacancy control in SRA designated hotels. I work as a tenant committee coordinator at the SRO Collaborative, and I'm currently appointed as a commissioner for taking affidavits in the province of British Columbia. Through my work at the SROC, I have witnessed how the current loopholes in rent control regulations are exploited by landlords and building managers. Tenants are made aware that their security of tenure is completely dependent on the goodwill of landlords who at any point could decide to evict them and charge more for their rooms. This constant state of fear and dependency is used as a tool for landlord control and robs tenants of their dignity and autonomy. My job is to work with tenants to build committees in their buildings that work to address the immediate needs of the people that live there. The committee coordinator um, coordinates various forms of tenant-led service initiatives that are directly deli um, delivered by tenants to their neighbors. The role of SROC staff in these projects is to train and resource the tenant leaders, as well as create accountability mechanisms to ensure that initiatives are introduced to buildings in fair and equitable ways. Some of the initiatives so far um, that we've um, introduced uh, have included food distribution, building maintenance and cleaning, access to harm reduction supplies, such as naloxone, and culturally appropriate support targeted to indigenous tenants, as well as Chinese seniors. Um, by working with tenants to participate in the is able to access any of the services that they require. This is done constantly as tenants conduct regular surveys with their neighbors. These surveys provide feedback about the impacts of the services in the buildings as well as identify unmet needs that may be addressed to, um, by introducing new services in the future. These surveys allow um, tenants to collect meaningful information about the building, such as common repair issues, um, neighbors that might have dietary needs for food distribution, and most importantly for this conversation, um, it allows them to monitor rental rates. Uh, to this end, tenants with the support of community partners conducted a peer-to-peer -peer rent survey in their buildings. Um, over eight weeks in September and October this year, tenants were able to conduct 66 surveys across 22 buildings. Of those 22 buildings, we found that average rent currently being paid was less than or equal to $500 in 13 buildings, and the tenants we spoke to had an average tenure of 5.9 years. We also worked to measure the rental gap in these buildings, which is the difference between average tenured rents versus the market rates for the same rooms. Um, our rent survey measured an average rent gap of 38% across the stock. Um, we hope to continue to expand this work um, to help tenants with the implementation of new vacancy control provisions, and the SROC is committed to fundraising from foundations to hire dedicated staff to advocate for rents. This work will include working um, with landlords and city officials to negotiate new housing agreements, which also come with a one-time rent control adjustment as outlined in Section 3.5 of Appendix A of the staff's report. Um, thank you to city staff that have worked um, to put together this report. Uh, while the proposal is in some ways more modest than we might have hoped, it is commendable that staff have been able to create a balanced proposal that takes into consideration um, the concerns of all parties. I wholeheartedly urge council to pass the proposal in its current form and hope that we can work together to implement it in its entirety as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Um, very, very uh, succinct and straightforward, uh, very much understood uh, by council. Thank you. No questions for you. Speaker 17, Daniela Aeo. Hi there, can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Just state your name and go uh, ahead. Um, thank you, uh, Mayor, Councillors, and City staff. Uh, my name is Danny Aiello. 
and I'm here to speak in favor of this motion for vacancy control in SROs. Um, currently, I'm a SHRC CMHC postdoctoral fellow in geography at Queen's University. Um, and I'm a part of the Right Termain Research Collective and the chair of the board of the Downtown Eastside SRO Collaborative. I've been doing advocacy and supporting tenant organizing against evictions and atrocious housing conditions in the SROs for over six years. Uh, and I want to speak specifically to the urgency of this intervention. And I'd like to start by telling you about one of the first times that I went door knocking in an SRO. The Metropole today sits fully converted and lost to the low income community. It rents its micro suites for no less than $1,400 a month. It was only a few years ago that there were still quite a few long term tenants in that building. And I spoke to one on the top floor in the summer of 2015 who had been living in his room for 32 years. He told me that just the day before my visit, the landlord had come to see him too and offered him $1,300 in exchange for signing a mutual agreement to end tenancy and moving out at the end of the following month. As a 72-year-old Polish immigrant on disability, he hadn't seen that kind of money in a long time. And he said to me, I've been here a while, maybe it's time for a change, so why not sign the thing? He didn't know he had the right not to. He had no idea how bad the housing market beyond his shelter rate room really was. Uh, I left devastated, knowing full well that he would never find another room at the welfare rate. I, I honestly think about him all the time and I still wonder if he wound up homeless. I was one day late and I couldn't help him. Cash for keys is harassment, and it's only one of the myriad ways that the complete lack of regulation drives experiences of eviction for SRO tenant. I heard account countless stories like this. I was one day late back then, but, and we are actually many years late on this motion. And I can draw a straight line across the city and through time between that experience of the Metropole and another hotel downtown that I can't name today because I'm so worried about landlord backlash and my inability to support those people in a meaningful way with the reactive displacement that could happen if this policy isn't put into place immediately. This hotel has been rapidly emptying over the last year, especially the last few months. It only has about 15% of its units actually occupied right now. The rest are empty. Tenants have been offered cash for keys again. People have been given spurious eviction notices for the smallest infractions. Many of them have ended up in worse SROs paying more money or in shelters this month. This is all happening right now. People who still live there are so afraid of rocking the boat, they deal with harassment and the fear of losing their housing every day. And it should say a lot to you that I won't name this building in an effort to protect them. We are endlessly navigating a type of advocacy that puts people in worse circumstances than when you met them, and it makes it impossible to speak up. Council is only getting small pieces of this whole picture. In the case of this hotel, time is of the essence because this policy will apply to empty rooms. But if the landlord moves to re-rent those rooms at higher rates before it applies, we could lose all of them. That would be 70 more people on the brink of homelessness in our city, trying to navigate an atrocious and unregulated housing stock with no other options. A lack of regulation is driving two twin processes in SROs, gentrification and conversion on one hand and neglect to the point of collapse on the other. On the other side of the spectrum, we have the worst of the worst landlords whose buildings aren't gentrifying, but they're nevertheless increasing rooms on turnover, prioritizing tenants, who rely on informal and black market income because they can easily control them. Um, there's rampant illegal leasing, self-help evictions, and rampant welfare fraud. Whichever of these twin processes, conversion or collapse that we're talking about, putting regulation into this industry is going to help with all of this. We have before us mountains of evidence that uncontrolled rent causes serious harm, that drives homelessness, and it causes premature death. That should be enough for us to understand that free market rent in the private SROs is something we have to put an end to. Um, thank you very much for your time today. Uh, thank you for your time. You do have questions, if you don't mind staying on the line. Councillor Swanson, sure. Councillor Swanson, go ahead with your questions. Yeah, thanks so much for coming in, Danny. I remember before I got elected, a um, guy from the Metropole came to me and said he'd been offered $1,000 to leave, and I 
begged him not to take it, but I wasn't strong enough. So what would you say to people who say that rent control is harmful to the housing stock? Uh, I'm glad you asked that, Jean. This is a very prominent, um, I would say, dogma, largely from economists and landlord lobbyists that controls on rent will prevent repairs or constrain supply. For example, you know, Councillor Hardwick mentioned that landlords might want to leave the business altogether. That would be a constraint on supply. Um, but this dogma in the researcher world, even among economists, is finally beginning to erode, uh, even in the last five years. Municipalities everywhere are exploring these options with really tailored solutions and often to the most low income areas of their sector, just like we're trying to do. Uh, city staff mentioned Nova Scotia. Historically, there's also Manitoba, even New West with their controls on rent evictions, which is sim in a similar vein. Uh, the state of Oregon, King County in Seattle, Minneapolis, St. Paul, policymakers across North America are starting to take this much more seriously as an effective and really inexpensive you know, broad social protection, like not as not a radical intervention. And that's why I think it would be so effective for SROs, which is less than 1% of the housing stock. Um, and historically, economists have only looked at the effect of rent control through a lens of what they call market distortion, right? But much more recently, researchers are finding that when they expand their analysis to look at the social benefits, which are economic benefits, they're finding that vacancy control has positive effects on local economies. It's working as it's intended. It's stabilizing neighborhoods. Low-income people and people of color are more likely to stay in their communities. It results in increased inclusivity and so on. The downtown east side really needs this. Um, and I think one of the reasons researchers are finding that this works as intended uh, is because contemporary policies usually include features that are designed to manage the negative effects. We have those in the RTA. Wendy discussed this in her commentary. Uh, I completely agree with her analysis that tenants will have less fear around repair requests. Um, I think a lot of this research is showing that contrary to what the lobby warns us about, um, the sky doesn't fall. It's certainly not when you're applying this in such a targeted way to these specific buildings. Um, lastly, I'll say um, this type of policy is more rent stabilization. It's largely going to go after big investor landlords. There's no reason to believe that landlords in this particular housing stock require double digit increases to keep their SROs profitable. Yes, the life of these buildings is quite old, but if they need major capital upgrades, as many of them do, they can easily apply to the RTB for these exceptions. They just need to show their books, and I think that's a very reasonable expectation. Um, those folks don't need protections. We cannot weigh the price of homelessness and premature death against the right to make unlimited and uncontrolled profits. And thank you. That is uh, that is over your time, Councillor Swanson. And thank you so much for the answers and uh, also um, your presentation to Council. So we are moving on to Speaker Eight. Speaker Eighteen, Ten Ten Nine. Hello. Yes. Yes, uh, go ahead. Just, oh, state, hello. Can you hear me? Just, Tintin, just state your name and go ahead. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Tintin Yang. Um, I work at the Downtown Eastside Neighborhood House and work closely with many Downtown Eastside community members who also like live in SRO buildings. Oh. Uh, I'm also a renter and a member of the Vancouver Tenants Union Steering Committee. I am speaking today in strong support of the vacancy control regulations and single room accommodation designated properties. Um, so this year, in September and October, myself and other downtown Eastside community members supported the SRO Collaborative by door knocking to collect rent surveys from tenants in private SRO hotels. Through doing this rent survey, we established connections with tenants in buildings that were, oh, sorry, where there were a few before, monitored the difference in rents across private SROs, and noted the difference in tenured rents and rates offered to new renters. We chose to participate in this work because we recognize the importance of maintaining welfare rate housing in a city that is becoming increasingly unfriendly to those who are low income and are reliant on income or disability assistance. The results of the survey showed that long-term long tenants have significantly lower rents than those who sign new leases and SROs, some of whom are paying nearly double the shelter portion of welfare. This creates pressure and an incentive for landlords to evict long-time tenants. This model of raising rents while allowing buildings to fall into extreme disrepair needs to be addressed. This proposed stopgap intervention is necessary to keep people housed. 
um, speaking with tenants from these hotels, um, many were glad that their neighbors and community were taking an interest in their housing conditions, their rent, um, and were eager to talk about how their buildings have changed, noting rising rents and empty units. Uh, as a member of the Vancouver Tenants Union, I stand in solidarity with SRO tenants. I know this policy will not affect me as a renter in a non-SRO building, but I want the city to prioritize the most vulnerable tenants in Vancouver. I want to recognize the work of the fantastic tenant organizers that have spoken before me. Low-income renters have few housing options in the city, so we need to act immediately to support renters who may imminently face homelessness. If rents continue to rise in what is known as housing of last resort, the devastating impact of eviction will continue to put people on the streets and in shelters. Lastly, as someone who works in the downtown Eastside neighborhood, I see that there is a great need for better and truly affordable housing in the neighborhood. There are luxury developments and social mixed developments, but a significantly or, but a significant lack of exclusively welfare and pension rate housing being built. While this is what is ultimately needed, it is expensive and requires time. By passing this motion, City Council and the Mayor will be standing in support of some of the city's most vulnerable tenants. Um, this is the most important and cost-effective thing that council can do at this time to prevent thousands of people from being unhoused. I also demand that, count, uh, that council uh, make the monitoring and implementation uh, process as transparent and effective as possible with meaningful consequences for violating this bylaw. Uh, this is an important first step for city council to make, but action cannot stop here. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to express my support for this motion. Uh, thank you very much um, for a um, very clear presentation. There are no questions for you, but really appreciate you coming. Uh, we're on to speaker 19, Fiona York. York is speaker 19 on the line. I'm just checking, Chair Kerr. We're not seeing Fiona York on the line. And I did get confirmation Fiona York is not on the line. Great. Okay, thank you. And uh, we are on to speaker 20, who is here in person, Keith Gordon-Weeb. You wouldn't mind just stating your name when you're ready to begin and go ahead and up to five minutes. and. Chair Carr, City Councillors, my name is Keith Gordon Weeb. I'm a former minister and the current representative executive director of the Anhart Community Housing Society. I would like to first underline Anhart's involvement with SROs only for the purpose of offering assurance that our response to the Vacancy Control Regulations Report is based on extensive experience and partnership with the City of Vancouver. I would also like to note that I've had work opportunities for many years with Celine Mobilese, Acting Managing Director, Homelessness Services and Affordable Housing Programs, and Bob Moss, Outreach Coordinator for the Carnegie Community Centre. I could not think of two finer municipal employees. Since 2002, Anhart has served the City of Vancouver through the purchase and a restoration of 10 privately owned SROs, the relocation of 150 persons living at Open Armour Park to the Quality Inn at 1335 Howe, and the restoration and tenanting of 1060 Howe and 3475 East Hastings. In Vancouver, Anhart owns an SRO and also newly built affordable studio suites at 179 Main and 626 Alexander. Anhart was the initial owner and developer of the 69 affordable studios under construction at 138 Main. The Dodson at 25 East Hastings is the SRO owned by Anhart. It has 70 rooms, an elevator, and commercial space currently occupied by the Downtown Eastside Women's Centre. The Dodson has 15 tenants over age 65 and 30 tenants who are between age 50 and 65. Numerous tenants have lived in the Dodson for more than 20 years. Almost all the Dodson tenants need medical and or social supports. The Dodson was purchased by Anhart Investment Partners in 2004 and was repurchased by the Anhart Community Housing Society in 2013 at 50% of fair market value with a $2.3 million mortgage. Since then, Anhart has spent $2.5 million of privately donated funds to renovate the building. The renovation is ongoing. The average rent for the 70 units at the Dodson is $471 per month for a monthly total of $32,000. $971. Anhart has never had any rental subsidies. The average cost per unit at the Dodson is $586 per unit per month. These costs do not include taxes as, as the Dodson is tax exempt. I want to emphasize today that the cost as stated in the vacancy 
control report of $300 per unit per month and then $225 in the same report need to be corrected because the lean operating costs of an SRO privately operated are up to double that amount. To, illust to illustrate, I will give you the actual Dodson monthly cost for 70 units. Our staff will email you these numbers after this meeting. Fixed costs, insurance, $1,200. Mortgage of 2.8 million, principal and interest, 15,500. Capital reserve, 3,600. Uncollectible rent, 2,000. Hydro, 2,200. Cable, 1,300. Gas, 800. Water and sewer, 800. Phone, 100. Elevator, 400. Fire safety, 150. Waste management, 800. Pest control, 250. Fire alarm monitoring, 160. Supplies, 1,150. Repair labor, 1,000. Cleaning labor, 1,000. Laundry maintenance, 85. One staffing shift, seven days per week, $6,000. Community meals, $500. Accounting and bookkeeping, $500. Executive administration, $250. Tenant administration, $1,276. Total is $41,021 against an income of $32,971, a monthly deficit of $8,000. And if adjusted to subtract the principal portion of the mortgage payment, the net deficit equals $2,000 per month. But there is a higher reality that the council should understand. In the evenings and overnight, agents of organized crime enter the building and harm tenants and property. Violence and homelessness are on the rise. People are desperate. The Dodson needs 24-hour staffing. Anne Hart would gladly add 24-hour staffing. However, this would increase the deficit from $96,000 per year, adjusted to $24,000 per year, all the way up to $216,000 per year, adjusted to $144,000 per year. Anne Hart pays for the deficit by regularly increasing the mortgage and attempting to get revenue from the commercial space, which is being rented for $11 net per square foot. For many years, the commercial space sat empty. Van City, our banker, reminds us every year that the private operating model is not sustainable. I believe tenants and SROs need subsidized shelter rate rents, together with medical and social supports. I concur that the previously stated plans by the city to purchase and or upgrade SROs and to replace them with new self-contained units is what is needed. However, I would also suggest that although today's report is beginning to address an important component of the overall plan, it needs more work to correctly understand the operational and capital costs of privately owned SROs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you do have questions, so if you want to just stay there. First, Councillor Swanson, up to three minutes. Councillor. Yeah, I'm just wondering if you're working with, B with uh, BC Housing on this. Well, we've dialogued with uh, many times uh, with BC Housing about uh, our operation um, and subsidies, um, and uh, it's, it's an ongoing discussion. What parts of... Um, like, I'm kind of confused about Anne Hart and community builders and these different, which ones are actually non-profit and which ones are profit and how you're all connected. Uh, uh, they're all charitable organizations. Uh, we do also start um, social enterprises like uh, Clean Start, but uh, uh, I represent the, the core organization that started in 1983 and community builders group um, uh, is a branch off of that. Is there a reason why BC Housing isn't working with you? Well, probably it's a matter of priority. We are surviving somehow. So maybe uh, BC Housing uh, wants to uh, uh, look, at, look at other opportunities. If there was a RAP grant like we used to have where you could have renovation money with rent control, would you uh, try to get it, try to take advantage of it? Well, we've, we, we have many opportunities uh, to, to upgrade the capital um, uh, issues at the, at the building, um, but uh, they could, that could come from private sources or government sources. Um, our bias is that the private sector should pay as much as possible uh, towards uh, benevolent business practices. Um, however, the, it, it misses the point. The, the, uh, the, the, the point is that the, that the report is stating a very low operating cost. And so we, we just represent one of the many private uh, SRO operators. So uh, that would be noted by anybody operating an SRO privately. Okay, just one more question here. 
Were you the owners of the Jubilee that emptied it out and sold it to Stephen Lippmann, who is one of the biggest investor landlords? Well, that's not accurate. Um, uh, it was a question. Well, it it was a loaded question. The uh, the the the, job, the 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 Jubilee was was not sustainable, um, and those tenants were relocated to all of our other uh, buildings. And the 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 profits from the sale of the uh, Jubilee are what we put into new affordable housing in Vancouver and other places. Uh, who who bought the building? We had no control over that. It was listed by an agent. And then subsequently, uh, uh, the City of Vancouver and BC Housing bought uh, 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 the Jubilee from uh, the person you mentioned. And that is it for your time, Councillor Swanson. Thank you. You do have more questions, though. Councillor John Minato. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, thanks for being here. Uh, Keith, just a couple of follow-up questions. Just um, with respect to the report and recommendations presented to us, I asked staff earlier about uh, consultation and engagement. Um, were you consulted as part of the suite of, of SRO owners? No, we, we were not consulted. Um, and then, um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there. <laughs> it's a long couple of days of meetings. Um, I wanted to follow up on, oh gosh, sorry, Chair, it'll come to me. If you want, why don't you just go I'll on the bottom of the list? I'll put myself the queue because I've totally lost yeah, my train of thought. Thanks. It's okay. <laughs> why don't, why don't, why don't you, you need chocolate. Um, why don't you go to the bottom of the list and um, here you go. Councillor Kirby Young, you're next, up to three minutes. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I will uh, follow up on that line of questioning. My first question is, um, if, and I appreciate you presenting the information, if you had a challenge in uh, the rents that you're charging, not covering the cost, I'm wondering why had you not increased your rents until now? Well, we've tried to go the other way. I mean, we, uh, we've tried to keep the rents as, as low as we could. The point is the, the tenants are, are, are not well and need supports and need the lowest rent possible. But uh, we have not been in the BC housing stream, so we've not been getting subsidies, but, but we have an agenda to, pro to provide the best service to the tenants as possible. So we haven't, but right now we're at, the, at a critical point because the bank is saying you can't keep losing money like this. Okay, and and so to the question that was asked earlier, it's, has it been creative things like sale of another building or property that you've had to try to figure out ways to sort of, you know, keep everything taped up and and taking along and meet the financial obligations? Well, I mean, I, I think it's not a sustainable model. So our plan was to to build 138 Main and move the Dodson tenants there. Now something very different happened. We're going to try again with 118 Main. I do think we need to provide new housing uh, for tenants living in SROs, and then maybe those tenants can be refurbished in in, in some way. But the point is, we're, we're doing we're, we're doing any big picture thing we can to try to to try to pro solve the problem at the ground level. Okay, and then just following up on Councillor Dominato's question, I was going to ask the same one. You didn't, you weren't reached. It's not that you didn't participate in the consultation. You were not um, invited to. Is that correct? I had no awareness of it. We didn't decline. Okay. Do you know of any other nonprofits um, in your sector that participated, or are I, you not aware of that? I'm not aware. Okay. Thank you for coming to speak to Council. Appreciate your perspective. Great. Thank you. You have more questions. Thanks, Councillor Kirby Young. Councillor Hardwick. Go ahead. Did you say that you have been offsetting your deficit by increasing your mortgage? Yes. So uh, we we started with a mortgage of of 2.3 million. We now have a mortgage of uh, uh, 2.8 million, and it's scheduled to continue to rise unless we can uh, eliminate the deficits. Well, I can see what you mean about not being sustainable. So, um, yeah, no, I, I, I get, get uh, the problem with the business model. Then what is your recommendation? Uh, uh, well, my recommendation is that um, we, we accept that the, the, that the model no longer works. Uh, maybe a community-based model worked in earlier years, but the, but the, but the environment of the downtown east side re requires uh, lots of help from, 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 Many different levels. So, if we can, if we can accept that the model doesn't work, um, um, and then um, work with the private and public sector, uh, public sector, I think we need more private, uh, uh, public uh, co collaboratives. Uh, we can share any information we have with the city of Vancouver and with the province of BC and look for solutions. 
It's not sustainable. We, we, it's going to change because just never heard we can't just keep losing money. Well, I, I understand that. I just had never heard about heard of that model of increasing your mortgage to. Uh, so that was a new one on me. But uh, thank you. That I it makes sense. I understand. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hardwick. You have more questions, Councillor Dominato. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Keith. Um, following actually on on Councillor Hardwick's question, one of the questions I did have but more specific to the recommendations is if you, I assume you've read the staff recommendations, um, there's uh, both dealing with rents at or above $500 a month and those below. Um, did you have any specific recommendations for council around amending that? Um, or are you saying full out that the model doesn't work and that the staff proposal around a vacancy control framework isn't the right path to go down? No, I think a lot of good work went into into the report, mm -hmm. and uh, it, it was very helpful uh, to read through it. But uh, the report admits that it, it doesn't know the costs of a privately operated SRO, and it picked two very low numbers. So that's not that's that's just going to polarize the community. I don't think that's helpful. So my recommendation would be to uh, to to take a look ag again at that no that, at those numbers, and uh, maybe that that would uh, provide an adjustment. Uh, to the overall impetus of the of the of the report, so I'm not saying I'm for or against it. That's not my point here. I'm just saying there were some uh, deficiencies in, in what it was stating about income. Okay, th thanks for clarifying that. I did I did want to be clear on that. And then you had mentioned that again um, that you're attempting to keep rents low um, in light of the fact that tenants. Um, both the you know um, access to income assistance, but needing other supports and services. Um, do you have a model of any kind of uh, outreach supports coming in to the Dodson to support individuals with health matters? There are some organizations that work in Vancouver that do that at no cost uh, to tenants. I'm just curious what kind of support framework is in place. Uh, we do have a tenant support program, but as you can see, it's in, it's, it's incredibly limited uh, because of uh, the, the the private dollars available to it. Um, nurses, uh, social workers, uh, probation officers are coming regularly into the building, so uh, they do that in any building if they if they can come. So uh, we we connect with that, but the the, the needs are, are huge and the and the supports are very small, and that ends up having uh, a big dollar uh, tag at the, at the end of it. Okay, uh, thank you. Thanks for the additional time. That's great. Thank you. What well, just was ten seconds, but yes, thank you. Um, more questions, though. Councillor Fry, up to um, three minutes. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, so I just, I just, I'm trying to wrap my head around the BC housing piece and and where they're not sort of uh, the, the funding opportunities as you see them. And would would ideally would you want to be purchased by? Would it be better to be purchased by a, by the government? Well, let me be blunt. Uh, BC housing. We we realized a long time ago that the model wasn't sustainable. Uh, we 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 tried to work with BC Housing about them operating uh, the building or purchasing the building. Ironically, we were told that if they if they purchase the building, there's they have to then live with the high operating costs of that. So uh, so we, we we would we would be willing to continue the discussion uh, uh, with with. Uh, with, with with BC Housing, but we do realize their reluctance to to buy an SRO that's that's full. I run, if it was empty, they would probably buy it. Um, but uh, th that you know that that would go against the grain. Okay, and so just to be clear, what is the current SRO that you you have? The current, sorry. What what, what properties are we talking about right now? Twenty five Hastings East, the Dodson. The, the Dodson, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Councillor Fry. Just a point of privilege, Chair. If I could be added to the list, my yep, crust on's not working. That's Thanks. Fine. I'll do that right now. Um, but first, I'm going to advance Councillor Councillor Wade. Go ahead. Yeah, first question: Can you talk a little bit about how you've created a peer-related model that reduced your operating costs? Recognizing we're talking about how to keep SROs working and being healthy, can you talk about how you've used peer? services in your building to reduce the operating costs yeah thank you for that question because that's to the point and that 
that same model was shared by our sister organization, the Community Builders Group. So what we did is we studied uh, sociological modelings of emergence, and we've even uh, worked with uh, CMHC to produce um, some research on this. And uh, we realized that uh, a tenant community um, uh, will self-organize if given the opportunity. So we, uh, we, we, we let the tenants self-organize. We found out that 10% of the tenants will be the leaders and they'll work in the building. 80% will be followers and 10% would be grumpy even on a sunny day. So we, we pay for those tenants to, to work in the building, to have input, and, they, and they're actually offering 24-hour community watch, but they're elderly and it's very difficult. So that's, the, that's, that's how you lower costs by getting, uh, by getting the, the, the community formula, formulating from the bottom up. Beautiful. And one of the things we talked about when, we were, when you gave a tour was that you were going to bring <laughs> in some seniors to cover some of the open rooms because they have a bit more than the regular income assistance level. Can you talk about the, if we could increase our income assistance level, then your tenants would have more ability to pay and then you'd be more sustainable as an organization. If we did what to the room, sorry? Um, you talk about you, we were going to bring in more seniors because they have yes. a higher income assistance yeah. level. So can you talk a little bit about if we could lift up and get that advocate to the province to get more income assistance for your tenants and you could be a more sustainable model that could have that community Right, and actually, that's a practical reason why this uh, this re the, uh, this report would would give us difficulty because we were thinking of making the building an entirely a seniors building because the population of the building is getting so old right now, and uh, we we thought the seniors could pay a rent and there we could add a safer component uh, to that because they they would be eligible for safer, but then uh, you know that that higher uh, revenue wouldn't be allowed under this under this current program, but but not. not Notwithstanding that uh, that issue, uh, uh, we 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 would welcome having a seniors only, uh, only building, and uh, and uh, staffing it accordingly and getting supports from wherever we could for that. Thank you. Thanks for coming in today. All right. One more set of questions. Thank you, Councillor Weeb. Councillor Di Genova. Thanks very much. Um, you talked about the model not being sustainable as it is right now, and I'm I'm wondering if. If you, I mean, when we consider the fact that many of the encampments that we've experienced in Vancouver parks, um, often there are people there that do have an SRO or an SRA room and they're not comfortable living in it. They don't feel that um, it is helping them in any way. And I'm just wondering if you feel that um, there's concern with the whole model right now and if, if instead we should kind of be focusing on some of the maintenance and bylaws we already have. Well, I am a proponent of a congregate housing if it is operated uh, properly. Um, but it does it does take a, um, a coordinated, coordinated effort, and there are successful models out there operating congregate housing. Uh, our sister organization, Community Builders Group, is doing that for numerous buildings. However, they're getting support from the City of Vancouver and uh, the province of British Columbia. Can you do that anymore without support? I don't think so. So when I say the model's not working, what I mean is um, a, 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 a privately run community building that allows uh, uh, people that are that have very high needs in the building without having 24-hour staff and and uh, satisfying work safe bc that's no longer uh, feasible okay thanks so much so so can i just just to summarize are you supportive of these recommendations or do you do you think there, that we need to take another look at not only these recommendations but the other bylaws that we have currently and requirements for sras I can understand the reason for the recommendations. I think I think they're missing the point that uh, that the tenants are are not being cared for. Uh, so so I think with 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 some adjustments, I'd be happy to look at it again and uh, and see if I could put my support behind it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great. Th uh, that is it for your questions. Thank you for your patience. No problem. Yeah. Great. Okay, um, Council, we are moving on to Speaker 21, um, um, Krista Butler. Hello? Yes, that's, uh, we can hear you clearly. Just, just state your okay, name great. and go ahead. Hi, my name is Krista Butler. Um, I'm the Speakers Bureau Program Manager for Megaphone Magazine. 
Uh, but I'm calling on behalf of Chris Kronk, um, our longtime community member who recently passed away, uh, who was in support of uh, the SRO vacancy control. Chris was an advocate in the community until the day he passed away. Uh, through storytelling with Megaphone Speakers Bureau, Chris shared his wisdom from his lived experience of homelessness and substance use. He lived with such intention and a deep hope to increase compassionate, effective, and evidence-based responses to our housing crisis. And while he is unfortunately not with us to be able to answer any questions, he did write a letter right before passing away in his work with the Right to Remain Research Collective. And today I have the honor of sharing his words. My name is Chris Kronk, and I've lived in the downtown east side for 12 years. I've lived in SROs during that time, including the Avalon Hotel. I'm writing to support for vacancy control in SROs, no matter what. Regardless of what policy comes to pass, we need something, and we need to start somewhere. However, should that happen, our next priority must be monitoring the policy and other elements of SROs, too. People need to feel secure in their surroundings through things like cameras, staff, some kind of recourse when your door is kicked in, for example. When you live in an SRO, if nobody sees it, it didn't happen. The same applies to vacancy control. If it's not properly enforced, it will not be effective. Us old guys, when we have to end up moving back into the alley, we make bad mistakes and bad choices, and sometimes we can't bounce back. We need help, please. Not for me or my kids, but for your families you never think about too. Do it for them. Based on my experience, I strongly urge Vancouver City Council to prioritize monitoring and enforcement as they adopt vacancy control. I spent most of that time living in doorways or shelters for the simple fact that SROs are the most dangerous and unwelcoming of the three. As far as vacancy control goes, SROs have such a high turnover rate. People who go to SROs now are not people who are looking for a long-term help. They're looking for a break from everyday life, the younger people. The people who live in SROs actually have no choice. They've done their time in shelters. They've done their time in alleys. The turnover rate is remarkable per room. I lived in the Silver Avalon, and there were eight to nine people a month moving into different rooms. Most people don't even try to get their damage deposit back because they don't want to fight about it. So the landlord is collecting the damage deposit too, which in some cases is 300 to 400 bucks extra on top of the rent. We've got to stop the turnover. We've got to make SROs de desirable again. Once you get in an SRO, it's like a jail block. If you get behind those closed doors, there's no monitoring. With long-term tenants, the landlords want more and more turnover because there's more damage deposits and more taxpayer money once the rents are raised. The people of the city pay for these landlords to get rich and without care. These landlords are indifferent and turn a blind eye to, blind eye to suffering. Landlords don't want long-term tenants hanging around, trying to get help and self-respect back from these years in the alley. Landlords only want to pick on the bones and get rid of the carcass after. And that's why the shelter system is so prevalent. I know people who have lived in shelters for 10 to 15 years because it's safer. Your beds are always there, there's monitoring and cameras, and you can do the circuit and never have to leave. And when you do that, people forget how to live and what it feels like to have their own space. When you get older like I am and your body is starting to backfire more, you need a spot. You need a place to live and these are the only places. Most of us are on assistance of some sort and what is allowed to us is gouged. Even our food money is gouged. Charities are expected to pull the weight on the street corner. So many people pull over to feed these people because landlords are getting rich to take their food money and buy another SRO where they can feed on the bones of the poor. Vacancy control for SROs will prevent landlords from evicting SRO tenants who could return to the alley or the shelter in the name of profits. When you're older, you know you're in your twilight. You know how nice it would be to have a place to, to live in your final days where you're comfortable and safe, but without protections like vacancy control and proper monitoring. You can't go to the landlord and say my sinks are clogged for fear of getting tossed back into the alley so they can raise the rent for your room. You need a place to live and feel safe where somebody can come and visit you every day and not be turned away. You need it, you just plain need. There's only one thing stronger than fear and that's hope. Us down here on the east side, we need hope. 
because we all live in fear 24-7 about what's next. And the only way to get rid of that fear for some is to medicate. But we need to give them hope. From life experience, hope can undermine your need to disappear from your reality. Hope can bring you back on course. You need to give hope and not fear to people. Vacancy control in SROs is one step in the, in the right direction. Thank you for your time. I support vacancy control in Vancouver's SROs. Chris Cronk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, you don't, it was very clear. You, um, you don't, and thank you for reading that letter. Um, you don't need, to, uh, sorry, there are no uh, questions to you, uh, but thank you again for um, taking the time with us. Thank you. Um, so, Council, uh, I'm just going to get a confirmation from the clerk, but um, I believe, uh, clerk, if you could just confirm there's no one else on the line. Sorry, my microphone was no problem. difficult. I'm just absolutely confirming, but yes, with the number of speakers left on the list, we have no one on the line. Great. Okay. Um, in that case, um, what I think I'm going to do is uh, I do have to read through the list, but I, I'll, I think what we'll do is take a 10-minute break. But um, I, if I um, want to uh, just encourage people, if they have not spoken, they're on the list, um, uh, if call in the next 10 minutes, otherwise that list, I'll go through the names and then it, it will be closed. Um, and clerk, if you just want to read that number out, that would be great. For, for speakers to call in on. Um, yes, it was emailed to everybody. We sent an email twice to the speakers. Okay. If you can give me a moment, we can announce it over the line here. Okay, we'll just take that moment. Um, so again, after the 10-minute uh, break, I will go over the list. I have to read through once. Um, anyone who wasn't here when their name was called, um, then we can close it and uh, turn to debate and decision. The number? Yes, I have the number. It's toll free. 1-833-353-8610. And then it is 77546-POUND. 77546-POUND. Okay. And that has been emailed to all the speakers. Um, so they should as well have it in their emails. Great, that's wonderful. So um, we are on a 10 minute break and it is now um, 2.48. Why don't we return at uh, three o'clock?
is one and Christine is another. Thank you. So, uh, well, uh, uh, welcome back. Uh, thank you um, all for taking that little break and giving um, us a chance to let those speakers call in. Um, so we're in a situation now where uh, so far um, at this point, no one has joined the line, but I do have um, an obligation to read through the names of, uh, this is going through the list a second time, for those who did not join us um, on the line for the time that their name was called out. I'm going to do that and um, the clerk will respond whether or not they're on the line. And so I'll start, clerk, with um, speaker five, Erica Grant. Just yes or no, are they on the line? Oh. Erica is not on the line. Erica's sick. No, Chair Carr, Speaker 5 is not on the line. Okay, Speaker 8, Kevin Nanakwetigang? No. Okay, um, Speaker 19, Fiona York? No. Uh, speaker 22, Margot Leigh Butler? No. Speaker 26, Christopher Wall? Yes. Okay. Chris Wall? Chris, okay, and, go ahead. Um, you have up to five. My name's Christopher, perfect. My name's Christopher Wall, and I'm speaking in, uh, in opposition to this uh, proposal before council. Um, I believe it'll lead to the deterioration of both buildings and rooms on the downtown east side. Um, I'd like to thank the city clerk, uh, the manager, uh, new chair Carr, um, as well as mayor and council for hearing uh, this call. Um, today, I'd like to not talk about any particular city councilor uh, or any owner. Um, I'd like to talk about the person on the street, the person on the street who's waiting outside the Carnegie Outreach for a room. And that person deserves a good room. They deserve a room that's been painted, that's been cleaned, that's got a functioning smoke detector, that's got a functioning lock on their door, that's got a new stick down floor. They also deserve free common areas that are free of debris, fire escapes that are well maintained and don't have garbage stored on them or bikes. That's what they deserve. And I believe this policy will make it really difficult for private owners to maintain the current services that we currently have in place. Um, 24 hour security, that's another, that's another if, if you live in a bigger building, we offer 24 hour security. We have security cameras. Everything comes at a huge cost. Huge cost. In 2016, I was asked to join the City of Vancouver Task Force, SRO Task Force. And there were 50 people in the original meetings. And I was the only private owner in those meetings. They went on for a year and a half. We, city staff were there, city fire, police, all the all the staff on the ground, SRO inspectors, all exchanging ideas. I was asked by the former general manager of permits and licenses what the city could do to support private owners. I put my hand up and I said, I can tell you what you can do. You can, you can offer private owners an incentive to put money back into their buildings. Offer us a break on our city property taxes. Offer us a break on our license fees. Offer us a break on our water meters. The Hotel Empress, which was just featured in the paper, it's on a 25 foot lot. My property taxes are 36,000 a year. The Avalon Hotel, it's 88 rooms on East Pender, or West Pender, $42,000 in city of Vancouver property taxes. You divide $375 into 42,000 in city tax, 
that's a lot of that's a lot of months in rent. Huge. I have one one building, it's on Jackson, that I don't own but we manage. It had eight eight tenants in it when we when we took the building over. There are now fifty four tenants in that building. Fifty four. They're all paying five ninety five. That's the minimum. That's what we need. Ironically, that building backs on to the old Carnegie Outreach. So if you're waiting in line for a room, you'd be looking up at a vacant SRO. That, that SRO was vacant since 1989, and now it's totally full, completely, completely full. The water meter at the Jackson is 24000 a year in water, city water. I can relate to the Anhart presentation. The numbers are staggering. They're shocking. They really are. Vacancy control will make it impossible for private owners to maintain their buildings in a reasonable way. And if you talk to the city staff on the ground, you talk to the inspectors, they'll all say we're doing a pretty good job. We're doing our best. But vacancy controls will make it a lot more difficult. It's going to put us in a straitjacket. We're not going to be able to go in and clean the room the way we want. We're not going to be able to keep 24-hour security so people are safe. Elevator, elevator maintenance, fire standards, weekly pest control. In my buildings, we bring in pest control. Orkin comes in weekly in every building all year round. And these these are these are these are fixed costs. They're fixed costs. I just want to also. Um, I, actually, you're just out of time, but oh, you have a lot of. Questions. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. Oh, I'm sure I do. Yeah, no problem. Am I, am I just able? To... You can if you can stay on I... the line and answer questions. That okay. Would be great. Okay, let's do that. Okay, thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Yes. Your first first three minutes. Yeah, hi, Chris. Thanks for speaking to Council because I think it's important to have all kind of perspectives on an issue. I have a, a genuine question and I ask it with a genuine spirit. It's a really difficult um, type of property investment to be in. So my question, if you don't mind me asking, is why relative to other business investments or property investments that you could be in? You know, it's interesting. I, I got my start in Mount Pleasant and I, I received a call that the Hotel Empress in 2014 uh, might be for sale. So I went down and I, I saw the building and it had a bar on the main floor and it had 76 rooms and it had a lot of moving parts. And I thought that there were some things that I could do to, I thought it, there were some things that I could do to improve the building. And, um, and we've done a lot of those things. And it was the improvements that we made in the Empress, it was the improvements that we made in the Empress that's why I was on the task force. That's the reason why the former general manager asked me to join that task force. So 18 months, and the report actually is still our final our final our our final results and the final submissions are on still on the city website. You can see all of the, all of the data. They're still all there from those meetings. Okay. Um. Okay, thanks. I, I guess a follow-up that I have is, would you would you do it again, knowing what you know now? Would you get would you get into? <laughs> well, you know, it's interesting. I, I I I'm going to tie into something else that I wanted to say at the end to your answer to my answer. Yep, that, and that, that was my other the, question. Is there something else you didn't get to finish saying? So go for it. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that very much. Thanks for that. I've heard the word speculation used a lot. Speculated investors and people who. You know, owners who want to come in into the downtown east side and make, make money on the poor. There hasn't been an SRO trade in the city of Vancouver for two years, over 40 rooms. There is one listed SRO in the city of Vancouver. There are not 10 to 20. It's the St. Elmo. I can see it outside my office at Union Hastings. There's one. One. The other thing that I should say, too, if I may, is that there's a there's a there's a there's a there's this idea that there's a high rate of turnover in SROs. It's totally false. That's a false statement. We are we have 500 rooms. We're at full occupancy. 
So city staff, when they say that, I believe it's completely incorrect. There's nowhere to go. You do go by the Carnegie outreach. So they're lined up 20 deep every day. There, there are so no how many, rooms. Can I, I'm, I'm just about to run out of time. How, um, what's the turnover in your building to your 500 rooms? I'm under five, I'm under 3%. I have okay. 500 rooms, and I have I have I have six available right now, six, and they're just a running six because people have unfortunately died or they've moved. Right. And that's okay. it for Thank your you. questions, Councillor Kirby Young. Thank you so much. You have more questions though, if you don't mind staying on the line. I'm sure Count I do. Great, Councillor DiGenova, up to 30, 33 minutes. Thanks so much. Um, I I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. I have so many, but I only have three minutes. And one of my sure. questions well, we can, is, you can you? ask them later. You can ask me okay. later. Thank you. I, I'm I'm wondering with this bylaw, the fact is, is that you had talked about, you know, how people who line up deserve, you know, uh, painted walls and and clean rooms. Are you talking about dignified housing? Do they deserve dignified housing, not just housing that checks the boxes, but that is dignified? I, I, of course, of course. I mean, we at the West Hotel, I've got. I've got tenants in their 80s, 70s and 80s, living on living on the sixth floor and the seventh floor. And by the way, the West Hotel is the preeminent example of how a, a, bad, a terrible building could be turned around. And we're very proud of what we've done there. So um, and you can I, ask city staff. And so, yes, I, we, we'll I, be, I don't. I expect I expect to be able to live in the room. Thank you. And I, I wonder if you'd if, like to see an example, counselor. Yeah. If you'd like to see an example of what we do. You can go to hotelempress.ca, and there are pictures of before and after on the yeah. website. I've already done Instagram, that, and so. I appreciate that. I appreciate that, and and this is this is my point. But I I am only allowed to ask questions right now, so I'm going to ask you. I don't okay. know if you were listening earlier, but I was talking about some of the bylaws that we already have. Before we make some new ones and new enforcement measures, uh, for owners yes. who aren't don't take as much pride in their rooms as you. Do you think that it's important that we start to enforce bylaw 5462, which really talks to, um, you know, those clean, painted, fresh rooms that, you know, instead of everyone having a bad name and just Im implementing more bylaws, maybe we need to look at the ones we have that we're not enforcing and hope that everyone comes into compliance like you? Councillor, what a great question. And it was one of the questions that was asked to me of the former GM of Permits, license, and buildings has now left the city, unfortunately. Of course. Okay. Why? Do, you know, it, it, this is in the middle of all the the Sahota chaos. The city tried to deal with everything organically, and it didn't work. You know, I'm in total I'm in total support of I'm in total support of of implementing fines per day per diem to get owners to pull up their socks and to run these buildings properly. I'm in full support of that. So I don't want to cut you off, but with my last 20 seconds, can I ask, can you send all of council? Our emails are on the website, but can you send us your contact information? Because I'd like to send you the rest of my questions. And and they the city, are the about this. Counselor, counselor, everybody, every senior staff member at the city of Vancouver has my information. City manager, okay. all the general managers, the directors, every SRO inspector, they all have my details. Okay. Um, so that's probably the best way to go. City manager does. He can forward you my details. Anyone's okay. details. I'm happy. Now that you've said you that's okay, I will. Downtown. That's my time. I'll take you though. for a tour. I'll take you for a tour. I've taken general okay, managers for tours. Great. I've had cabinet ministers in my office. That is Come counselor, on down. That is counselor. And that is my time. time. Yeah. But thank you very much. I just wanted to add my thanks. I really thank appreciate you. your passion. Thank you, hearing, thank you for hearing an opposing view here today. Yeah, I feel completely outnumbered. I have yeah. to say. Yeah, and you have more questions, so just hang on the line, please. Councillor Hardwick, over to you. Uh, thank you. So I, I want to actually ask the similar question to Councillor Kirby Young again, because listening to all of this, I just shake my head and go, why would anyone want to be in this business? <laughs> right? You know, well, you, you, you know, every, with, you, with, you're, you're slum lords, and you are... Well, um, I'm not a No, but the characterization is... And I just go, why, why hold on? Why, why even do it? And then the flip side of that, of course, is if we, through this, are driving people like yourself out of the business, why are we doing that? I'm just, I'm still really wrestling with the big picture on this. But well, why it's stick interesting with it? because I have been, 
and count it just you should say that because I have been I've been approached by nonprofits to manage I've been approached by um, I've been approached by city staff to have certain interests in certain buildings that aren't being run particularly well um, you know our model works based on a minimum cost and this is why I'm opposed to this this bylaw is that we have to charge a minimum of 595 to run our buildings it, I, I, I was quoted in the paper, like if I if we can't charge 595, I'm going to end up like Anhart, right? So I, I can't be there. Um, so it's a great question. I mean, in the end, who knows? I mean, I think the the answer solution, as I said in the paper, you know, the answer and the solution to this is is a is a public buyout. I think that the public sector should own all these buildings. Overnight, they could lower all the rents. One stroke of the pen. And we're at 375, right across the board. Well, maybe if my crystal Minister ball Minister Eby, that's working. all he has to do. What, what's that? I said, maybe if my crystal ball was working, I could figure it out. But it just does seem to me that these are measures that I would take if I was trying to put the sector out of business. Did you hear um, well, the fellow from Anhart talk about increasing their mortgage by half a half million I, dollars? You know, I, was, I listened to every presentation today, and his, his presentation was... Um, it really rang true with me. And I've been in the Dodson. I looked at the Dodson four or five years ago when it was, when there was a potential purchase. It's a great building. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it, I, I, I feel for them. You know, this is the problem is that all the downtown nonprofits, everybody else, they all want, they all want services. They all want the tenants to have everything, but they want rents to be at, at shelter. And the two, to, the two collide. You can't do it. It's impossible. So you can't have it both ways. You can't have great rooms and 24-hour security and, and, you know, really, I mean, when, we, when, we, when we do our city inspections, the city blasts through our buildings in under an hour. We had five violations at the West Hotel last month okay. out of 98 rooms. Five. I'm out of time, but I still, uh, maybe if you can come up with an explanation of why you stick with it, that would be Thanks. interesting. Thank you. Well, I'm, well, I'm done. Thank you. No, actually, well, you'll have to be for someone else uh, for now. Thank you. Councillor I'll, Hardwick is out of time, okay. so I have to, I'm sorry, okay. I have to advance sure. questions to Councillor Dominato. Thank you, Councillor Dominato. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Chair, and, and thanks, Christopher, for calling in. Um, I wanted to Thank you. circle back. I, I asked Ann Hart this as well, is that our staff uh, undertook um, consultation. Um, were you invited to be consulted on the, this work? Uh, the work being this proposal? Yes, like where there was engagement with uh, I, and private SRO owners. I was, I was, yes, I, um, I was, I left my campsite in Tofino, BC, and I cracked open my laptop to listen to a, I was on the, we, we, there were five, I believe there were five, five private owners on the call, or four, and it was a one hour web call, web, WebEx call, half an hour of which was taken by city staff and their presentation, and then we had 30 minutes to, we had 30 minutes to discuss the proposal. And I rejected everything. I just said, you know what, this isn't gonna work. Send it back, stamp it rejected. Like, Try something else. Make it so it's make it so it works for us. Did you in in that obviously in 2016 you had put forward suggestions around incentives? Were they brought up yes. in the most recent engagement and consultation? No, no. I I forwarded the former general manager of pub, of, of permits and licenses and buildings a list of expenses that I believe that the city could provide private owners against which we could have tax deductions based on money put back, based on the money we'd put back into our buildings, big capital costs, new roof, you know, new exterior paint, new security system, property taxes, water meters, city of Vancouver permits and licenses, you know, safety BC, like it just goes on and on with the expenses, like it's, it's crazy. So I gave them a list of eight, eight items per building that we spend big money on that I thought the city could give us a deduction on. You know, the half a million dollars, I did the math. I added up all my property taxes across eight SROs. It's gonna cover your half a million. So I'm gonna pay that. And I just, I'm gonna run out of time, but I have one more question. Just, um, you made a point earlier and I wanna just clarify, were you suggesting that with this policy framework, there's a risk that um, SRO rooms will be left untenanted and that we'll see more people pushed out on the street? 
No. I don't think that's the case. No. I think it's the person waiting in the line on Powell Street. They deserve a good room, and they're not going to get a good room. They'll get a room. Like, we have, like I can't afford not to have a room that's full. So like, heard- I can't afford to have a half-vacant room or a half-vacant building. But no, no, the, 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 the person at the Carnegie, Bob Moss is going to send them to me, and they'll, they'll end up with a crummy room if someone does, if, if With vacancy control, they're just going to get a terrible room. It's going to remain terrible. Nothing's going to happen to the room. It's about the room. It's about the 160 square feet that the residents are living in. And that is it That's for Councillor Dolman out of time. Is, Sorry, I'm sorry that I have Thank to keep you. to the timing, but it's that's uh, okay. Yeah, it's, that's uh, okay. I know there are other people waiting. I have waiting. to be fair for, to everyone. That's fair. That's fine. Right. But you still do have more questions, Councillor okay. Swanson. Let's over go. To you. Hey, so just starting off, I, I recognize that uh, you're the probably the least bad of the investor landlords. Um, how many buildings do you own? I have eight buildings and I, I manage two. Okay. So do you know how many of your do you know how many of your tenants get rent subsidies from Bob Moss or somebody else? You know, that's a great question. Um, surprisingly a lot. And this is the other this is the other point that needs to be made is that it's shocking the number of it's shocking the number of tenants who are actually topped up from that's 375 shelter rate. It's a huge number. And you could talk so, to Bob and and it comes from they come from everywhere, Councillor Swanson. They I know from, that because they come from all before, sorts of organizations. Before I got elected, people were always coming to me from the West and saying, We got thinned well, here by our landlord. How do we get a rent subsidy? So would you be well, willing to work with a RAP type program? Would you be willing to work with a RAP type pr- program where you got money for upgrading but had to keep a lid on the rents? I'd be, I'd, I'd be open to that. I mean, I'd have to look at it. I mean, I've seen cases of, on the downtown east side that you're familiar with where the money comes in and it's not spent on buildings, which I find very, uh, I, I find it very frustrating that that's happened in some cases. Um, I'd be, I'd look at that. Um, you know, in the end, though, I think that I should be self. I should be self. I should be sustainable. I should. I don't. I don't particularly want to rely on on, you know, on on other areas or sectors to to run to run the buildings. I think they should run themselves. I'm fortunate. I've got a couple of bars on the downtown east side that subsidize some of the buildings that do. You know, that struggle. I've got I've got 40 so, rooms at 375. I've got 40 rooms at 375, and the city of Vancouver is claiming that there's 77 rooms that are at shelter. That number can't be correct because I have so, 40. What I'm wondering is if it's so hard for you to make a go of this at the existing rents, how come you've got enough money to buy eight hotels? How, how do I have enough money to buy eight hotels? Yeah. Well, it's, it's, it's borrowed money, counselor. But you must how have to it's all it's all borrowed money. It, they money. didn't require you to have any equity. Well, I don't want to get I don't want to I don't want to get into my private finances, and and but I but you know I mean the, the reality is that there's tremendous debt on these buildings. You know when you hear about sort of speculation and 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 you know we've got to stop you know private investors in this sector. First of all, there. Oh, so I, I'm so sorry. I, I'm, I know that you have <laughs> lots. Excuse me. I, I know you have lots of <laughs> lots of comments you want to make in response, but Councillor Swanson okay. is out of time, and that was okay, the end is. of your okay. speakers. But very much appreciate okay. your willingness to okay. come and talk and to answer sure. the questions. Sure. Anytime. Great. Okay. Anytime. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Okay, Council. I'm just going to move through to the speakers who are on the line right now. The next speaker on the line. Um, is number 37, Nadia Chumi. Nadia Chumi? Yes, I'm here. Can Great. you, yep, can just, you hear me? Yep, I, we can just state your name and go ahead. Awesome. So my name is Nadia Chumi, and I'm the Media Relations and Communications Manager for Union Gospel Mission. 
I'm joining you today to speak on behalf of the organization in support of the motion on vacancy control and all SROs that all of you will soon be voting on. UGM is committed to transforming communities one life at a time. For over 80 years, journeying with the downtown Eastside community, we have observed the positive impact stable housing has in a person's journey out of poverty, homelessness, or addiction. It restores a sense of dignity in their lives, empowers them as they move forward in their recovery journey, and it alleviates the overwhelming burden of simply not knowing whether they'll have a roof over their heads for the night. Housing is the first step and a very important step in someone's recovery journey. This is why we, along with many other organizations in the downtown east side, advocate so passionately in support of it to protect it and to improve it. That's why I'm joining you today. There are close to 4,000 people currently living in 100 privately owned single room occupancy hotels, SROs, which are a last resort before homelessness for many residents in the downtown east side and downtown core. According to data from the SRO Collaborative, about one third of the tenants in these hotels are indigenous. Furthermore, race-based data collected for the first time during last year's homeless count showed that black, indigenous, and Latinx people are disproportionately affected by homelessness, meaning that racialized communities will continue to be disproportionately impacted by growing scarcity of SROs. That's what makes your decision today so crucial. Vacancy control within private SROs often a person's first step out of homelessness or a last resort, is critical in ensuring individuals pursuing recovery have access to affordable housing. The current structure, tying rent increases to tenancy instead of vacancy, is placing these vital pieces of the housing continuum out of reach for many low-income individuals. In the last four years, average SRO rents have increased by 16% from $483 to $561 per month. For an individual on income assistance receiving only $375 per month in rental, rental supplements, these rent increases have pushed already precariously housed individuals into even more unstable situations. We know that there is no quick fix for homelessness, but there are measures that can be taken to keep people from ending up on the streets, and this is one such measure. Maintaining the status quo risks driving increasingly more people into homelessness. While long-term housing solutions are necessary, Vacancy control in Vancouver's SRO hotels is a tangible first step in maintaining housing affordability and preventing homelessness for low-income individuals in the downtown east side. We strongly encourage all of you to accept the recommendation of city staff for vacancy control within Vancouver's SRO hotels. Thanks so much for your time today. Great, and thank you so much for the time. I very much appreciate you speaking to council. That was super clear. Um, and there are, there are no questions. Uh, so the next speaker we have on the line is 38, Hope Hart. Yes. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Hope Hart, and I'm the coordinator of the CCRN, the Coordinated Community Response Network in the downtown east side. Um, and I first just want to acknowledge that I'm phoning in on the unceded and stolen lands of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations, and that I think this motion is really important um, in the city advancing reconciliation, as we know so many um, that our residents and SROs are indigenous and that this is a huge part of the conversation around decolonizing housing. So I wanna thank you all on council for taking the time to listen to our concerns as Vancouver citizens. And I hope that out of hearing the many voices today um, and through the countless letters and emails written, you can support the vacancy control bylaw. So for quick background, the CCRN, um, which I coordinate, is a network of downtown east side organizations, including some social enterprises, businesses, and nonprofits. We came together quickly during COVID to start to collaborate and support the downtown east side neighborhood through the pandemic and respond to crises that are happening um, and look at the short-term solutions and long-term advocacy work. And so we know that COVID has illuminated the multiple crises in the community and that work, the work needed to address these is complex and requires collaboration and coordination. So when we look at the vacancy control bylaw, um, we can see that it's not just about this one specific thing, but that it also involves the multiple crises of, being, of homelessness during a pandemic, the opioid crisis and climate emergency, which, is, which can be a death sentence to many in our community. So this is why so many grassroots groups exist, like the SRO Collaborative and its community partners and tenants who've worked tirelessly on the ground to make motions and solutions like this a possibility. 
um, and to really be a community led. And so I want to speak to support this bylaw and the impact it will have immediately to prevent homelessness in the community and also to share how the downtown east side is coming together more to support advocacy and change and work more collabor collaboratively on long-term solutions to these ongoing crises to kind of see the big picture of how these motions um, for these types of bylaws help encourage the continued work on the ground. So we know that this bylaw is only a short-term stopgap solution to the continued housing crisis in the city and that there are um, that we still need to address the, some unsafe living conditions and sanitation and safety, but we also know that more organizations, um, networks and community members are collaborating to find these long-term solutions in the neighborhood. So thinking about that in the CCR, and we're also working with other networks and other community partners like Exchange Inner City and Urban Core to promote more, more open dialogue and change. And we see between our networks and our experiences the impact of the SRO and housing crisis has across different avenues. So whether looking through Urban Core and their frontline organizations and the need to spend more time and resources providing specific housing supports and services to Exchange Inner City and the impacts um, of increased rents have on an individual's ability to maintain stable housing, or um, the responding to the multiple crises that occur when safe housing is unavailable and residents are forced onto the streets or into other precarious unsafe housing. Um, so we're asking you to please act appropriately to protect low-income tenants and SROs from homelessness and prevent the crisis from worsening. There's a need to work now to put in a stopgap solution to severe housing crisis as we cannot afford to lose any more housing options. Approving this motion allows the community and the city and, and provincial government more time to continue to work on these long-term solutions um, to the vital crisis it's facing in the community. Um, so as collaborative network supporting the downtown East side, we are happy that the city of Vancouver is voting on this motion and thank you for taking the time to listen to the experiences of those impacted by current SRO practices and by acting on this bylaw today to support more equitable, inclusive approaches to housing that protects the most vulnerable tenants. Thank you. Uh, and thank you. That was very clear. Um, no questions to you, but really appreciate you calling in. Council, Thanks. we're moving on to speaker 40 on the line, which is, uh, who is Nick Young. Hi, um, can you hear me? Yes, just uh, state your, your name and uh, go ahead, up to five minutes. Go ahead. Uh, hi, Mayor, and, yep, hi, Mayor and Councillors. Uh, my name is Nicholas Young. I'm the Chinatown Community Tenants, Community and Tenants uh, Organizer with SRO Collaborative. First of all, uh, thank you for anonymously approved motions in December 2019 and September 2020, asking staff to investigate how to protect tenants in SRO hotels. And also thank you uh, for elders and friends who speak before me. I'm here today to present you with a bilingual letter and petition by the Chinese SRO tenants who live in benevolent societies and private owned SROs. You should have a digital copy and a physical copy um, in the list of submitted letters from our to our research collective. We're in support of this motion. To help you better understand our letter and petition, here's some basic information of who signed this petition and how this come into being. After receiving this city, uh, the council report on the fourth, my volunteer team, my volunteer team and I quickly translated the materials and did outreach to the Chinese tenants. And within one day, 60 Chinatown tenants uh, from all seven remaining society owned SROs signed the petition. 43 out of the 60 live in Chinese society owned buildings, including 30 of whom are SRO tenants. And the remaining 17 live in, live in other private SROs. All of these uh, seniors and seniors and tenants are 55 years old, age, of age or older. Most of them understand Cantonese or Mandarin and speak dialects. Uh, most of the tenants uh, speak little to no English speaking abilities and only have little Chinese writing skills. Many are not qualified of old age pension. Even those who qualify for social housing don't, have, don't want to apply because it will take, uh, take up more of their limited income. Some are even supporting their families in rural China with their already little income. For the tenant perspective, this is the first time of these 60s elders engaged the council as a group of non-English speaking tenants. 
Now, please allow me to recap some of the key points in our collective letter. Over 170 Chinese seniors live in SROs. The total 60 signatories of this petition represent a significant portion of them. My team and I speak to all the, te- speak to all the tenants and no one disagrees with, uh, uh, with this proposed policy and they all support this approach. We respect the benevolent society and them keeping the rent low of our, for our tenants. Rent are training up in private owned Chinese SRO, some as high as 600. They understand rents are going up to over 1,000 in other parts of the stock, and they don't want that to happen. Chinese and other BIPOs by POC tenants have experienced different forms of oppression, and they want all SRO tenants to have good living conditions. In order to improve living conditions in all SROs, resources must be put towards strengthen, strengthening SRO tenants' mutual support network in Chinatown and in downtown itself. Vacancy control is the most cost-effective strategy. And in conclusion, thank you for accepting this petition and consider the voice of non-English-speaking tenants living in SROs. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And if you don't mind staying on the line, you do have some questions from councillors. First, from Councillor Swanson. Go ahead, Councillor Swanson. Yeah, thanks so much for uh, phoning in to speak, Nick. Um, there's a, an amendment flying around uh, to this that says single room occupancy, single room accommodation, SRA rooms renting below 375, the current shelter component of income assistance, can increase the base rent after a period of vacancy up to 375. So this is like to deal with the issue of the benevolent association rooms. It wouldn't apply to anyone who's currently a tenant, just to potential new tenants. So what do you think of this amendment, if it's made? Um, I do learn about this amendment this morning. Um, I think that we should go back to the tenants uh, because so far we have consulted the urban societies, but we have not directly consulted uh, the tenants who also live in the buildings and who know their situation the best. And the city council can do a better job at you know, including non-English speaking tenants in this process, um, including the landlord who also expressed their frustration um, in, in the report. And yeah, I think there's more work to do. And uh, I can, I, the tenants, I, I know that we look forward to work closer with the society and other private landlord uh, to empower tenants in their buildings. Mm-hmm. Okay, I don't think we've got enough time to go back to them because this is probably going to be voted on today. Were you saying that some of the tenants who live there are undocumented and don't even have welfare, so they really do need to pay less than 375? Uh, I would say so. Um, but also, you know, we I don't want to talk about them in abstract, and I think that uh, with more support and, and more resources go back to the grassroots organizing, we could uh, figure out case by case. And I, I'm sure there's like a lot of solutions to help these tenants. Okay, thanks so much, Nick. Okay, thank you. Um, and you do have other questions. Councillor Di Genova, I have just three minutes. Hi there, thanks very much for, for making the time to speak with us. I'm just wondering, because you had opened your presentation by talking about making lives better or making the lives better of the tenants and the conditions better for the tenants living in SRA or as some know it to be SRO um, accommodation. I'm wondering how do you feel about the city of Vancouver's enforcement of the current maintenance bylaw that literally says right now that we could be um, enforcing, you know, some of the issues with pests and rodents, making sure that you know, there is freshly painted and clean accommodation. Do you think that that's important to be weighed with this as well? Instead of just kind of moving forward with one new policy, we need to consider how we're how we're going to help these tenants to have dignified accommodation instead of just to secure accommodation that some might not even want to stay in because they chose an encampment instead. Uh, 
Um, I believe that uh, all the SRO tenants, um, regardless they're Chinese or like other um, other ethnicities, um, the reason they move into SROs is because of different forms of oppressions, uh, including uh, colonialism and, and other forms of oppressions. Yeah, and, and also obviously racism. And, and I think that um, just because of a few tenants, uh, we, we should actually um, to prove to, to support this motion first and then figure out other resources to, to go back into grassroots and, and, and figure out other solutions. Thanks. I'm, I'm wondering though if those resources are already there. So those, those bylaws are already there and I'm really looking forward to hearing back from staff at the end of speakers to, to answer my questions on this. But I'm just wondering, do you think that we also should be um, enforcing those bylaws to make sure that, that you know, um, regardless of if it is, you know, the, the Chinese benevolent associations or other private owners or nonprofits, that there are standards that are met. And if they're not complied with, you know, for cleanliness, and to offer dignified housing, that the city takes action. Do you think that it's important that we yeah. make sure that the rooms are clean? Yeah, uh, I understand your question. Um, I'm here today to try to uh, make sure the voice of these tenants are not overlooked. And I think this is my prime, like primary message. And if I, if you have any more questions about, you know, uh, that consider concern benevolent society's views, and I think. Uh, you should go back to them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for answering my questions. I really appreciate it. Yep. Great. Thank you very much, Councillor DiGenova, and thank you very much, uh, Nick uh, Young. Um, uh, that is it for your questions, but very much appreciate you both answering the questions and speaking generally to Council. Thank you. Thank you. We are now on to Speaker 45, Marvin. Marvin. Hello. Yes. Hi. Is this yeah, Marvin Delorme? Yes, the speaker. Great. If you want My to just state, state your name and go ahead. My name is Delorme uh, in the downtown east side, and I am against. Um, I am for uh, vacancy control. And uh, my story is not as long as a lot of people. I've been at the same building for a period of five years. It's a private SRO. And what's been happening is they do a little bit of renovations, paint the walls, and the rent goes up. And some of the long-term uh, residents have been asked to leave because of alcoholism or drug addiction or mental health. And then they do a quick job of renovating it and continue to jack up the rents. And that's the, the procedure for the last three years. And it's not slowing down. So we're getting a lot of new people moving in that can actually afford. Uh, we're, we're at, we're at uh, 550 for average and up as high as to 750 per month with these little tiny rooms. So that's where we're at. Uh, you, you know, I think probably within a couple of years, all of us will be out of there. So hopefully this uh, does something to the owners and... Uh, it, it stops the process of uh, the rent going too high, so some of us can stick around and uh, enjoy the, the the home that we live in. And that is all. Great. That's been, thank you very much. Um, I, that's it. If there there aren't any questions for you, but very much appreciate you calling in. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, sorry, we're, uh, I'm on a speaker 40, um, 40. Um, we have another person here who skipped over. Is 46. it possible? I'm sorry, 46. Yeah, we're on speaker 46 now, which is Chloe Noir. Are you Chloe? I'm sorry, unfortunately, Chloe is not um, able to speak, but we have a... Um, a speaker from earlier who has skipped over speaker number, um, do you remember what speaker number you were? Oh, 28. Um, yes. Yeah. 
Oh, there is. I will. Uh, I will continue going in the order, numbered order, to the end of the list. Those who are on the line um, will be able to speak, and then at the end of the list, I will go back, starting at the very beginning of the list, and read out the numbers and names of uh, anybody who was not on the line at the time I called it out the first time. So I will go through those numbers starting at the beginning. Um, I will go through the list again once, calling out the names. Is Speaker 46? No, they sent out the Speaker 46 on the line. Clerk, I thought you said that Speaker 46 was. Yes, Chloe Noir. And there is a presentation we have received. It's Chloe Noir on the line. Yes, I am hearing the individual is on the line. If speaker number 46 is there, we have your presentation ready. And you should be unmuted and able to speak. I just got a message, Chair Carr, that they've been disconnected. It, it's it might have been a technology thing. Sure, I, I will um, hopefully um, that person can be messaged um, and I will call that number out and name out again when I go through the list for my second time. Okay, we are now on to um, speaker 47, who is, I believe, on the line rather than in person. Uh, Peter, sorry, Pete Marlowe, are you on the line? We can just take up to um, five minutes. Hi, my name is Pete Marlowe. Um, hello, counselors. Hello, guests. I'd like to do my latest call for you. Um, I live in the FRO on East Hastings Street, and Hastings uh, saw it in the tradition of John Milton, the guy who wrote Paradise Lost, a great epic poem that's kind of like uh, the story of, of the last few decades in Vancouver. It's called Market's hot, the wood tears cold. Fight empty condos for 15 an hour as we speak within these rapid roach infested holes. The millions of feet of the lumber shelter rate, fitness control, just more on our making property control. For you, but thank you again for um, uh, for coming to speak to us. All right, you're welcome. Okay, so we are um, now on um, 48. 
Nathan Adelson. Thank you, Councilor Carr. Uh, hotels or are homeless and to speak in support of the recommendations before you today to reduce vacancies and help control rents and SROs to secure funding to help maintain these buildings and build more self-contained social housing and to make lo the low-income housing survey more effective. It may be helpful to speak briefly about the origins of the SRA law and some of the debates that took place.
That was perfectly timed, Nathan. Um, there aren't any questions for you, but uh, very well stated. Appreciate the time you've taken to speak to us. Great. Um, Council, we, um, uh, I'm just going to check with the clerk, but in terms of the remaining people from uh, numbers 49 to 51, none of, none of those are on the line, right? Correct. No, none are on the line. Then I'm going to go now back to the beginning of the list, Council, um, to call out the names the number and the names of the people who were not on the line when I first called their name. And I only will do this once. It's not public hearing, which is three times, but this is once. And, um, and then we will um, move on from there in the meeting. So um, starting with speaker five, Erica Grant. And the clerk will inform me if um, any of these are on the, on the line. Speaker five on the line. I'm just getting a message, Chair Carr. Sure, I'll wait a moment, no problem. I think we have to go slowly here. Um, the individual I had heard was on the line about 15 minutes ago, but at the moment they're not. So this is the second call and our process would be to move along. We're going to go through the list. Okay, so um, I've just been informed by the clerk that um, that speaker five was on the line 15 minutes ago, but isn't now, and I cannot hold at this point. So this, I'm going through the list. If they're not on the line, um, my, you know. My apologies, but this is the process that I must go through in fairness to the others who are on the line. So um, I'm going to move on from number five to number eight. Kevin Nanakewitang. Is Kevin on the line? I'm just checking, Chair Carr. Yep, no problem. And number eight is not currently on the line. Okay. Speaker 19, Fiona York. No. Okay. Speaker 22. And if I miss somebody, I, I kept a record, but clerk, please um, make sure that I haven't forgotten anyone. Speaker 22, Margot Leigh Butler. Yes, I'm on the line. Oh, great. Okay. Um, that's fine. We hear you clearly. Just state your name and go ahead for up to five minutes. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Margot Lee Butler. Um, I'm a settler born on Pegwis land, and I'm the academic director of the Humanities 101 Community Program, which for 23 years has run free supported university level courses with over a thousand low income residents of the downtown east side and downtown south. And I know that Alison Dunnett um, may be there. Uh, Alison was one of the founders of this program. Uh, during the pandemic, I know that four respected, cherished Humanities 101 alumni died as a result of inadequate housing, poison drug supply, and COVID-19, and sometimes all three. And I have no doubt that there are others. I've long seen the effects on my students of living in desperately inadequate housing, living with both episodic and protracted homelessness, and have also seen the effects of students living in better housing and in culturally appropriate Indigenous housing. I'm here to strongly support vacancy control in all SROs. I want to focus uh, here on the powerful positive effects I've seen in students who move from homelessness to housing, and conversely, those who move from barely adequate, let's call it bad adequate housing, to living on the streets. One student describes it in this way. It's being tossed into the sea of the downtown east side, where stress is the utmost element that consumes everything in your physical and mental health, and with time leads to the opposite end of wasting away. 
Getting stable housing reduces that stress, opening up possibilities like going back to school or going to university for the first time. Another student spoke of the new calm and focus he experienced after getting an apartment in Indigenous housing. And his family spoke of how this made it possible for him to move past his residential school experiences. A third student finally got into a co-op in the downtown east side, and he's been a volunteer board member almost since that time and shares their resources. What turned out to be our very last in-person class was held in the co-op's activity room. I also know young Indigenous HUM students who slept in the bushes at UBC after class without homes to go to, others who returned to the downtown east side to sleep under the Georgia Viaduct, an older Indigenous woman who lived on the streets in another province for six years before moving to Vancouver to again live without a home, and another person who over the years was progressively, regressively shifted from bad to worse housing and then to none at all. He carried his bags containing all his worldly goods with him to school each day. These people are all very valued, respected members of the community, and I know that the city of Vancouver can do much better by them. I join many others in fighting to protect SRO tenants from homelessness through vacancy control, which ties rent to the unit rather than to the tenant. And I fervently hope that you will join us. Thank you so much for your attention. And thank you for your, um, your uh, speaking to council. It's very much appreciated. There are no questions for you, but again, thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, we are now on to um, calling out uh, for the second uh, on a, the second round. Number speaker twenty seven, Gilles Seren. I'm just checking, Chair Carr, mm -hmm. and I'm getting a no that speaker number twenty seven is not on the line. Okay. Speaker 29, Brian O'Donnell. Yes, hello, hi, how are you? Yeah, yeah. good. Jeff, just state your name and go ahead up to five minutes. Brian O'Donnell, yeah. Well, um, I've been living in an SRO here for about three and a half years um, after my divorce. I live at the cheapest place that I can rent. I'm paying 550. I was paying 470 and I moved just into one room and he raised it to 550. <laughs> he wanted 600, but I talked him down to that 550. I mean, I'm on social assistance. I can barely afford to pay attention. <laughs> so I thought, you know, it's ridiculous. The 375 and then I have to take out of my support to pay the 550, right? So, uh, and most people in the building are like that. And then I had no window for a year and a half that I lived here. It was like, I feel it was cruel. You know, but um, what would be really good would be to like even to start in Chinatown, even or you know it's downtown east side, just to freeze rent. Like you know what I mean, to have at least a decent. You know what I mean? Even if someone moves out, they can't double the rent. You know what I mean? That would be very important. A rent control of some sort. I mean, it's very important. Everybody who I talk to, all my peers, everybody I work with, uh, they all feel the same. Um, and housing is a right. It's not just a, something you can, a luxury. You know, housing is a right. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, we've got to enforce that, of allowing people to have six summer homes that are empty. You know, I mean, it's, it's, I'd say close to 30,000 empty homes in the city you know, come winter when people travel. I mean, it's just, I mean, it's ridiculous. People shouldn't get tax write-offs or incentives for keeping them empty. They should, you know, be forced to either rent them out or, you know, um, just, you know, at least at least we'll lower the rents, if, if so, you know, I mean, for people to afford it, you know, because they're just trying to transform. Like, basically, the middle class is gone. There's rich, poor, and cops. Those are the three classes in this in this city, I find, right? So I, I'd like that to uh, change. You know, defund the police would be a good start. Uh, people, the general public, don't even know how horrible the police are because of the stigma they impede in, in, in on us, right? For um, as as um, downtown East Side or calling somebody a drug addict or this and that. No, that's what they do to survive. That's not who they are, right? So everybody, I believe, is entitled to to a house, right? To a place to live. Um, I, I'm tr I try to change the subject, the concept of houseless or homeless, and I call it houseless. 
Because a home is a concept you put inside a house, right? If we change the word to houseless, then there's something wrong with society. Homeless is it's got this stigma of guy who won't comply, pushes the shopping cart, and he's on drugs, and all this stigma that shouldn't even be talked about. He's a human being. He needs, you know, housing, and that's the, that's the bottom line. You know what I mean? I, I, I will work and die for. So, so, um, anything else I can really mention about that? I think the whole city, you know, sure, federally we should make it that way, but people will always manipulate it. So let's start with the people who can't afford it, the elderly and people who who are on social services or disability. They are first up to be able to get proper housing because living in the park, living in the street, you know, all you are is, is subject to being bullied by police, by the people who believe the stigma, who believe the uh, the hype that we are the bad people, you know, and they walk all over us. So all these things need to change. I try to do my part by educating people, but if we get media attention, there's people who sit inside their um, cells, their own apartments or condos, will actually start to see, wow, wow, we've been lied to for a long time. This is not right. We need to fix these situations instead of like, these people need to uh, be delete, deleted off the planet. No, that's not fair. We're all equals. We got to, you know, work together to make that happen. That's really all I can say. Um, I can't think of anything else uh, this, about that for housing. But um, I, I do think that it should be a rent control, uh, should be in, implemented. We had it years ago. But they somehow made it prohibition. You know, what I mean? just like uh, it's, you know, anything that they do, that they, the people go along with, like income tax for one thing, was only put in as an effort for the Second World War. Oh, but they keep doing it. So, what's going on? All these things that we have to reevaluate and rechange, instead of just being the almighty government is too powerful. No, I'm sorry. I was educated that Canada, we are the government. We appoint people to work for us, right? We are basically a socialist country, but on a democratic level, right? So I think we should actually, you know, stop watching American propaganda and start being Canadian. You know, and okay, and that, that is it for your time. Um, yeah, thank you. that's great. Well, thank you for taking the time. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah great. Cheers. Okay, bye-bye. Moving on to uh, speaker 31, Val Johal. Not on the line. Okay. Speaker 33, Edward Wilson. Not on the line. Uh, speaker 34, council has withdrawn. So they weren't on the line originally, but they have officially withdrawn. Speaker 35, Zoe Luba. Sorry, I'm just checking. No problem. Not on the line. Okay, Speaker 36, Peter Athanas. Yes. Peter Athanas, you there? I, yeah. Yes, I'm here. Yeah, just state your name and go ahead up to five minutes. We can hear you. My name is uh, Peter Thanis. I appreciate the opportunity to speak in front of the uh, Standing Committee on this policy. Uh, I'm in opposition to the policy. I'm also an SRO owner. I own the Pender Lodge. Uh, I mostly house uh, seniors, and I'm very proud of that. We do a very good job there. We have a clean building. We only had two deficiencies in our last uh, inspection. Uh, firstly, as a city councillor, if I knew a policy would achieve the opposite, I would have to ask myself, would I vote for it? Um, secondly, I mean, the actual effects of rent control, um, the reality of renting to tenants at an artificially lowered rent relative to uh, the market rent is that the stopgap measures designed to stop our rents from increasing will create a value gap between market rents and artificially lowered rents. This will attract an abundance of better tenants who want to take advantage of cheaper accommodation as a landlord. The risk of renting to marginalized tenants uh, would not really uh, would pose a risk for us uh, based on the expected property damage. Uh, another point of contention is the um, insurance waivers that we're forced to sign as private landlords. 
as if the city's existing policies don't make it hard enough for us to run our buildings, the insurance companies force us to sign waivers of insurance uh, based on the conditions that uh, if an owner um, uh, has damage caused by a tenant who's under the influence of drugs, alcohol, or mental health, uh, that our insurance is waived. They don't cover us. Uh, would this be something that the city would consider providing us uh, insurance as incentive to house higher, higher risk tenants? I don't know. Um, thirdly, from the angle of fairness, Atira and some other nonprofits um, receive taxpayer funded top ups, which average a minimum of approximately 750 to 850 per unit over the ministry's uh, 375 housing allowance. The average cost of the taxpayer is between 11.25 and 12.25 per tenant. City staff have argued that the average privately run SRO uh, rents uh, at 561 are too high. I believe this is glaringly hypocritical. To put this into perspective, if a business with higher rents attempted to price fix a competitor's rents, they were already lower than theirs. I mean, do, what do you think a judge would would not be able to see the bad faith in that? Um, our, my fourth point is systemic devaluation of the SRO um, class through the bylaw. The existing bylaw is already overreaching. Uh, it was adopted with very little consultation to the current owners. Since then, we've seen increases to the permit permitting demolition that has gone from 15, 115 to 230,000. Uh, further devalues our investments. We've never once received a notice of increase for these amounts. Um, a city of Vancouver rent control bylaw would render our properties unsellable. The only reason the Alma Hotel hasn't sold is actually because of this. Has the city not considered the legal liability this would cause the city and the taxpayers? Would it be fair to subject taxpayers to potentially legacy and, and costly legal disputes? In closing, it may seem counterintuitive, but the reality is the proposed rent control bylaw will further degrade these buildings and will further marginalize the tenant base that we're expected to house. I ask City Council to consider voting down this egregious rental bylaw and perhaps focus on other um, solutions uh, like additional tenant supplements uh, and maybe raising the 375 ministry allotted rent. Great. Um, thank you very much. Uh, you do have questions, if you don't mind, I'm staying on the line to answer those. Of First, course. Yeah. First from Councillor Hardwick. Go ahead, up to three minutes. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, I want to ask you a question I asked one of the earlier speakers, and that was, why stay in this business? The margins seem slim at the best of times, and then I, I think you said that this rent control would, would uh, make these properties unsellable. Why? I mean, I, it doesn't seem like a very good business opportunity to me. Well, I'm not a speculator, first and foremost. Um, when I originally purchased my building, I couldn't afford an apartment building within the boundaries of Vancouver. So I went for the second best asset class, which was uh, an SRO. Um, so that's the reason I purchased an SRO. And back then, the I think the demolition cost was like a $15,000 um, permit cost. But since then, it's gone up and up and up. So you mentioned that one of these other buildings uh, has not sold. Are you saying that, and I, I, I pulled up your letter, it says that it would render properties unsellable. Is well, of course, rent control in markets have resulted in that effect on, uh, on, uh, on buildings. The economic science is very clear on that. Rent controls uh, achieve the opposite. Do you acknowledge that there are, are are some bad actors? Um, you know, one one of the things that we hear re, re, uh, repeated is that we need to protect people. When I think we're protecting people, they are protecting them from predators or you know bad pe bad actors. I say, how do you address that um, as someone that's working in this industry? Well, I think uh, Councillor Gijanova brings up some. I mean, she's brought it up uh, the entire time today about. Uh, strengthening the existing bylaw to make sure these buildings are in good working order. I think that's very important. I would support that. Uh, my last uh, inspection resulted in two deficiencies. I fixed them right away. I have a very good re reputation with the police, fire department, ministry, and many of the um, uh, social workers that work in the downtown east side, especially with the uh, Salvation Army Harbor Light and Christina Petrina and, and many others. 
Since there are obviously bad actors, is there any way to be policing within the SRO ownership community to try and, and uh, deal with, with the bad guys? Well, it's not like we have like a, like, I don't know, like a WhatsApp group that we chit chat and that what other people are doing, right? Um, I think that the existing bylaw needs to do what it's, it was designed to do. And the notion of rent controls, you know, creating uh, or protecting the existing housing stock is preposterous. It's going to achieve the opposite. Um, and I, I, I think that, you know, if we're not able to spend the amount of money we want to spend on our buildings, if we don't have that economic freedom to spend that money to, to conduct repairs and all that other stuff, uh, then we're going to be subject to the SRO bylaw, which heavily emphasizes repairs and maintenance. So really, this bylaw is contradictory to the existing SRO bylaw. It makes no sense whatsoever. I think that's my time. Yes, Thank you. you indeed. Thank you. Um, Councillor Di Dijanova, the, you have questions? Up to three minutes. Go ahead. Yes. And thank you. I think you'd already raised it. I'm sure I sound like a broken record, but especially the insight from, from someone who is in this business. Um, it's helpful to me to understand if you feel that these new regulations will further impact your ability to provide um, cleaner, safer, more dignified, you know, housing opportunities. Or do you, you know, I, I know it's hard for you to say, yes, I really want you to throw the book at me and all of the other owners, not to say you're exactly like them, but do you think that this is just gonna add another layer of red tape that costs more and makes it more difficult for you to come into compliance with the um, the maintenance bylaws? I think the, the red tape would be stifling. I think it's gonna be an immense amount of weight to carry on your shoulders uh, over and above the existing job that we do already. I don't think it's a reasonable thing to expect of a, a private owner uh, who's, you know, invested millions of dollars in their properties. I don't think it's fair for, you know, the good landlords like me. I would, I would like to consider myself one of the, the good ones, who, you know, spends most of their 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 profit margins uh, on improving the building. And there's always something to be done to make it better. And I think that, you know, if a bylaw is to be uh, implemented, you know. It should complement the existing SRO bylaw. In this situation, it doesn't complement it whatsoever. Thanks so much. Uh, does it concern you? Oh, sorry, I just I was getting to my IT help floor and I forgot my camera was not. Does it concern you at all that um, in this report or speaking to this today, I haven't heard, for instance, nonprofits like Hatira and others who are included in this. Um, speaking in support of this. Like, I don't see a lot of them coming together as I do with some of the other policies. Does it concern you that we're not hearing support um, from the ownership community, including the nonprofits on this? Well, you know, I'll, I'll be honest with you. A lot of the owners that I've spoken to have kind of said, what's the point? You know, I mean, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna be drowned out by a sea of, of opposition of people supporting this bylaw, right? Um, nobody really understands. I have, I have 30 seconds left and I hate to cut you off, but I have a really important question for you. Do you think that this, do you feel, and this is just your opinion, is this being done in good faith or do you feel this is just a way to, as other counselors have asked, push you out I'm of not, the owner? I'm not, I'm not, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. I think the entire process uh, was completely and utterly biased. I don't think that we were listened to. We were offered no no concessions whatsoever. Uh, I think there's a lot of things that need to be addressed, and they weren't addressed in the PowerPoint presentations. And the numbers are completely flawed. Um, I know for a fact that those numbers are not right. And I echo the sentiments of Anne Hart, and I echo the sentiments of Chris Wall. I believe that the only solution to this is augmenting, um, uh, you know, the supplements that, uh, and that, that is, help. And that, that is, that's, that's, that is my time. time. Yeah. I just want to say yeah. thank you. And if you could please send us an email with some of your main points, I'd really that's, appreciate it. That's so time. sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Councilor
but yeah, that's and um, just just council, I'm going to just caution um, all of you. I'm I'm not quite sure what Councillor Dijanova, um, who she was referring to when she said it was this being done in good faith. But um, let's just be cautious about our language. We are assuming always our staff are acting in good faith in the best interests of this city. Um, so um, just just to make sure that we're point all of, clear about point that. of procedure. Point of procedure. Yeah, go ahead. I mean, I could pull the point of order, but I believe that's putting words in my mouth. I had just referenced comments I'd heard earlier. That's what I had referenced. So please do not attribute those comments to me. I okay, specifically said comments. That's a good, that's a good correction. Thank you. That's a good correction, Councillor Di Genova. Okay, and that is it for the speakers to um, to or the questions to that speaker, Peter Thanos. So I'm moving on to the next speaker who was not here in the first round. Speaker 39, Elena Hardy. I'm just checking. Speaker 39, I'm hearing had withdrawn. Withdrawn, okay. Uh, we are on to uh, speaker 40, again, one that hasn't wasn't here, 42, Alexandra Flynn. And I'm hearing that speaker 42 is not on the line. Okay. Uh, speaker 44, Linda Lai. Yep. Hi. Great. Right. Yep. Just state Hello. your name and go ahead. We can hear you clearly. Hi, my name is... Okay, hi, my name is Linda. Um, today I'm here to speak for myself and on behalf of the owner, which is my mom. Um, we've owned and operated um, an SRO since 2006. So today I wanna voice our op opposition to propose the rent vacancy control policy. We're not speculative investors. We haven't offered tenants any money to leave, nor have we evicted a tenant to raise rents. Um, we haven't forced any tenants to move or displace tenants. In fact, we're there to help them. And um, just to also mention, um, I, I feel like we're, we're being trialed and punished and we're a good operator. We provide safe housing. Um, I feel that, um, you know, like we're faced with a lot of challenges, right? Our hotel was constructed in 1912, which brings our building to 109 years old. You know, I have to work in there. My dad is working in there, renovating the rooms, keeping the tenants happy. Um, you know, as you know, the older the building is, the more and more that it needs, you know, and we don't, we're not funded. We don't receive any grants. We don't get any incentive. And having this vacancy control will just take everything, all of our hard work away. Um, a lot of our tenants um, like living in our building. Um, and uh, they say they like private owners versus like public for the sake of like, you know, a, a little bit of freedom and um, also like the cleanliness. We take pride in our buildings. When a tenant leaves, you know, we're fixing them, them up. There's, you know, um, all the time there's something. And once in a while we have um, tenants that uh, damage our rooms, what do we do? Where do we go? Where do we get the money for it? Well, we have to take it out of, you know, the building, right? Like, um, and if we don't have that, you know, I'm afraid that we're gonna be like, you know, um, like what happened to, um, is it Ear Earhart? I, I, I don't know the owners, <laughs> but um, I'm afraid that we're gonna be running into a deficit, right? But we, we're, we're not a non-profit building. We, we need to have profit so we can operate and provide the safe housing. Um, and the problem is, the shelter is 375. It's been 375 for the last 15 years. We've owned this building for 15 years. Um, and, you know, I agree with what Chris says, you know, he needs 600. I feel 
we're all at the same at the same rate um you know and otherwise we we won't be able to run a building you know cost has gone up so much like replacing a window you know we'll have a tenant that breaks a window i've had a tenant break a window during covid he he received twenty thousand dollars he threw you know things out he was asking for help because he ran into so much money and um you know i i I tried to help that tenant. He's still our tenant. Um, I called Carnegie, I called UGM, I called Strathcona Mental Health, I called like Car 87, I called everybody, nobody came. I called the police, the police would come and the police would tell me, he's like, well, he hasn't caused any harm to himself or anybody. I'm like, he threw a mirror onto the street. Someone could have walked by, what do you mean? How, how can you not do that? And when I talk to the police, they, they say, I'm so sorry. Like we, it's out of, you know, we don't do this anymore. Like maybe before, but not anymore. And then finally he lit the mattress on fire. I called the fire department and you know, the, the police would come and I would beg and plead in the middle of the night, every single night. And uh, they would, they would take him to the hospital, but then they, he can't get through. Like they would just send him back to the woodbine and you know we didn't evict him because i know him he's normally not like that but he got so much money that you know he um wasn't himself but i'm also not getting that support you know and these are damages that we have to take out of you know profits right so how are we, how are we supposed to do that and by regulating us and adding vacancy control I'm just going to give you another thing that happened to me recently. Oh, with the empty I, I wish we could hear it, but but you are out of time. You've run over time. I'm so, I'm so sorry, but I very okay. much appreciate it. Oh, and you do have questions, though, if you want to just stay on the line. And first, from Councillor Hardwick. Go ahead, Councillor Hardwick. Thank you. I have the same question that I've posed to uh, a, a couple of other uh, private SRO owners, operators. Why stay in the business well, I was 20 at the time when my family purchased this building. I didn't know what an SRO was, you know, and it wasn't, um, it wasn't to me, I wasn't really afraid. I was super happy. I went to like all the courses and stuff like that too. And, you know, I'm okay with working in the downtown east side. I'm, I'm okay with providing housing, you know, for, um, you know, a you know, and and helping. I I love getting to know our tenants. Um, you know, I that's where we came from. I, at one point, I was living in a kitchen myself, right? But there's a cost to running these buildings, and 375 doesn't cut it. And putting vacancy control is just adding more red tape, more work for us. Like there's you know over 40 rooms. How can I do it by myself? Like my dad's already fixing, I'm doing paperwork, you know, and then there's trouble tenants. Like how, how can I run the building? You know, I'm so stressed out. Well, it was- I, I don't know. Um, it's been expressed through many speakers um, saying that we need to protect people. Um, and so uh, it's just, you don't sound so, like someone that needs to be protected from, but um, how, how would you respond to that characterization? And I've, again, I've, I find there's a real d difference in viewpoints here from people that feel that they need to be protected from predators and others that feel that they're just trying to run a business. So help me with that. Um, well, if you put the vacancy control, like you, you want to keep the units, right? Um, and have it like, you know, run decent for the tenants. And that's what we're trying to provide. But if we're so regulated and overworked, we don't have the time or the money, the capital to do that. Like right now we're due for a roof repair. That's like, you know, at least $60,000. Where are we gonna, you know, fund, fund that? We have to borrow to, to fix that roof. We, we essentially have to borrow money to, to do that. 
Um, yeah, uh, it's, it's a tough one. I appreciate very much uh, your input. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. And you do have more questions. Councillor DiGenova, go ahead. Thanks. I, I uh, know you had mentioned that you had another part of your presentation, just a short account or story you wanted to share. And I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'd, I'd like to hear it if yes. you'd like to share it. <laughs> Yeah, the empty home Could you tax. Please share it? Oh, Thank oh, you. Yeah, the, the empty home tax is going to go with the room, I understand. But like um, I had a tenant, Mr. Doug Hall, he was in the room. He's been in there for 20 years. Um, he fell really ill. It took me six months to get help for him. He couldn't walk. He couldn't buy groceries. He was eating, um, you know, probably at points I was telling his nurse like food that was like you know um, probably moldy and I was like this is not the condition that he should be living in he needs assistant living please help 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 took me over six months to even get help you know why he would poo in his pants and in, inside the room and then we would you know we would have to come in there and clean this up because it was just really bad I couldn't get help. I'm not going to kick him out. This, this was his home, but he needed, you know, um, assistance. And I would, I, I, I couldn't give that to him. I would call the, you know, I would have to call the ambulance. He would go in the hospital, and then he would return. To the point that he didn't return. At one point, um, John Norton from Carnegie told me, Linda, he's in the hospital. Can you please hold on to his room? Don't worry about the rent. So yeah, we, we held on to his room for three months. Carnegie gave us uh, rent for one month and then the last two months was written off. And then, then I'm like, what am I gonna do? And am I gonna dispose of stuff? What should I do? And, and, and in the end we did, but it took us six months. So in, like in this case, then I would be hit with an empty homeless tax trying to hold the room with maybe him coming back or not coming back. And on top of that, because he was in such poor health condition, he couldn't clean up his room. His room was a mess. It was like his floor was all done. It, he was in a hoarding situation. It cost a lot to remove his stuff and and all the M. The M and my time, my time is almost up, but I did want to say you raise a good point about whether or not people's rooms would be held. Um, so I will ask that of staff and thank you very much for answering my question. Great. Um, Thank you. you uh, but you still do have more questions, if you don't mind staying on the line. Councillor Fry, over to you. Yeah, sorry, you, you mentioned the empty homes tax, and my understanding of the empty homes tax is that it actually does have exemptions for health and people having to go into extended care and those kind of things to obviously allow for that. Um, is this a case of maybe there could be more resources to help educate uh, private landlords about some of the options available to them, like sort of government supports and investments of that kind? Well, you know, I, I, I just helped um, a family member do an empty homes tax. Um, and it was just a house. It was only a house, but there was so much red tape. They asked me for the lease. I sent them the lease. Then they're, they're like, no, this is not good enough. You can just make up a lease. So can you show me the deposit? I showed them the bank slip deposit that was deposited into my uncle's account. They're like, no, 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 we, we, we need more. We need more, um, more than that. I, Cause yeah, and then he was like, can you show me a statement? I showed him the statement. And then they're like, you know what? How about um, the tax return? On the tax return, there's a rent summary. We, we would like to see that. I was like, I, I feel, I'm starting to feel a little uncomfortable if this is how empty tax operates because I felt like, he, he told me, he said, well, you know, you can pay for the fine 1.4% and then go appeal it. And I was like, what? That's not right. He's like, okay, well, how about this? Why don't you tell your tenant to show us their tax return that shows the address of the property? And I was like, oh my gosh, you, you know what you're asking me to go back to a tenant in 2020. Now it's end of 2021. It's not the same tenant. So going back and forth. Sure, sure. Up, Could well, I was going to say, just get back to Let's the subject of the, the SRAs um, and empty yeah. homes tax. If there was, you know, through a rent roll audit, some kind of mechanism that, that staff were clearly understanding that this was vacant because of the reason you outlined, 
and that would provide you with some insulation in the event of an empty homes tax alloc allocation? Would that give you some comfort? I, no, I don't have faith in, I don't have faith um, in the system, especially what I just went through. It's just more, more bullying, more, more, um, more paperwork for like this building here is just basically two people operating, you know, like me and my dad. I can't afford to hire anyone to help me with this. Otherwise, I'd be like, you know, um, the dog sitting hotel. You know, I if I keep on if I have to hire more people, then we're going to be, you know, going into the negative. Okay, thanks for the input. That's great. Um, yeah, that was very close to your time, but thank you, Councillor Fry, and um, thank you, Linda Lai. Those are your questions. Yeah. Very much appreciate you taking the time to uh, actually answer those questions and to speak to Council. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, we're now moving on to uh, speaker um, number 49 on the list, Roger Blenman. Is Roger Blenman on the line? Yes, I am. Great. Okay, thank, just thank state, you. state your name and, uh, and speak to council. Thank you very much. My first time speaking to council, and I'm, I'm very glad for the privilege. Uh, my name is Roger Blenman. I'm a longtime resident of Vancouver and currently a, a homeowner in Vancouver, well, with a mortgage. Um, I've been in the city since 1994. Um, uh, upon my arrival in the city, um, it pr provided me, uh, my arrival in the city provides some of the background from which I'm speaking, having been in the city for close to 30 years. I've been constantly shocked and saddened. Um, by our inability, and I take responsibility for this as well as a Vancouverite, to provide adequate housing for all our residents. Um, we need diverse um, housing options. Uh, we need diversity in our city. Uh, it makes a better city for everyone. Um, I've had my own rental experiences, some positive and some uh, not so positive. I would like to um, remark that anecdotes of poor landlords and good landlords do not make uh, necessarily a, a strong basis for policy. I think we ought to show compassion um, for renters, um, empathy uh, for each other. Um, I think co-op housing is, is an excellent option, but it's not available for everyone. I think I have responsibility for my neighborhood and I have responsibility to my neighbors. Um, I think that we also have a collective responsibility to protect some of the most vulnerable. And in particular, this uh, proposal speaks to those who are on the lower end of the rental market. I recognize that I speak from a position of privilege um, since I am housed, um, but that does not absolve any of us from the responsibility for those who are inadequately housed. Um, I have a social safety net, and but there are many who do not have access to the same privileges. Some of the things that strike me as being very positive about this proposal is that there is a clear enforcement procedure. There are a set of steps that can be followed by a renter who feels that the, they have been treated not in accordance with the policy, uh, and there's also an enforcement procedure outlined in the policy. It's been effectively budgeted. Um, uh, as earlier speaker talked about insurance for high-risk clients and ministry allocated funding, which of course are beyond the scope of this uh, policy and, um, and and beyond the scope perhaps of yeah. this organization. Yeah, and yeah, sorry, I'm I'm just going to have to interrupt you there. I'm sorry, I have I was dealing with the clerk on another issue, and you're well over time um, uh, uh, in terms of answering. I had five minutes. The, Is that not the case? Um, oh, it's uh, five. You're at five. Sorry. Just one second. I'll just check. I, I am sorry. The timer is not correct, but um, I, I only have you at one ten. You have still. Actually, yes. clerk, could you just tell me how many three minutes left? Go ahead. I'm so sorry. Thank you. I, I did prepare my remarks carefully. Thank you very much. Um, I, as, as I was saying, I, I do feel that the enforcement has a, the, the proposed policy has a clear enforcement procedure. It is well costed, and it is part of a comprehensive plan that includes, of course, replacement of units, updating of the housing structure. Um, therefore, I'm urging um, the adoption of this policy. I find it. It also, I'm pleased to see that it has a review process. That within 
um, a, a number of years, up to four years, the effect of the policy on the housing market and on the low-end rentals will be evaluated. And so for, it gives us many reasons to try this, even as an experiment that might actually help increase the diversity and the availability of housing in our city. It involves a balance of rights. Clearly, tenants have rights. Clearly, landlords have rights. And although we've heard from landlords and tenants, there are mixed and good bad. There's a mix of good and bad actors in both groups, and it's obviously a challenge to meet everyone's needs. Um, anecdote, however, does not make for good policy. I think the city should also consider, and, and I, I'm sure is considering, the effect of zoning um, on 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 our housing situation. Um, so I guess in, in summary then, I am encouraging the adaptation of this policy. I've looked at it as much as, um, as I've uh, been able and see that it seems to be a responsible response to an ongoing problem. Uh, we know that, that, that SRAs are the next step away from homeless, homelessness for many of our citizens. And as, as a result, we need to try this to see if it actually uh, uh, allow more people to remain with adequate shelter. Thank you very much for your time. Oh, and thank you very much, and apologies for that interruption. Um, uh, you were very clear, and uh, there aren't any questions for you, but again, very much appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to us. Thank you. Great. So, Council, um, there were, there, I was just conferring with the clerk, uh, um, uh, uh, several people on the line um, that we, that we somehow missed over. So I'm going to um, uh, go through uh, calling for speakers 46, and then 51, and then 27. So speaker 46, Chloe Noir. I'm just checking, and no, number 46 uh, is not on the line, Chair Carr. No longer, okay. Chair. Yes, um, pardon me. Just as we're approaching 5 p.m., I just wanted to, on a point of privilege, note that I wouldn't be able to stay if we were going to extend through um, the dinner break, but I wasn't sure if there were how many speakers there were and if we should extend. I mean, I'm happy to, to listen while well, I'm picking my child up from childcare, but I just wanted to state I, I won't be able to stay. Well, there's, past there's five. right now, there's no motion to Thanks. extend beyond five, okay. but thank you for that information, Councillor DiGenova. Thanks. Happy to, to accommodate however I can, and right. I'll listen if I need to come back for decision. Great. After Thank you. So, Council, right now it is um, uh, 4.45. We have two speakers on the line. Um, so, uh, we, um, I think I'll proceed with those. Speaker 51, Russell Maynard. Hi there. I'm here. Great. Go ahead. Yep. Just state your name and go ahead. I I Hi, Council. It's Russ Maynard. I work with PHS Community Services Society, and we uh, have submitted a letter of support, and I just wanted to um, verbally support uh, this bylaw amendment. And it is a really tough decision, I, uh, I feel for you all. It's a, it, we have a lot of respect for private property in our culture, uh, and I would just add that uh, we are at this cliff because of the intensity of the homelessness situation, uh, both in Canada and in Vancouver. And these are the housing units, as has been mentioned many times so far tonight, that are the last housing uh, before homelessness. And these, the folks that end up not being able to afford any kind of rent increases, and we've heard the people who own the buildings saying that they can't run the buildings at the current housing uh, allowances um, that are provided by government. It would be great to see those allowances go up and to have this problem have more uh, degrees of freedom, but that's not happening anytime soon. I think that the report that uh, the city created is very well balanced and, and very detailed. Uh, and the fact of the matter remains tonight when the vote happens, the vote but it basically boils down to do we ensure housing for people who can't afford it in a system that hasn't uh, caught up with that need yet? And it seems to me that that is the uh, focus of this amendment is to try and buy both the city of Vancouver uh, and Canadians time to catch up 
to this need. And we have a at the uh, civic level, at the provincial level, and at the federal level, which almost never happens, it seems a willingness to address housing and that this is a really important, crucial amendment. And you've heard some of, I don't even need to describe it myself, you've heard it from some of the property owners, uh, the state of affairs when someone starts to fall through the cracks is not just unfortunate, it's literally Dickensian. It's a Dickensian style of life and we can't accept that in, in our city or in our country. And I think that uh, ultimately, there's very little choice here and we need to secure this housing stock at all costs and we need to remunerate the private owners uh, should it come to that and certainly anybody who has owned a building for more than a year or two is going to uh, be able to capture uh, that value of holding a building. We heard one person say they've had that building for 15 years, one need only imagine uh, what that property uh, has um, uh, grown in, in value. And so those are the kinds of things that will come back to uh, placate and reward people for their patience and what they've been doing for the last five, 10, 15 years. But I really do believe that uh, there's little choice here and we need to secure this housing stock and the amendment is very well balanced and thought out. And thank you for your time. Great, and thank you for your time. And no, no questions to you, but again, I very much appreciate you coming to speak to us. All right, take care. Thank you, you too. And that takes us um, to the other person remaining on the line, which is um, speaker 27. That's yeah. Hello? Hand, yes. Uh, yeah, hello, I'm here. Can you hear me this time? Yes, yep, yeah, we can. Oh, it's good. Oh, great. But, uh, yeah, this is the second time trying to get on. Uh, anyway, my name is Jill Sarin. I'm president of the Carnegie Community Center Association, which before COVID has many, had as many as uh, 4,000 4, to 5,000 members of downtown Eastside residents. So, I'm, you know, this year we have fewer members, but we still have close to a thousand members. And I'm also a member of Carnegie Community Action Project, which works to uh, help secure housing people to raise the welfare rates and, and to keep rents down. Uh, I personally live in an SRO, 1190 East Hastings. I'm 76 years old and my SRO is actually on the main floor below the SRO. And so I, and I, I'm a retired carpenter, have fixed, done a lot of my own repair work and the landlady could probably get twice the rent that I'm paying. So every, and she always tries to raise my rent in illegal amount. And when I fight it and win, her and her husband come and they scream at me and yell at me to move out and threaten to evict me. But I know my rights. And so they haven't been able to bully me. And I'm a big guy and they don't intimidate me. But I, and I'm also quite well educated, which is not necessarily the case for a lot of tenants. I can look after myself but a lot of tenants have a really hard time with this kind of intimidation. Um, and I hear that this is not an unusual situation. Um, so, yeah, screams like me, I've been screamed at numerous times uh, because you can get double the rent. So, you know, vacancy control, because of, I'm, I'm seven, like I said, I'm 76 years old and vacancy control would, would give me some security of, of, of tenancy and I've, I've lived there for 20 years. Like I said, because my rent was low, have done a lot of my own improvements. Landlady doesn't improve anything or landlord unless they absolutely have to. I've complained numerous times to the city for a rat infestation problems. I've fixed 10 holes in my wall. I've killed at least 50 rats in the last 20 years. Um, the only finally got a pest control company after the city threatened to... Uh, hire a company themselves and send her the bill. Um, she's also used uh, bullies to just go into people's room, grab their furniture, throw it out, and evict them completely illegally um, using bully tactics and, and, and thugs. Um, I don't know if this happens in other buildings, but I know it has happened in my building. So... Um, yeah, bad situation, no security for tenants. 
And so council shouldn't be sympathetic to landlords. I mean, who's, you know, who's walked to the yacht, the yacht is financed by the city's most uh, vulnerable people. Rent your income is unearned income that comes from little or no effort on the part of landlords. It's like, wouldn't we all love to do nothing and make millions of dollars? It's free, it's free money that comes from little or no effort. So uh, we shouldn't be sympathetic to uh, their, 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 their cries about uh, capital costs, et cetera. If there are capital costs that come, such as needing to do major roof repairs, they can apply to the RTA uh, to raise rents for capital improvements. So that's always an option. So those complaints are completely illegitimate. And, you know, I heard somebody saying, complaining that, uh, you know, SROs are a second best asset class. Well, cry me a river. If, uh, if it's such a bad asset class, why don't they just sell, sell to the city and, and let, let a, a nonprofit take over the building, which would definitely benefit the tenants. Um, I've also seen people go from homeless to housing. I had a fellow I used to see on the street all the time, and then one day I looked at him and I barely recognized him. He had a haircut, he was clean, he looked healthy. And I looked and I said, what happened to you? And he said, I got housing. And it turned him into a different person. So SROs are like the last uh, resort before homelessness and, and tenancy control will give a lot of people security of housing and, and uh, yeah, more, more, more secure housing for those people, uh, which also doesn't leave the province and the city off the hook in terms of, you know, building more housing, more affordable housing. And I think I pretty well covered what I want to say. Thank you. That was perfectly timed. You only have five seconds left, so that was great. Um, and there are no um, no questions for you. Uh, you were very clear in your statement, so very much appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, Council, that does complete the speaker's list to this item. Uh, we are at um, five minutes to five. My suggestion is that we um, start our dinner break. Um, we have a, an hour for dinner, uh, so we, we will return at six, at which point, um, um, you know, we have a, a, a bit of a choice at that point, and Council, you may want to, um, to consider um, these that um, uh, you, you have sent questions into staff. Um, you did receive an email back with the answers to those questions. Um, we can move uh, into uh, uh, the um, uh, motion, or the um, the um, motion being moved, and then debate and decision. That is would be the normal protocol at this point. Um, earlier in this meeting, however, I did hear one councillor, Councillor Di Genova, um, ask about the um, ability to to be able to have ask for a second round of questions. If that is the desire of council, when we return, um, someone would have to move to suspend the um, uh, procedure bylaw. Um, it is not debatable. Uh, it would take a two-thirds majority of council voting in support of that. Um, and if that was uh, passed, then somebody could move for another round of questions to staff, which would enable you asking those questions and having the responses from staff um, verbally and on public record. So I leave that in your hands Chair, to think may, about. May I ask if we received an email? Of something? Um, um, yes. I, well, I was hoping to move a motion actually that we return at six fifteen, which would give us each fifteen minutes to review the answers that staff have sent back. It may actually help us to be more efficient, and maybe we won't need to ask questions. Yeah. That's what I was hoping to move. Well, if everybody wants to agree to that, I'm sure nobody would mind a little bit longer dinner break and the opportunity to actually read the answers. So, um, I'd like to dedicate some time to reading them. So, thank yeah. you. Yeah, um, Clerk, do I need? I mean, can I just make that decision to return at six fifteen, or do we need a motion to come back? I can just make the decision. Great. I made the decision then. Uh, we'll return Thank at you. 6 15 and uh, read the um, uh, read those answers because they are very enlightening and a lot of work has gone into them. Thank you, Council. See you at 6 15.
Hi, Elise. Hi, Carlos. It's Rowena from the council chamber. Are you able to hear me? Hi, Rowena. Yep, Carlos. Perfect. Yeah, Thank thanks. you so much. That's great. Thank you for your help. Sorry. <laughs>
Okay, welcome back, Council. Um, uh, so we um, uh, are now at the point where um, it's uh, possible to move the recommendations and enter into debate and discussion. Um, I see Councillor Kirby Young on the queue. Councillor Kirby Young. I'm on to move an amendment, but I actually wanted to potentially let Councillor Swanson, I thought she might like to move the recommendations. That's sweet of you. Okay, I'm gonna put you behind Councillor Swanson. Councillor Swanson, go first, and then um, Councillor Kirby Young. Co uh, go ahead, Councillor Swanson. Yeah, thank you, uh, Councillor Kirby Young. I would like to move it. <laughs> so I move the recommendations. That's great. Then they are now on the floor. I'm moving us. Oh, we are in the main queue, which is great. Um, uh, that's it. You're going to hold uh, hold your comments to the end, Councillor Swanson, or are you? Yeah, I'll hold them All to right. the end. Okay, thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to move an amendment which was circulated earlier to Council, and the clerk should have. I'm going to move us to an amendment queue. Sure. And I'll get you on that. Great. Go ahead. Um, and the spirit of this amendment really speaks to what we heard uh, today from a number of, it was referenced in the report. We, um, I think some of us have heard from a number of stakeholders in the Chinese community, and we heard through some of the comments today um, with respect to the uniqueness of the Chinese Benevolent Association buildings, which carry specific historical and cultural importance in the city, um, and in fact, often provided the only refuge due to racialized policies in the city. Um, and they are unique buildings. They're, they are buildings that have been long held with an intent that they continue to be held. Um, in many cases, the plant associations have managed to keep rents really low with and the implementation of this policy in an effort to have it be consistent across the SRO stock, but recognize the fact that we don't want to put the CBAs at a disadvantage when it comes to the need to upgrade their buildings. Essentially, the spirit of the amendment is that upon vacancy, it will enable them to revise the rates to the designated shelter um, base rent that is currently mandated um, provincially to 375 so that they would have um, sort of that level playing field, if you will, with the um, across the sector. And so that's that's essentially, in a nutshell, the spirit of the amendment. It's um, been discussed. And as you heard me earlier, ask a question of um, one of our speakers, for example, with return who's been very active and sort of advocating on and working on this effort, whether um, they would be supportive of it. And we heard a yes. So I do think that it's a, a fair compromise versus the other option that was discussed, which was potentially exempting them from the bylaw altogether. So that's sort of the um, the outcome that's been arrived at. And that's the spirit of the amendment, which I see is now on screen. Great. Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Um, Councillor DiGenova to the amendment. Thanks. I just have I have a point of information for Councillor Kirby Young. Excuse me. Um, amendment. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. I can ask her. That's go ahead. Okay. I can ask through the chair. So I'm just I'm wondering, Councillor Kirby Young, uh, you had just stated that it was to current shelter rent uh, shelter rates, uh, three seventy five a month. But if those shelter rates were to increase, then this would increase too. There's. The, I just want to make sure that's the intention. So it would be the shelter rate, not just current shelter rates it would be whatever the province determined shelter rates in the future to be as well yeah very good question and that is absolutely the intention the original um, language amendment had actually specified just shelter rate as opposed to the dollar amount this was included for specificity on the advice of staff um, but staff also conveyed that their full intent would be in the event of any change to these standards that they would bring forth an accompanying change to the city bylaw okay so i i um what i will say is i I will support this amendment. Um, I'm still feeling very uneasy about the overall report um, and the recommendations as to how they're going to make a difference in providing dignified housing, clean housing, and also what we already have on our plate with a significant and, and robust uh, set of maintenance bylaws that I understand that what we enforce sometimes and through legal orders that we're not enforcing as often as we could be. Um, so for, for that reason, um, I will support this amendment, but I, I'm not sure how I will vote on the overall recommendation. Great, thank you, Councillor DiGenova. Look, I'm not seeing anyone else on the list, so perhaps we can, um, you can move us to a vote on the amendment. This is, everybody should know, this is Councillor Kirby Young's amendment.
Chair, if I can get a vote assist in favor, please. I'm just having an issue with my panel. No problem. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Kirby Young, do you need a vote assist as well? I, I do. My mouse appears to have stopped working. So yes, in favor, please. Okay. Right, that is unanimous. Um, move, I'm just gonna move us back to the main queue. Uh, Councillor Kirby Young, do you have anything else to add um, to uh, do your comments? No, uh, no, I'll hold at this time. Thanks, Chair. Right. No problem. Councillor Boyle, uh, to the amended motion. Um, actually, I'm gonna pause for a moment. I have a lot of background noise. I'll come back on. <laughs> no problem. Councillor Dominato, to the amended motion. Uh, thanks, Chair. I have a point of information, if I may. Yes, go ahead. Um, it, it's just um, if staff could comment um, on uh, the um, recommendation with respect to uh, the policy review. I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have my notes in front of me, but I believe it's slated for 2025 with a report back in 2026. Um, but I'm just um, curious if staff could comment on um, the monitoring component of that. I think it's great that they've built that into the framework that there will be a policy review um, because a lot can change um, over four years potentially those buildings could come into public hands and so on but um, could they comment on monitoring year to year and how that might come back to council if there are issues that are arising that that's my key question no, uh, okay so selena is it selena's going to answer this or? or if we could just get the uh, mic yeah thank you did you want me to repeat the question? Would that help? No, I think we were just worrying about getting a mic on for staff. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> no problem. Thank Go you, ahead. Council. Allison Dunnett, a senior planner, uh, ACCS. Um, yeah, in the motion and in the policy that's brought forward, you'll see that staff uh, are intending to do monitoring on an annual basis. And one of the directions we've asked council for is to increase the frequency of our low income housing survey. So typically we've done this every two years, we would move to an annual survey. The results of that would come back to council on an annual basis and you would get feedback from staff on how the policy is being implemented. Then there's a more formal review process in year four where staff would uh, look at the trend, what's happening, implications or risks uh, from the policy, and then bring that back to council in year five as a more fulsome report back. Okay, great. great. Thanks for that. You're good. That's council? it for my question. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, this is a to be amended motion, Councillor Bly. Thanks very much, Chair. I actually have an amendment. Okay, if you want to just hold, I'll move you to amendment Q. Oops. Sorry, just have to. Great, go ahead with your amendment, Councillor Bly. Thanks very much. I just um, am pulling it up right here. So the amendment essentially speaks to what we heard through questions to staff, um, what I certainly heard uh, clearly from um, SRO Collective, um, and that is related to um, the rapid, um, the residential, sorry, rehabilitation assistance program and its renewal uh, in terms of a return to the expanded program. So the amendment essentially is asking the mayor um, to write a letter to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities um, to advocate to the federal government for the return and expanded um, RAP program with the desired outcome of stabilizing rents and improving living conditions in single room accommodation. And then further to that, that staff uh, also work with the FCM um, policy team to advocate uh, the same. So I won't repeat the language. Uh, Next week, we are meeting um, as FCM board in Ottawa for the first time in two, well, almost two years, I guess, 18 months. Um, and it's a great opportunity to expedite this piece of the work. Um, we heard from a number of uh, our speakers today how important this program was in um, offering a capital um, uh, investment um, policy program that then is attached to stabilizing the rents and, and rent control. So. We've heard from staff that this report is one piece of the puzzle. Uh, I believe RAP to be another piece of the puzzle uh, and so on. So uh, hoping for support of council with these two amendments. Well, one amendment in two parts. Okay, that's great. Um, I'm, we're in the amendment queue and you've, we've got speakers to that amendment. So you've introduced it. Councillor DiGenova to the amendment, please on the floor. 
Thanks. Um, I really appreciate this amendment and I'm happy to support it. In fact, I, I wish we could wait to hear back on how this amendment goes before voting on the recommendations because I, I think that this could actually help to solve a whole lot of problems and possibly provide more dignified housing. And for me, that's what it's all about. It's about providing more dignified housing for some of the speakers that we heard from, you know, including the speaker who, you know, uh, shared a poem with us about the living conditions that, that they um, experience in SROs and SRAs. So um, I appreciate this. And I think that this is um, looking to our partners uh, at the federal government who are responsible for housing um, and asking them to play their role in this as well. And I'll be supporting this amendment as well. I'm not sure how I'll be voting on the whole report at this moment, but I will support this amendment. And I will also ask um, in the main motion for a severing, Chair, uh, for this amendment and, and the previous amendment. Oh, okay. There are, yes, there, we'll Just make sure that those paragraphs. During my time, I thought I'd mention that. Thank yeah. you. Okay. Um, great. I'll have the clerks think through um, what the severing process would be for those, because some of them affect more than one, one of the clauses. Okay. Um, thank you, Councillor DiGenova. To the amendment um, on the floor, Councillor Weed. Yeah, I'll also be supportive. Um, we heard loud and clear that rent control is not going to be the answer of the issue and that we need to holistically look at it, but we need rent control now for us to start to look at different options. So I think this is critical and one of the elements to support the well being of these buildings as well as to support the tenants. So I will be supporting this amendment. Great. And I do not see any other uh, councillors on the list to speak to this amendment. Um, by Councillor Bly, so uh, Clerk, if you can move us to a vote on this, please. Councillor DiGenova, okay, um, that was unanimous. Great. Um, back to the main queue. Councillor Bly, do you have any other comments to make at this point? Um, no, I'll actually just come off for a second uh, and come back on for final comments. Sure. Councillor Boyle to the amended motion. Yes, thanks so much. Um, I, I will be brief, but just want to really strongly say a, um, a huge thank you to staff for the work they've put into this and uh, in the community, so many of the folks we heard from or or didn't hear from, um, but know have been organizing and advocating on this for uh, for literally decades. It's such critical work. I think this is an incredibly important move for us to be making. Uh, I'm I'm proud to get to be part of voting for it um, and hope that it is a step in the right direction of. Uh, well, I know it's a step in the right direction that we continue to move forward in. Um, uh, protecting these units uh, and in the long term bringing them uh, into better repair um, as self-contained units uh, you know absolutely as we heard so clearly from speakers everyone deserves a home uh, housing is a human right and so this being one piece that we as a city council can do in protecting that housing and keeping um, more people in housing absolutely uh, proud uh, to be able to vote for it and strongly supportive of it and grateful for the community work that got us here. And Great, I will you. leave it at that. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor Boyle. To the amended motion, Councillor DiGenova. I'm not sure how I got back on the queue. Oh, no problem. I'll advance you off. Oh, Councillor. Oh. oh, we're talking about the amended motion, yes. We and are. That's fine. I'll put myself on later. I, I have a point of information for staff on a question. All right. Just looking it up. Thank you. Councillor Weeb to the amended motion. Yeah, I want to thank the speakers. I like that we're getting both sides. Not these conversations that come to us are complex. It's really get to, good to know the full sides of the issues, but also really appreciate all the staff's work. There's a lot of nuances in this report. You can tell there's a lot, a lot of great staff time. Um, I was shocked by some of the numbers. The fact we've gone from, from over 1,500 shelter rate to only 77. Um, and the fact that we have over 700 SROs that are 
empty and vacant right now. We're in the middle of a housing emergency. So it's great to see that we have federal and provincial alignment right now. This is the time for us to create action. We need to get people in housing. Housing is a human right. I agree with Boyle on that. And I think that this is a key element in us moving forward. So exciting to vote for it. Um, really appreciate the speakers that talked about the issues um, and really appreciate staff's work on trying to alleviate as much of that as possible. Thank you, Councillor Weeb. To the amended motion, Councillor Bly. Thanks very much, Chair, and I too will be brief. Um, I think there's a few things. Uh, first of all, you know, I'm grateful and I know the work has been ongoing for, for many, many, many years, but just to have had the chance to talk specifically to this um, issue and in, in this policy direction with um, with SRO Collective and Wendy Peterson at the helm there, but also um, residents, uh, SRO residents who were in that meeting um, was a good conversation to hear about all of the programs that are um, underway and championed. Um, it's much bigger than vacancy control. It's about advocacy. It's about um, partnership and it's about um, agency of um, the tenants. And um, I think at the end of the day, what I've heard is that um, vacancy control is really a stabilizer. It's one tool. Um, it's going to stabilize the units that we currently have in privately owned um, um, SRO uh, type housing. And um, I don't believe it's going to cripple landlords. I don't think it's going to make situations worse. Um, in, in the broader context, um, the, the minimum seems to be done right now. Uh, and there's more, what I've heard is more stories of people feeling squeezed or, or bullied or pushed out. And not everybody is um, an offender in that sense, in terms of landlords, but, but those that are really, we need to sort of get a handle on the situation. So uh, I think it's important that we don't stick with status quo and that we need to protect existing units now, not to make the situation worse at the end of the day. And, and I you know, think that we need to be doing everything we can to progress the conversation around bringing um, privately held um, SRO type housing and SRA um, into, um, public ownership in whichever way that looks um, to uh, keep those units available and on the market. So, um, or available as low market housing. So I think um, those are really my thoughts around it. I got pages of notes from the speakers and from meetings with others, but just really want to um, say thanks to Councillor Swanson for um, maybe why she's in the seat as a city councillor after all of these years, just the advocacy and, and education and, and um, tenacity to get us here. Um, and this is one piece of, I know a much bigger um, um, sort of solution uh, focus and plan that this council has around stabilizing our below market housing. And I'm happy to um, be supporting that tonight. Thank you, Councillor Bly. Councillor DiGenova. Thanks very much. I was just hoping to follow up on a question that I had sent to staff and I really appreciate the answers back. I had reviewed them, but I noticed in the question that I'd sent over um, that specifically asks um, how many city staff in DBL or city staff across the organization aside from fire and police have the training and authority to issue orders and fines for SRAs outlined in bylaw 5462. So how many actually have the authority to issue the funds, not to apply for a court injunction or to bring this to the courts? I just need a number on that. Yeah, uh, go ahead, city manager. Thanks, Chair Carr, through you. So th there may be some aspects to the question that we need to follow up, but, but just to be clear, staff do not issue fines. Um, the fines are imposed by the court. So the prosecution is the process that we have to go through to have the fines imposed. Um, so I'm not sure if that clarification helps. Um, certainly is our property use team generally um, that um, inspects and, and uh, monitors, provides oversight for the standards and maintenance bylaw. Um, we can follow up with the specific number of property use inspectors that we have. Um, if, if we, and it I, I, doesn't look like we did provide that information, so that's an oversight, but we can, we can follow up with council on that point. For example, at one point in time, I know that it was 20 to enforce cannabis prior to it becoming legal, but when we just men mended the zoning bylaw, and you may remember that um, city manager um, that I did ask that question, so I'm looking for similar information, but it does state clearly in the bylaw that the city may issue these fines. 
So is there a reason that the court would issue them instead of this? I, I understand we can escalate with the court, but do we not have the ability as a city right now to issue fines if we inspect and see that this is in disarray, just as we would with any business, if they weren't complying with um, the conditions in terms of their business license? Yeah, my understanding, um, uh, Chair Carr, through you, and I'll be subject to any correction from other staff that are uh, following the meeting here, is the, the bylaw sets out the fines, the maximum fines that the court can impose. Um, they're, not, they're not fines that staff impose. Okay, it says the city of Vancouver, so I will send that over with subsequent questions. And, and I, appreciate, um, I appreciate that, and I appreciate the questions being answered and that we've been trying for education, but we've tried for education for a long time. And I appreciate the fact that there are some, um, you know, I, I did, don't know them. I, some of them I've heard from today, you know, looking at my notes here, uh, fellow Christopher Wall who called and takes pride and, you know, and wants everyone to, to get a room that is an, a good room, as he said, and to have dignified housing. Um, I'm also noting, and I realize I only have five minutes, so I'm just going to note my most important point here, that the nonprofit community, I haven't seen a lot of them except for Anhart sign up, and Anhart's against that. So without knowing where they stand on this, it's, it's good to know that it's $500,000 for us, Council, and two extra staff. How many staff and resources does that take away from them and their teams that are actually running their operations on a shoestring budget? And I know because my background is in housing. It's in non-market housing. It's providing housing at 375 a month for people who not only may need to shelter rate housing and have concurrent and other complex care issues, but also many of them are disabled and couldn't access an SRO if they, if they wanted to because of their disability. And I have to say that I'd be concerned that we don't have a plan B here. So right now, if this moves forward and these owners um, can't comply with this, first of all, we don't even enforce our other bylaws. So why this one? Um, that's a concern that I have. I do appreciate that. I appreciate the sentiment and the way that staff have gone into this and what they're looking to achieve. I really, really do. And I support you in that. But I'm concerned with the unintended consequences that this may have. And for that reason, I will ask for severing and I will support um, Councillor Bly's amendment to uh, advocate uh, through FCM to the federal government. And I'll support Councillor Kirby Young's uh, amendment uh, that looks at, uh, you know, the Chinese Benevolent Associations and exempting them. I'd like to see all nonprofits exempt, actually. Um, but moving forward, I think that it is about dignified housing. It's not about let's look at these owners or this owner these owners or, or what policies we can implement. It's how do we find a road for people to get to dignified housing, to get to the things in our bylaw, pest-free housing, clean housing with running hot water. That should be a human right. And we have to work with our partners to get there and with BC Housing. I appreciate that our staff are always in, in communication with BC Housing, but I also wanna make sure that in working together here because of what they can do, power they have, uh, especially the spending power, that we work together on that. So I realize that I've, I've hit my time here, but I won't be able to support the rest of the recommendations. Really want to thank staff. I will follow up with questions, and I will support those two amendments. So if we could please sever, and if I could also have uh, the entire full final motion um, emailed uh, to council, if possible. Chair Carr, thank you. Yes, I, I anticipated that, and I have asked for that. I think. Um I'll just check with the clerk. Is that possible to um, to get it emailed? Great, we've got enough speakers um, in, in the time now. I'm just going to be um, I'm going to ask for clarification, Councillor Di Genova, um, that you um, want to have the severing of the amendment by Councillor Bly, which is going to be the final letter, um, but also the amendment by uh, Councillor Kirby Young, which occurs in within C and um, do you want the subsections? I, want it, I, want I, I would like it severed out of C technically so that I can vote for it and it's great if it passes um, but I want to make sure that my vote is lent to that so if this full report passes 
that that will pass too. That's my intention. I was hoping that it would be added as an addition so I could support it and then it, it complies if the report, if the recommendations pass. I think Thank what you. we can do is sever C, subsection I, subsection C, which is where I'm seeing the, is that, I'm just going to seek confirmation, but um, just when you get the um, email sent to you, just check to make sure that that's it. So big C subsection C, under subsection I, C, subsection, subsection I. C. I, I'm, you know, anyway, I'm gonna ask the clerk to make sure <laughs> that uh, we do have, we do have that um, set it up. All right. Okay, Councillor Fry, to the oh. um, amended motion. Thanks, Chair. And just before I begin, I'm going to just address one of uh, Councillor DiGenova's comments that we hadn't heard from the nonprofit sector. In fact, we did get a letter from Jill Atkey of the BC Nonprofit Housing Association. It was buried in our digest, so it would have been easy to miss. And I know that Jill's been busy with the convention this week, but uh, they're in full support of, of this recommendation from staff. So just thought I'd highlight that off the top. Um, I'll be supporting this as amended. I want to thank uh, Councillor Bly for her thoughtful amendment. I think We've heard uh, those of us who have spent the time to talk to the SROC about the RAP concept and where RAP could be applied to SROs. And I think that this is a fantastic sort of direction that we could kind of partner with the feds on. So basically the idea that we could incentivize the rehabilitation of these facilities um, through tax structure at a federal level. And I think that's a fantastic opportunity there. I also wanna thank Councillor Sky, or sorry, Councillor Kirby Young for um, the thoughtful amendment that addressed some of the Concerns that we heard from the, the Chinatown Benevolent Associations and recognizing this longstanding and traditional housing vernacular that doesn't really fit within the SRO package. I definitely want to thank the SROC, the, uh, the SRO Collaborative, uh, for the Herculean work that's been done. And of course, Wendy uh, leading the charge there, but fantastic crew that's been working really hard to advance a lot of these motions. And of course, uh, the staff who have done such an amazing job, our City of Vancouver staff working on this and advancing this idea. These are some really bold concepts. I also want to thank the many speakers who came and spoke to this uh, and shared their personal stories. And I, and I want to thank the owners that came and spoke to it um, because I, I think they brought a valuable perspective. And uh, as someone council will know, and uh, I many, many years ago lived at the Silver Avalon when it was owned by the Angelicolo family. And I know that there are kindly private SRO owners out there who really care about their tenants and care about their buildings and want to create an experience for people and are, and are kind. And I, and I believe that that, you know, the folks who were speaking, that some of the owners are of that same kind bent. And I want to acknowledge that um, because there are good people out there. Um, but that being said, there are predatory players out there. Um, when I sat on the downtown east side local area plan with Wendy Peterson, with Kathy Shimizu, with Greg Masuda, with Jean, Councillor Gene Swanson, with the late Tracy Morrison, these were the sort of conversations we were having around those the SRO rooms. And at that time, we were seeing this incursion of folks who were speculating on it and converting SROs because SROs, as we define it right now, really address the housing typology, not the tenure, not the not the cost to stay there. So we were seeing these converting in real time and we're seeing the legacy now. So this is a critical intervention that we really, I, I'm so happy that we're doing this now. It probably should have done it back when we approved the lap in 2014, but here we are now. Uh, I think it's really important, but. I think what's also going to be equally important is that we commit to the clause in here that addresses a, a budgetary consideration. We need to follow up with some money to make this happen because this needs some follow through. And we heard that. And this needs to be operationalized in a smart manner that will connect these private landowners and especially connecting the Chinese Benevolent Associations with the, the funding opportunities. And I really want to highlight that piece around connecting with the Chinese Benevolent Associations because we know, I think, Councilor Kirby Young really nailed it when she said that there was a systemic sort of racist classist construct that has alienated that whole housing vernacular for the last 120 odd years. Um, this is our chance to also fix that and really help because the capacity in a lot of these older benevolent associations, they are older, the, 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 the elders are older, uh, the residents are older, they need help. And this is really something that we can't just sort of go half measure on, we need to have that fulsome follow-up. So 
the budget component of this is going to be a critical aspect, and I expect that there will be more asks moving on, and there will be more asks of senior governments, and we'll have to get out there and hustle to make this happen. But I think this is really um, a bold, bold move, and um, we're very grateful to see it coming forward and be able to support it today. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fry. Councillor Hardwick to the amended motion. Thank you. I'd like to unpack this a bit. Uh, what is our objective? Our stated, stated objective here is to stabilize rents in private SROs because marginalized people um, aren't making more money and they can't afford higher rents. And as it was well established, uh, I think it's been since 2007 uh, or even before that, that uh, we haven't seen any increases. So then the logic is by um, putting vacancy control on private SROs, that that is going to stop the inflation inflation for people paying rent. But on the other hand, it's not going to stop the inflation that the private SRO owners have in terms of taxes and insurance and everything. So on the one hand, we're trying to hold this here and yet everything else is going up here or down here as the case may be. And we heard from um, one of our speakers, uh, let me find it here from, from Anhart, that they had actually continued to go out and get more remortgaging and adding another half a million dollars in mortgage costs and are continuously running as a deficit. Well, I just know if I try and run a business at a deficit, I'm going to go out of business. So that brings me back to, um, you know, maybe what our objective here is knowing that that these pressures will, I mean, either the private SRO uh, owners are going to hunker down. They're going not going to have the money be, to be doing improvements and, and repairs because they're they're getting squeezed. Then, do we have a plan then to buy them out? Is that uh, our intention here? Because it, I mean, in any business, if you can't make your if you're running into deficit, you're going to go out of business. So, if that's really our objective, then we should be upfront about it. And I don't. Um, I don't have the answer to it, but I just find in, you know, contradictions in the logic here. Um, yes, everybody wants to make sure that people are properly housed. No one wants to live in a pit with, with rats and cockroaches and all the nasty business and the, and the chaos and the crime that we've heard described. Mm -hmm. It's clear that there's a spectrum of different operators in, in these places. I'm sure we didn't hear from any of the bad ones today. Um, and it, we know there are bad or SROs. That's not the question at all. But are we really in one fell swoop trying to say that we want to put the private SROs out of the bit out of business? And if that's the case, then we should just say that's our intention and take over, you know, come be upfront about it. I don't know why, you know, anybody would want to be in that business. It, it's, uh, although we heard from people today that have been doing this intergenerationally and, and seem to take pride in, in what they're doing. And it's hard to reconcile when you hear all the horror stories of people getting their doors kicked in. And, you know, I don't, I don't need to trot out all of the other things that we've heard described. But at the end of the day, um, what happens if we, we put uh, rent control, uh, vacancy control on these places. It puts the private SROs out of the business. Is there a gap of time before they can be taken over by government, whether it's at, uh, at whether it's at the the provincial level or at our civic level? Um, we've seen quite a bit of headcount already added in this area over the last five years, and we're looking to do more. So is the city then moving more and more into um, more of a social housing business than ever before through this action? I don't have the answers, but I think we should be asking these questions. Uh, again, I just want to say everybody deserves to live in, in decent housing, and I think we all want to see that happen. I just don't want us biting off our nose to spite our face, so to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. Councillor Dominato to the amended motion. 
Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, yeah, I'll offer some comments and reflections on the report and recommendations. Um, I want to thank, um, to start, um, all of the speakers who called in, um, as well as uh, I had the opportunity to sit down and meet with the SRO Collaborative, and it was really informative. Um, I know they've been at this for many, many years, uh, but some I made some notes from that meeting, and some things stood out in that discussion. One was... Uh, the comment that there's only 77 units in total out of roughly 4,000 uh, that are still offered at a shelter rate of $375. Um, that stood out for me. Um, also that there's roughly 10 SROs that are completely empty in the city. Um, we talked at length um, about uh, the um, increasingly that in some instances, and I don't think we can say this is a broad brush across the board, um, there are tenants in certain buildings that are feeling uh, increasingly pressured um, uh, and it's feeling pressured to leave or to move out. Um, and as the staff noted in the report, which I, I think was uh, both the first report that came to us, but the second was, uh, you know, incredibly lightning in terms of um, really that visual around, um, you know, the spectrum that we're seeing of either disinvestment or just a, a loss of affordability on the other end of the spectrum. And, um, and then we talked uh, about the importance, I think, to the point that Councillor Hardwick um, just referenced in her last comments about the importance of, of home to people um, and habitability and dignity and dignified living. So uh, that was part of the conversation. So reflecting on the recommendations today, um, uh, we know that the um, SRAs are um, largely the most affordable housing in the city and, and, and for some uh, housing of last resort and options. Um, what I found promising in the conversation I had with the SRO Collaborative, but also is reflected in this report, uh, was the tripartite um, SRO strategy um, that's underway. Uh, and so to the point, uh, the added amendment by Councillor Bly, I think is really important to be having and furthering those discussions at the federal level around the opportunities for uh, renewal and replacement. Um, because that is where um, initially my concerns lay with the vacancy control, particularly around this housing stock, was the potential risk um, of um, of there not being continued investment in maintaining those buildings, because as we know, many are in disrepair. I toured many of them, as did I think a number of councillors, and so that's where my concern has, has lay with that. Um, that being said, uh, we're seeing obviously in at least more than a third of the stock this exponential um, rise in rents, and um, and so I, I think. This is one tool in the toolbox. Um, I think it's a Band-Aid um, in the broader context as we're having a conversation around housing affordability and the roles that the provincial and federal governments need to play in this, particularly um, with the shelter component of income assistance still being at 375. And I think it was noted today uh, by a speaker or staff that it hasn't increased since 2007. I think that needs to be looked at by the province. Um, so this is a tool in the toolbox, but it is certainly not the answer. I also think there needs to be a further look at um, um, and this was done the, by the province um, before, is to look at bringing um, these, uh, this particular housing stock into uh, public ownership and furthering that. And I think that will be further. I understand the, that the mayor is meeting with uh, the provincial government on a number of housing related issues. And I'm certain he'll be bringing that forward and it'll be brought forward at FCM next week. Um, because I, I again, uh, I think this is just one tool in the toolbox for addressing uh, the concerns of, of residents who are at risk of homelessness or being pushed out of affordable housing in the city. Um, so from that perspective, um, I, I'm, I'm pleased to support the report and the recommendations. Um, I would, as I noted in some of my questions, would be interested to see, and this can be dealt with in the budget, about how uh, we might address the resourcing uh, that's proposed in this, and, and I think that can be part of the budget deliberations. Uh, but I am happy to support the recommendations. I think it's important work, and I know a lot of heavy lifting went into this by our staff um, to do the research and the jurisdictional scans uh, to look into this. So thank you for that. And thank you, Councillor Dominato. Councillor Kirby Young to the amended motion. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, and I'm, I'm going to try to not repeat um, what my a lot of my colleagues have said very eloquently, but just maybe offer a few additional points um, in addition to um, expressing thanks as well for everybody that has weighed in, contributed, sent an email, met, called, um, or advocated, or otherwise engaged um, in the community or with Council on this matter. And, and I really appreciate that. Um, I guess I just want to say high level, I think it was noted by staff in the 
language that was used is that this is really a stopgap measure, and I think it is. I actually think that the time for this construct for housing has come and gone. The stock is old, it's aged, um, the city has a well-stated and defined goal to move towards more self-contained units that provide dignity with individual bathrooms um, and provide people with a kitchen space. And I think that that's what we want to aspire to. And I think with COVID, we've really seen the challenge um, in people not having access to those kinds of facilities, um, living in more congregate settings and not being able to have not just the dignity of that space, but the health benefits that that space can provide and the additional risk that people are exposed to when they don't have it. I do think that where it's where the precipice of this of losing the level of housing that is truly for the most vulnerable in terms of the least amount of means and the least amount of options to be able to go somewhere else if they lose their space or can no, can no longer afford their space. Um, and I don't think ultimately, um, just to be very clear, because I'm quite um, it's quite clear to me in terms of the trajectory of where this is going and should go, that this type of stock should be in private sector hands. I think it is something that should be delivered publicly um, for the most vulnerable. And that's that's really honestly what we're talking about is trying to move towards that um, and progressively move it forward. It has been encouraging to see some recent media coverage with respect to commentary about the federal government and minister responsible um, potentially expressing interest in the SRO program. Um, and hopefully that will augment the mentioned advocacy efforts with the provincial government, um, because I think ultimately that's really where we need to go is delivering a better quality type of housing. And it's just not no longer economically feasible for the private sector, or even a lot of nonprofits to do that. And I think the example that was provided by Anne Hart was really powerful. Um, with respect to the budget piece, I know that B is quite um, High level in terms of a funding request and doesn't speak specifically to allocation. I did send in, in addition to the answers that we got back from staff initially around application of the EHT as a source of funding. I sent in some additional questions and I'll just be single explicitly. I'm not satisfied yet with the answers back there with respect to what appears to be um, inconsistency and how that can be used and allocated. So I'm anticipating that that's something that we can explore further and be part of the budget discussion. So I'll signal that because the program does need to be resourced to be effective. But I think that we have some budget pressures. And so I want to make sure that we use all of the budget streams and tools that we have to maximum effect. So other than that, I think that I will close by saying that the cost of homelessness is so significant if we were not to enact this um, because the downstream effects are so much bigger in terms of human health and dignity for the people most affected that we're talking about trying to keep a roof over their head. Um, and it expands out beyond that into the community. Um, we see it in a broader impact on society. We see it on residents, on neighborhoods, um, on small businesses, um, when people are challenged and they have nowhere else to go. Um, and all of the related issues and, and sort of, I would say, downstream impacts that come with that. So. I think that there's there's obviously a very human reason to do this and there's a practical reason to do this as well because um, our homeless challenges have not gotten better. And I think without this and loss of this remaining stock, we would be significantly challenged to do that. So those are my comments and I do appreciate um, all the advocacy on it and I appreciate the work and the options from staff. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Mayor Stewart to the amended motion. Thank you, Chair Carr. Uh, first, I'd like to thank uh, Councillor Swanson for all her work on this over the years. And I think it's very apt that uh, she's moved this motion and, and uh, has concluding comments. Um, this is this is a really important thing we're doing here. Uh, it's important that it's fully funded and it's important that it moves ahead as quickly as possible. Um, Jeanette and I are Fergus. We're, uh, we were walking down Seymour Street, just um, like to check on Emery Barnes Park and the the new OPS and the various housing, um, you know, uh, buildings that we've put in there and everything seemed pretty good. And I was going by the penthouse, uh, talking to the um, management team there who was loading in some supplies and just seeing how their business was doing through the pandemic and things are, are doing better, which is good. And they've also said that the, you know, the, the, the streets seem a little bit uh, better now, which is also good to hear. Um, a young man who was uh, kind of walking by, um, <clears throat> showed some interest in our conversation. Uh, 
he had uh, the all too familiar spasms that we see in the in the city these days uh, stopped by and said, you know, are you talking about me? And I said, well, we're, we're talking about how important it is to get people housing. And he relayed why he was on the street so often through the day was because the SRO that he lives in uh, doesn't even have a sink. Um, he, uh, there are dead rats that fall out of the ceiling and it's making him impossible for him to get his life back on track. This is a young man, probably in his mid to late twenties in serious difficulty. And I think that we have to do extraordinary things to help. Well, I'll call this guy, Steve. We have to, we have to help Steve and this'll be one way we do it. Um, you know, we're the, we're the order of government that has the least amount of power but the things we do can have huge impacts. So I'm very happy to support this. Thanks to staff for all the work. Thanks to the speakers for coming in and saying why this is so important and how we can move forward together. And uh, thanks to council for, I hope, passing this. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor Stewart. And uh, Councillor Swanson to close. Yeah, so um, this is a really important report. I think staff did an awesome job on it. The city has been asking for vacancy control in the SROs for about four years. Um, now the staff says we can do it. So it looks like maybe we're going to, if we can get the dough for it. I'm glad that we'll be working with the benevolent associations. Um, they really are benevolent. That's why their rents are so low and we need to provide more support for them, which I think is part of this plan. Uh, why should we do it? We should do it because we need to stop the loss of housing that's affordable to low income people to prevent more homelessness. We're not building nearly enough social housing to meet the need. And when that happens and we keep reducing the number of units that are available for low income people, we're just, it's just a pipeline to homelessness. There's at least one building for sale as we speak. Um, and these buildings are being sold on the pretense that the new owner can get rid of tenants and raise rents a lot. Um, and this is this vacancy control, as Stephanie Smith said, it's one of the cheapest ways we have to prevent homelessness. We're not building enough social housing and um, even though the SROs aren't good housing, they're better than a tent or an umbrella. We need to do it because as we heard from Chris Kronk, and this was so important to him that he gave his remarks to Krista Butler, so he could tell us that we need to replace fear with hope for downtown Eastside SRO residents and to do that with vacancy control. So who supports this? We heard lots of residents of the SROs. We have their letters and they spoke. Who supports it? Residents from all over the city with a social conscience. We got their emails. Who supports it? Downtown Eastside businesses, the Oval Team, Newtown, Gainwa, Yum, Deep Fried Hot Pepper Tofu. These businesses support vacancy control in the SROs. Social service groups like the Carnegie Association, the Downtown Eastside Neighborhood House, Potluck, UGM, Heart of the City, um, academic researchers, homeowners sent in emails of support. And at the last minute there, I sent you a letter. It was signed actually by the BC Nonprofit Housing Association and the Co Cooperative Housing Federation of BC supporting this report. So who doesn't like it? It's the new investor owners, but I think their fears are overblown. Since July, the province has said that landlords can apply to raise rents. Forget this, not just capital costs, but for operating and for financing costs. Um, and they can raise them for everyone in the building. Um, do these investor owners buy a hotel and then find the maintenance so onerous that they can't operate? No, they like it so much they buy more hotels. Chris Wall has eight. Lippman has, he did have about three. I don't know, maybe he sold some now, but 
they have uh, they're 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 making money and they're using that money to get more hotels. Um, why would someone who can afford to buy so many hotels choose a business and a business model that requires evicting low-income people? I don't know. I can't phantom why one somebody would do that. I certainly wouldn't do it if I had enough money to buy eight hotels. As Tanya Webking said, hotel owners are not victims. We also heard Richard Schwab say that his building was fine for maintenance when the rents were low. And the Benevolent Society buildings generally are pretty good for maintenance and their rents are low. And the staff report talks extensively about working with landlords to upgrade buildings and about trying to get senior and even city funds to help. So I do remember back in the 70s when seven people a year were dying of fires and SROs and I was working at uh, DERA and we were trying to get sprinklers in the hotels and the owner said, oh, you can't do that. It'll be too expensive. We'll have to close down. But the city stuck to its guns. We got the sprinklers and people aren't dying in SRO fires. We probably saved about 300, 350 lives by sticking to the city, by the city sticking to its guns there. Um, of course, landlords aren't going to like something that might reduce their profits, but I actually think it takes quite a bit of gall for a person who owns eight buildings with two pubs to ask the city to forgive its property taxes. Just, we have to remember the pie charts that the staff gave us. How are we going to keep the hotels that are in the yellow and the green wedges from becoming the orange, wedge, orange red wedges that evict people. And the way we can do that is with vacancy controls so that people aren't selling these hotels on the basis that they're micro suites living in a gentrified area instead of on the basis of them being SROs. Councillor Swanson, you are well over time. If you can just wrap in a sentence, please. Okay, I just want to really thank all the folks from the SRO Collaborative who worked tirelessly, the downtown east side folks and their allies, the staff, Councillor Bly for putting in the RAP amendment. And yeah, thanks everybody. And I hope this can pass. I was hoping it would be unanimous, but I don't think it will, but I think it's going to pass anyway. Now all we have to do is get the dough for it. Thanks, Councillor Swanson. Okay, um, so uh, there are no uh, other speakers on the list. Uh, however, um, I have been asked by the clerks to um, have a uh, brief um, break in order for law to check um, on the severing request that Councillor DiGenova has put forward. Staff, about how much time do you think we're going to need for this? Five minutes. Okay, five minute break, everyone, um, and uh, we'll come back for the vote.
input. If uh, people can put their, uh, their uh, cameras on, that's great. Yes, thank you, Chair Carr. So um, we have consulted with legal and as well as staff, and we have determined that section CIC or section C, subsection I, subsection C um, cannot be severed because it is linked to other parts of the main motion. Um, however, having said that, we do agree that that section E can be severed. Thank you, Chair Carr. Thank you. The point of procedure, Chair? Yes, go ahead. Um, it just seems quite extraordinary unless it was public hearing that we would be having um, legal automatically consulted. I, I've noted and was just going through the minutes looking at a number of instances where council members decided to sever even if it had to do with the appendix or the other conditions and they were able to do so. So I'm wondering if this is a new practice moving forward, could you just please let me know because sometimes I find the rules are different for one councillor than another and I just want to make sure we have consistency. Thank I think you. that this was a councillor de Genova um, that, that uh, in fact it was the clerk who alerted me to the fact that uh, there was a concern about the severing of that uh, one one of uh, the requests that you made, um, staff went ho uh, did their due diligence on that and have reported back to you. Was so it my I, point of procedure? My point of procedure is: is this the process that will be followed um, in the future? Of course, because any time there is a question, Councillor Dijanova, any time there is a question that staff raise about the ability to sever, um, their uh, their duty is to ensure um, that uh, that it is possible, and they will seek legal advice in order uh, to to come to the conclusion on whether it can be severed or not. You can expect that in any circumstances under which there is a question in their minds around the ability to uh, to uh, sever in a legal frame. Staff okay. don't do it in future. I will be this happy to This is not a debate, Councillor Di Genova. I have I just answered your question. To know if I could sever. Oh, so I can't. No, you cannot separate. sever the first. Your first request was to sever C. No, I'm, I'm just. Excuse me, Chair. I'm just asking to sever C now. I understood. I understood C. Could we just move on and sever E, and then the rest of the recommendations? Thank you. I've already said that uh, we can do, or the clerk did say they could. You can sever E. That was exactly her her statement, and um, and so yes, we can sever E. Uh, so uh, what we're going to do is vote. Um, I think, uh, clerk, if you can just advise what I think E first, and then we will vote on the rest of the motion. That makes sense. Okay. Does everybody have in front of them um, the motion so that you know exactly what you're voting on? E um, reflects or is the amendment um, that was forwarded by Councillor Bly. And um, just a second, is it on the screen? Oh, we're just waiting for it to get on the screen. One second. It'll. Yeah, we have, we have there, okay. So as I say, um, we're gonna vote first on E and um, it is on the public screen now. That is, as I said, the amendment that was uh, moved by Councillor Bly and, um, and voted on by you unanimously. So um, clerk, if you can take us to a vote on E. And that has passed unanimously. And clerk, if you could take us now. I'll just leave it up there for a second. Great. And uh, now we need a vote on the remainder of the motion. And that um, motion passes with one in opposition, Councillor Di Genova. Okay, great. Thank you again, staff. 
um, for your good work on this, and um, and we can move on with our agenda. Okay. Um, our um, last item on the agenda is a referred item um, that was referred from yesterday's council meeting in order to hear from speakers. Um, I will just remind speakers you have five minutes to make your comments, should state whether you are in support or in opposition to the recommendation, and may only speak once. Committee members, um, you are in committee, so you have up to three minutes to ask questions to speakers. However, speakers, as you know, are under no obligation to respond. Um, so. Um, uh, I will also ask as speakers are residents of Vancouver if it is not noted on the speakers list. All speakers for this item have opted to participate by phone and will be patched through by a moderator when their turn comes up. Finally, per section 7.4a of the amended procedure bylaw, following the end of speakers list for each item, I will go through the list of speakers that have missed their turn. Uh, the referred motion is um, item six, which was previously motion B3, saving lives with community defibrillators and first aid, which was moved and introduced by Councillor Fry and seconded by Councillor Dominato. We will now hear from speakers on this motion. And our first speaker is Percy Williams. Clerk, if you are the clerk here. I'm just, number one, speaker number one is not on the line. Okay. We will move forward to the second speaker on the list, Susan McPherson. And speaker number two is not on the line. I would indicate that we did send out a notification to the speakers. Oh, that's good. Okay. Speaker three is Grace Toppingham. Again, not on the line. Okay, speaker number four is Leanne Strachan. Not on the line. Speaker five is Ken Leggett. Speaker five is on the line. Okay, Ken Leggett, can you hear me? Hi, yes, I can hear you. Thank you for having me tonight. Great. Yep, just state your name and then go ahead up to five minutes. Great. Well, my name is Ken Leggett. I am the Chief Financial Officer at St. John Ambulance BC Yukon. And uh, I'm probably not noted, or maybe it is. I'm, I'm resident of White Rock, but I work in the Canby Street location. And we're you know, thankful to Councillor Fry bringing this motion forward about the support of the community defibrillators in our Start Me Up BC campaign. Uh, most of what we're presenting in this uh, member's motion that's been brought forward, pretty self-explanatory, but our, our program is to provide publicly accessible AEDs uh, across British Columbia and obviously looking to do a number of them in the city of Vancouver and parks and recreational areas and beaches and other areas where there would be significant populations of people at all, you know, hopefully at all hours of the day, but typically looking at things in recreational spots, commuter areas, and then traffic uh, high traffic spots for areas where people are living, residing, or uh, entertaining. Um, the programs really do address the large number of sudden cardiac arrests that happen each year. There's about 6,000 annually in British Columbia. And so people suffering from sudden cardiac arrest, pretty significant health um, issue. And equipping the population with AEDs and life-saving tools is very important to St. John Ambulance. It's part of our mission is helping people save a a life at home, work, and play. One of the other things that we're addressing with this campaign, and obviously we would like to have the support of the City of Vancouver, is wherever we have one of these stands placed, we're including a naloxone kit. The incidence of overdose uh, through opioid use and other narcotic drugs has been significant. As everybody's well aware, there's been thousands of British Columbians die in the last couple of years, and about 7,700 um, in the last, uh, I don't have, in, since 2016. So we believe that it's an important public good, a public safety initiative, and that we can work with uh, the city of Vancouver to place these in areas that would be very uh, opportune, obviously where people are located, so we can provide this help. And then also we'd like to, as part of the program, make available 
obviously through our training centers, community centers with the city of Vancouver, uh, courses where people could register, sign up, and learn how to perform CPR appropriately, identify what uh, sudden cardiac arrest is, an opioid overdose, how to be aware of that, administer naloxone, and then, of course, use an AED. And so that is essentially the whole program. Uh, the motion sets it out quite nicely. And, uh, yeah, just thank you for the time tonight to be able to speak to support of it. And if there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, you do have questions, so just hold on the line there. First, from Councillor Fry. Go ahead. Up to three minutes. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Ken, for joining us. Um, I just want to frame it that, like, whereas the St. John Start Me Up program was certainly an inspiration for this motion, uh, we can't go with a sort of sole procurement model. So what this motion really addresses is kind of exploring how the city can get out of the way possibly and, and facilitate the deployment of these units. So I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how these, your specific units and that model of the, the accessible community defibrillator works and how it could be deployed at sort of no cost to the city if we just made the space available. Hmm. Well, what we've done so far, and I can just give a brief summary and I'll try and be as quick as possible. We've been working with community uh, fundraising groups like Rotaries, uh, Lions Club, predominantly the Rotaries to place these so far along the SkyTrain line between Templeton Station at YVR and the Waterfront Station. I believe we have five or six in, in, in market now. And so if the City of Vancouver was making the space available, uh, we'd be working with community groups, other fundraising organizations to help raise money. And of course, St. John Ambulance is a registered charity, so we'd also be raising funds for these through our own operations. But we've also put forward uh, an application for a grant from the province to help provide funding for the cabinets, the AED cabinets that would be available in public spaces. So depending on the funding awarded and what we'd be able to raise, uh, St. John Ambulance would be working you know, in tandem with partners to put those defibrillators in, in the appropriate locations that are identified by the city. Right. And so mechanically speaking, this is... Uh, how how sturdy is it for putting it outdoors and in public spaces? Is it weatherproof? The cabinet itself is made out of a, a, an ABS type plastic. It's essentially marine grade, so the stand itself is able to withstand the elements quite well. The AED is housed inside a monitored cabinet that's attached to the stand, and that cabinet has a heating element and a fan in it. So it keeps the rain and water out, and it also, in our environment, is quite good at keeping the AED device working in an optimal temperature range. Uh, it's as high as 40 degrees Celsius and as low as minus 20 that it will keep the device kind of in and around the optimal, above freezing and then an optimal temperature range. Uh, so it's quite durable. The stand itself is freestanding. It basically uses two large leg bolts through the bottom and fender washers and, uh, and nuts to secure it. And once it's bolted down tight, the device is pretty sturdy. We have our one located in front of our offices on Canby and 45th. Uh, the device is sturdy. We also have Great. additional mounting brackets that would basically, basically an L bracket that would bolt into the side if there's an additional support that's needed. Uh, you know, in case the, the mounting location, you're not able to install a leg bolt uh, long enough or uh, get, get easy access to it. So we can be bolted from the sides as well. Once it's installed, it's quite sturdy. Uh, and then it only requires uh, a standard, you know, 120 volt, 15 amp uh, power connection. And there's a, a power supply inside the cabinet. And then the location for the power cord coming out is really determined by where the, the power source is that it's plugging into or being wired, you know, hardwired into. And so it's, it's, it's sturdy, it's durable, it's weather resistant, it's UV resistant as well, so it won't fade or crack. Uh, it won't get brittle like the turtle pool. Uh, so it is quite durable and it's designed for outdoor use. Thanks, thanks for that turtle pool reference. I appreciate that. Um, just <laughs> with the last minute that I have on my questions, can you just walk me, I mean, we're pretty familiar with anoxone and, and how that works for rapid response and keeping people oh, alive. Uh, actually, Councillor Fry, oh, you only have I'm three have minutes. We're in committee. Oh, well, never mind then. I'm All right. so Thank sorry. You. Um, yeah, but you have other questions coming to you. Councillor Dominato next. All right. Thank you. 
Uh, thanks, Chair. Thanks, Ken, for calling in this evening. Um, just, I just wanted to follow up a question with respect to just the ongoing maintenance of the defibrillators. Um, at one stage, quite some time ago, when we were looking in the school setting, there was questions that arose around sort of ongoing care of them, maintenance, batteries, things like that. And um, just curious if you could comment on that and, and who's responsible for that uh, when you go down the path of uh, partnering with municipalities or other agencies. Sure, there's a couple different funding mechanisms that we've endeavored uh, to design for it. One would be an outright purchase by the city or for-profit or non-profit organization that wanted to have it. And there would be a service contract that they could enter into with St. John Ambulance for us to monitor that. The other is looking for a sponsorship program whereby St. John Ambulance retains the ownership of the device and, and the maintenance and supply of the pads and batteries and so on. Um, so depending on, on how it was placed and the funding that would go on, um, that would determine how we handle that. The device is monitored remotely. So each AED that's installed in one of the cabinets has a, a lead or an attachment that attaches to the device, to the monitoring system. And then we're able to remotely monitor the life of the pad the battery and the operating quality essentially of the device. We know it's, you know, yes, it's working well. Oh, it's six months out from the pads expiring. There, there's um, a microchip essentially in the, each the pad and the battery that tells us when it's nearing expiry. So we're able to monitor that. Then it's, it's a $240 a year access to what they call a via net. That's the back-end software of the provider of the red cabinet that houses the AED. And then there's an annual charge of about the same for connection to the cellular network that we're working with. Uh, and so that, that cost is included in the installation cost of the first two years. And then we'd be looking for funding support for the, the monitoring and connections to the network after that. Thanks for elaborating on that. That's really helpful context. And then my second question is simply um, in the in the context of a, a city, uh, where do you see uh, uh, the areas would, which would have see the highest need for us to deploy defibrillators? In the city of Vancouver, I mean, I would like to see where the the highest volume of, of traffic is of individuals. You know, it could be a residential area. It could be a commuter corridor. Uh, for now, we've been looking predominantly at transit locations, whether it be park and ride, bus transfer stations, and things like the SkyTrain. Uh, we've also been looking at potential, map, look, getting access to mapping data, determining where some of the ride shares have been for the bicycles, like the bicycle share program and car share, looking to see what the movement of people is. And then there could be other large, you know, it could be down in the... Uh, uh, anywhere where there's a, an outdoor uh, recreation event or or bodies of people, uh, you know, it could be at the beaches, Stanley Park, it could be in other areas. Some of that we'd want to work with your staff uh, to identify where the most opportune locations would be. Great, and that's Great. Um, it Thanks. for your time. Thanks, that's my time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. very much. There are more questions for you, though. Councillor Di Genova, up to three minutes. Thanks so much. I'm actually going to take myself off the queue and go back on because I just lost my question that I typed out. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Oh. Councillor Kirby Young, you're, you're next. Yeah, hi. Thanks for speaking to Council. I'm looking for clarification uh, following up on Councillor Dominato's questions with respect to cost um, because I'm a little confused. You were talking about a funding mechanism in terms of funding from the city or maintenance costs or fund, if they're fundraised for, but I received an email directly from your um, CEO Ty Spear, who said suggested that um, clarified in the email that it was a, an emphasized, I would say that this was at no cost to the city of Vancouver. And in doing some homework and looking at your website, saw your fundraising campaign that you actively have um, in terms of soliciting donations for these um, for these units. So can you clarify the discrepancy between well, your CEO statement that there would be no cost to the city and the comments that certainly. you made with respect to what the cost would be? Certainly, we're we're looking. To We've got an application for a grant in front of the province currently uh, or being submitted to the province in support of the program and looking for the province of you know, British Columbia to assist in the funding. Um, <clears throat> nothing's granted or awarded yet, so that is 
uh, being submitted. So depending on the funding that we'd receive from that source, it would reduce the cost to the community for the installation. Uh, we are actively fundraising for the stands. So if we, you know, if we worked with, say, uh, I don't know, a local nonprofit who said, okay, we identify in this community, we'd like to have a stand, they raised money for it with our, our fundraising team as well. We were able to raise the money. We'd provide that stand at no cost to the city of Vancouver. Uh, if there was uh, another community association or other way that funding was provided, like for instance, a business that wanted to sponsor a stand, uh, we would place that at no cost to the city. And so we are looking at a, a multiple different ways of funding these and being able to put them in the community at no cost. Uh, if the city of Vancouver said we want another you know, 50 units and we didn't have fundraising established for that and the city wanted to purchase them, that, that would be another way. So there's, we are looking to raise money from our communities to put these in and have you know, community ownership over them, uh, excitement around the program and getting the community involved also in the CPR and AED training as well, well so that people are equipped to respond. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I'm just jumping in because I have limited time. How's the fundraising been going? So it's an aspiration and that's your intent. That's what I'm hearing. Um, how's the fundraising been going so far? Well, pretty good. I mean, it's a new program for us. It launched February of this year, kind of a, was our our uh, uh, launch of the program. And we've raised funds so far for a little over 13, and we have uh, a, few, a few more that we're actively raising money for currently. Okay, I'll leave it there because that's my time. Thank you. Thanks, right, thank Councillor Kirby Young. And uh, back to you, Councillor DiGenova. Thanks so much. Um, and thanks, Ken, for speaking to this and for all the work you do with St. John Ambulance. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, wanted to ask you, um, are you are you aware about the city? I was a park board commissioner at the time. I remember it well that the first um, AEDs were placed in community centers in the city by the Jean, uh, Marco Jean Maria Memorial Society. And just wondered if you do any work with them or if uh, part of what you do would be to kind of maintain some of those. I mean, would you suggest and support sort of broad donations of this if we could find ways to sort of partner together with other organizations, inclusive of St. John Ambulance? I'm not familiar with the with the organization that you just referenced that helped with those first ones at the community centers, but um, uh, clear, clearly they're of the same mind and mission that we are is to help put these kinds of devices in the hands of the community to you know, save a life. Um, if there was other organizations that wanted to partner with us to help raise funds for these AEDs to be placed, whether that's another registered charity or other organization, we'd be more than happy to work with partners. And this is a big goal. Uh, it's something that we envision and would love to have more support from the broader community. So we would that would definitely be on the table for us, something we would welcome. Okay, thanks so much. Great, um, that, uh, so thank you, Councillor DiGenova, and that is it for your questions, and thank you for both coming to speak to Council tonight and to um, answering all those questions, and for your good work. All right. all right, thank you very much. I appreciate the time tonight. Yeah, well, we appreciate you coming. Thank you. Thank um, you. So uh, uh, that is the end of the speaker's list, but as per protocol, I will go through the list again uh, to call out the names of um, those who were not uh, on the line when I first called their names. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, number one, Percy Williams. And the clerk, if you could just respond. I'm just checking, Chair Carr. And uh, speaker number one is not on the line. Right, okay, thank you. Speaker two, Susan McPherson. Number two is not on the line. Great. Speaker three, Grace Toppingham, Toppington, I mean. Number three is not on the line. Okay. That does um, close the speaker's list then. And, um, oh, sorry. Four. Oh, and then number four. Sorry. You're absolutely right. Didn't turn the page. Leanne Strachan. And I get to say number four is not on the line. <laughs> Thank you, but thank you for getting that right protocol in there. Um, so that um, that does close um, the list, as I say, and um, that moves us into um, 
into the debate um, on this matter. So, um, uh, and there is there any discussion? And I see, um, Councillor Dijanova, are you on for discussion at this point? I am. I am Great. on for discussion. There Thank you go. Chair. And um, I'm just going to, sorry, reset your timer. You have five minutes in discussion. Thank you. I, I really appreciate Councillor Fry bringing forward this, um, this amendment. I think that it's important that not only do we consider um, where we have AEDs in the city of Vancouver, but also uh, training people to understand where they are and how to use them. Um, it's very simple, but in an emergency, it can be overwhelming for people, um, understandably. So really appreciate the awareness and advocacy here. Um, I did, as I mentioned in my questions to Ken, um, and this is this is the basis of the amendment and, you know, maybe might help address some of Councillor Kirby Young and I think Councillor Dominato's questions and points um, surrounding funding as well, is that the um, Jean Franco and Gia Maria Memorial Society um, did actually, and I've sent Council all of the link, I just circulated that, um, they had funded the first AEDs that went into community centers in um, in, in Vancouver. So I also just wanted to make sure that this, this uh, motion uh, included, and I've offered an amendment hoping, I know we can't make anything technically a friendly amendment, but hoping that it will be seen that way, um, to, to be inclusive of other opportunities and other organizations, such as this organization that funds this exact need and uh, have provided 21 in the city of Vancouver. And Council, you'll note um, just recently in your email, I've sent that over to you. So I'm um, hoping there's support for this amendment. Again, I, I think that it's important that we see more of them in the community and St. John's Ambulance does a great job and I think their campaign should be included and maybe even included in maintenance for everything completely on top of the AEDs, but also just want to make sure that we're looking at all options and are inclusive of all opportunities for donations and fundraising here. Okay, sorry, I didn't move us to an amendment queue, so I'm going to do that now. And- um, oh, I'm done, but <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Councillor, Councillor Weeb, was that a holdover on the amendment queue? Councillor sure. Council Weeb, I, uh, you're on the, I, have you on that amendment queue, but um, you just, your name was That's there. a holdover. That's a holdover. Great. Councillor Fry, to the amendment. Yeah, sure. Uh, and and uh, thanks to Councillor DiGenova for introducing this and happy to support it. I, I had to Google the Gianfranco uh, Gemaria uh, Memorial Society and see uh, their history. And I, I hadn't realized, in fact, one of, the, one of the things that came out of introducing this motion is I had a lot of people that we all know uh, that have reached out and said how AEDs have saved their lives. And uh, one former city employee, I guess I can name him because he said it on Twitter, Ken Karuska, he was actually saved. He used to work for the city of Vancouver and he had a massive heart attack at the five rinks or at the, um, sorry, eight rinks in Burnaby. And it was it was this society's defibrillator, one of the first ever that was installed there that saved his life. So I think uh, in the spirit of that, I'm happy to support this amendment and any, any groups that are uh, really advancing um, life-saving interventions uh, for folks in our city and around British Columbia. Great, thanks, Councillor Fry. Um, I don't see anyone else on the queue to speak to this, so Claire, could you take us to a vote on this amendment by Councillor DiGenova? Chair, could I get a vote assist in favor? Okay, that was Councillor Weeb. Councillor Dominato, do you, okay, that's great. That is unanimous. Wonderful. So um, we are going back to the main queue. Councillor DiGenova, um, do you have any other comments uh, to this uh, motion as now amended? Uh, no, I, I wholeheartedly support it, as I said before. Great. Okay, Councillor Kirby Young to the amended motion. Uh, yeah, I have an amendment also, Chair, if you want to move us to an amendment queue. Thank you. And um, I just thought I'd get you on there. Go ahead, yeah. to your amendment. Thank you. Um, and I'll speak briefly, Chair. I appreciate Councillor Fry bringing this motion forward. Um, and the spirit of the amendment is just also sort of noting that the speaker had talked about a lot of well-frequented um, places, such as beaches and other areas. and 
many of those fall under the jurisdiction of the Vancouver Park Board. I know there's some uh, defibrillators that are at community centres. It's not necessarily widespread across the entire network. And you think of a lot of public places where there is a critical gathering of people, whether it's community centres, pools, beaches, ice rinks, uh, you know, where people are active and doing things. We have uh, a number of marinas that the Park Board operates and three public golf courses um, where people are active um, and outside. Um, it seems to me that it would make it, it would be beneficial um, to the spirit of the motion to extend staff's work to include consultation with the park board um, to look at what they have already and where some opportunities may be um, to play some of these in some of the uh, the high frequented locations. So that's the spirit of the amendment. Great, thank you. And um, just to the amendment, Councillor DiGenova. Thanks. Um, Councillor Kirby Young, happy to support this. Just wondered if um, I'd sent a link over to Council just to outline the previous amendment I'd made, and it already notes sort of the city's um, inclusiveness uh, with Park Board in, in highlighting that, uh, not only on the city page, but in public facilities in the city of Vancouver, and noting those in community centres. So is this, um, did you want staff to do work above and beyond what's already being done, or? to consult with the park board or I'm just trying to understand if this is new direction or if this is the, the same. I'm sorry, I'm not... I could add that as a point of information to the um, mover of the amendment through you, Chair. Thank you. We'll go ahead, Councillor yeah, Kirby Young. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to answer a point of information, but can you clarify your question, Councillor Did you know? I'm not sure I understood it. Well, my question is, is the city website already notes in public facilities um, the Vancouver Park Board and, the, and that's where I just um, sent over the information to all of council from. Understand if, if you, I'm not sure if everyone's had a chance to review it, but my question was, do you do you not think this this is already being done in the page on public facilities, noting the park board and the city? I think that there's a number of locations that are not necessarily covered. Um, I would cite beaches potentially as one of them. Um, there's new facilities that come on board. For example, we're building a new Marple Community Center. Um, and there'll, there'll be other facilities as they go through planning with respect to um, things like the pool strategy and development. So um, as I mentioned in my comments, I'm looking to ensure that we can try to improve and increase the coverage of what's there. I'm happy to support this, although I, I do note that on the, the website already, it speaks about the community centers um, and the pools that the AEDs are already in. So I'm happy to support it, but not sure that it's not already, already being covered. Great, thank you. Um, Councillor Fry to the amendment. Yeah, I, I just, I, thanks to Councillor Kirby Young, I appreciate this. I didn't, honestly didn't really cross my mind, but I think that as we're looking at this as a future planning kind of exercise and opportunities to install these, I think covering more bases is, is great. And I think that we do collaborate a lot with Park Board on those sort of master planning initiatives and obviously where we want amenities uh, as part of complete communities and the Vancouver plan and stuff. So I think this is a, Welcome addition and thanks uh, Kirby Young for reminding me. Great, um, that looks like um, it for speakers to the amendment. So Clerk, could you move us to a vote on this amendment? Can I get a vote assist in favor, please? Yep, thanks, that's Councillor Weep, Clerk. Okay, and that is unanimous. Great. We are back to the main queue. Councillor Kirby Young, do you have anything else to add to the um, to uh, your um, to uh, speak to in support or not of the main <laughs> motion as amended? Yeah, thanks, Chair Carl. I'll just offer a couple. I'll just offer a couple of quick comments, and. And maybe it's a personal observation and perhaps a little different than Councillor Fry mentioned earlier. And, and that would be that, and it specifically struck me in terms of point one in this um, motion when I spoke to those that have lost people due to cardiac arrest. And I was really happy to hear Councillor Fry's comment that people had reached out to him and he had spoken with people um, who had experienced the benefit of having these devices. And I think that when they are not as readily available, there are people that, or people are not educated about them and they're not able to access the devices. 
um, or they simply were not there. There are also a lot of people that I think could benefit from having them um, that lost somebody because they didn't have the benefit of having one of these devices. And so I, I would share that from a personal perspective, having, sorry, give me a second. Um, having lost a parent who passed away at cardiac arrest in front of me, I really think that extending these devices is, is a great thing to do. And I really appreciate Councillor Fry bringing it forward. Thank you, Councillor Kirby Young. Uh, Council, I do not see anyone else in the queue. So, Clerk, I wonder if you could move us to a vote on the amended motion. Again, I'd like to vote in favor. Council of Gijanova, do you need a vote assist? Voted showing I voted. Um, no. But I'll click again. There, it now, now, well, now it does show that you voted. So that is unanimous. Great. So, Council, that does take us to the end of our agenda. Um, and second. The standing committee of this uh, portion of this meeting is now complete. Uh, we will now convene in council, and um, clerk, I don't believe the mayor is here, correct? That is correct. So over to you as deputy mayor. So I will, I will continue as chair, as deputy mayor, to deal with the recommendations and actions from today's meeting. Um, so um, let's just start by convening in council to deal with the recommendations and actions from the Standing Committee on Policy and Strategic Priorities meeting from today, uh, one bylaw for enactment and urgent business. Deputy City Clerk, may we have the roll call, please? Yes, Mayor Stewart is absent. Uh, chair Carr is in the chair, Deputy Mayor. Councillor De Genova. Present. Councillor Fry. Present. Councillor Swanson. Here. Councillor Hardwick. Present. Councillor Weep. Here. Present. Councillor Boyle. Present. Councillor Dominato. Present. Councillor Bly. Present. Councillor Kirby Young. Present. The meeting has quorum, Deputy Mayor Carr. Great, thank you. Um, we need a motion to adopt the Standing Committee's recommendations for items one through so six. Councillor DiGenova. And a seconder? Second, Hardwick. Great. Um, is uh, all those in favor say yay? Yay. 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 Opposed, say nay. The motion is carried unanimously. Uh, we have one bylaw on the agenda for enactment. Bylaw one is a bylaw to authorize the borrowing of certain sums of money from January 8th 2022 to January 7, 2023, pending the collection of real property taxes. So moved. And, yes, it's just one second. And this bylaw was subject to approval of item one on today's standing committee agenda. Um, does any so council member wish to declare a conflict on this item? Hearing none, Councillor De Genova, if you would like to move the motion. Just right. trying to keep it going. Chair. Yep, yep. Just <laughs> I, I have to follow you. Second. Process. Thank you, um, Councillor Weeb. Any discussion? All those in favor say yay. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. We have seven items of urgent business. The first is a motion to make changes to the business license panel. That myself, Councillor Carr, replaced Councillor Dominato at the business license hearing on November 24th, 2021 from 6 to 9, uh, 10 p.m. And further, that Councillor Dominato replaced myself, Councillor Carr, at the business license hearing on December 14th, 2021 from 9.30 a.m. to 12 p.m. Is there a mover for this? So moved. So moved. Thank you. And I, and I heard Councillor Dominato as a seconder. All those in favor say yay. 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 All those opposed say nay. Great, carries unanimously. Next, a request for leave of absence for Councillor Bly for meetings on November 23rd, 2021, from 3 to 10 p.m. for civic business. 
for oh December 2nd, 2021, from 9.30 a.m. to noon for personal reasons, and for December 16th, 2021, from 3 to 4 p.m. for personal reasons. Is there a mover? Move adoption. Thank you. Councillor DiGenova, seconder. Second. Second. <laughs> Thank you, Councillor Hardwick. All those in favor say yay. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Next is a request for leave of absence for Councillor Fry from Civic Business from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. today, hmm, November 17th, 2021. Is there a mover? So moved. So moved, Councillor Bly. Okay, I've, um, I heard Councillor DeGenova first, but Councillor Bly, uh, happy to have you second it. Um, all those in favor say yay. Yay. Okay. yay. All those opposed yay. say nay. All the motion carries unanimously. Next is a request for a leave of absence for Councillor Weeb for civic business from 6 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. on November 18th, 2021. Is there a mover? So moved. Thank you. Is there a, has Councillor DiGenova, is there a second? Second, Dominato. Thank you. All those in favor say yay. 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 All those opposed say nay. Great, carries unanimously. Next, a request for leave of absence for Mayor Stewart for meetings on November 23rd, 2021 from 6 to 10 p.m. for civic business. And on November 25th, 2021 from 3 to 10 p.m. also for civic business. Is there a mover? Move adoption. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Councillor DiGenova, seconder. Boyle. Second. Second. Thank you, I heard Boyle first. Uh, all those in favor say yay. 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 All those opposed say nay. Motion carries unanimously. Next is a request for leave of absence for myself for personal reasons from 11.30 a.m. to 2.30 p.m. on December 2nd, 2021. Is there a mover? So moved. Thank you. Second, Dominato. Thank you. Um, all those in favor say yay. 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 All those yay. opposed say nay. Carries unanimously. For the last item of urgent business, I understand that Councillor Bly has an urgent motion for Council's consideration. Councillor Bly, you have two minutes to introduce your motion. Thank you very much, um, Chair, and I will make this um, introduction as brief as possible and appreciate Council uh, indulging this urgent motion. So the motion itself is uh, raising the transgender flag on November 20th to mark Transgender Day of Remembrance and Beyond. Uh, and this motion um, asks that the that Council direct staff to raise the transgender flag at Vancouver City Hall and light up Burrard Bridge and City uh, hall in white, blue, and pink on Saturday, November 20th to honor the victims of transphobic violence and the memory of transgender people whose lives have been lost in acts of anti-transgender violence in accordance with the Council's ongoing commitment to uh, equity, diversity, inclusion, and tackling all forms of exclusion and discrimination for transgender variant and two-spirit people. And further that uh, Council direct staff to raise the, the flag at City Hall, as well as light up Bird Bridge at City Hall on each subsequent Transgender Day of Remembrance ongoing. Great, thank you. Um, is there a seconder? Happy to second. Yes, Councilor thank Dijanova. you. I, yes, great. Um, uh, Councillors, any discussion? I, there is, so Councillor Bly, um, I'll, if you're okay, I'll move you forward. You're good, your statement? Great, yeah. thank you. Councillor um, Boyle. I saw Councillor Boyle, I'm sorry. Councillor Boyle, did you want to did you want to be added again, Councillor DiGenova? No, I was just afraid you were going to call the vote, so I wanted no, you to introduce no, Councillor Council, Boyle. With that, Councillor Boyle, to the I'm happy for us to get to the vote just to say a, a big thank you. It's great. Um, okay, incredibly important. Thank, great, <laughs> thank you, Councillor Boyle. Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah, can can I just ask one clarifying point of information uh, to the mover through you? Yes, go ahead. Um, yeah, and just a very simple one, Councillor Bly, you had mentioned City Hall and Burrard Bridge, but the motion says City Hall and BC Place. I just wanted to clarify. There's, up, then, uh, there's updated language that I see um, staff, the clerks may not have um, the latest version. We don't decide um, how BC Place is lit up. Um, that's, what I was, that's what I was wondering. So there is an amendment. I haven't seen it. That's why, that's why I'm asking the question. Yeah, no, fair enough. I'll just ask the clerks to put the correct version up that replaces BC Place with Broadbridge. Okay, thank you. Just wanted to make sure those were synced. Thanks very much. No, I appreciate the attention to detail. That's great. Um, and uh, perhaps before we vote on it, we'll just make sure that that correction is made, clerks, so that the public is aware that we're, we're voting on. Did you say, um, sorry, I did have a question. No, Councillor Kirby Young, is that it for? Yes. Great. Thank you. Um, 
So I will add next slide. I did hear, uh, I thought I heard verbally that it was City Hall and Burrard Bridge. Can I just see clarification on that? That's correct. Great, okay, Clerks, City Hall and Burrard Bridge. Excellent, okay. Let's all just take a nice big breather and stretch a bit as the clerks get the language up. Yes, that was very, very fast. Great. Um, I'm not seeing anybody else on the queue, so I think clerks, you can take us to a vote on this, uh, this motion. Assist in favor. Um, yep, just one second. That was Councillor Weeb in favor. Councillor Swanson, Councillor DiGenova, do you need a, oh, no, you don't. Everybody's in favor. That was unanimous. Um, that is great. Um, would someone like to move motion to adjourn the meeting? Adjourn. Oh. I have a point of I just want to point out that Councillor Fry is on the uh, list there. Oh. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so go ahead, Councillor Fry. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chair. I, I just submitted, a, I, I didn't realize this would come up today, but I just submitted a, a, a request through the clerks to also enter some new urgent business. Uh, I did send it to the amendment queue. Um, yesterday, in our haste to try and, and, and extend our deadline, uh, we we abruptly ended the conversation around um, the member motion for uh, supporting crisis centers. Uh, it didn't get referred to hear speakers. It is a somewhat time critical uh, decision uh, because the province is expected to make a decision uh, as soon as this month. And so if council would indulge, I, I, I would be happy to see us uh, skip referring it to hear speakers and just proceed directly to debate and decision. Point of procedure. Sorry, I'm gonna to have to um, just check on this one first, Councillor Fry, before, uh, I'm, I'm just gonna take a moment oh, to do just, that. Do clerks just, the clerks just replied. Um, yes. So you do the trouble. <laughs> Unfortunately, this was not on the agenda yesterday and the agenda therefore is on unfinished business. Yes. And the agenda for December 14th. Right. Uh, okay, so we were all about to troop out to the hallway, but we have all resumed our chairs again. <laughs> um, yes, it, it, it is not on the right agenda to be able to to be dealt with at this mo at this uh, at this time, Councillor Fry. I understand. Okay. Okay. Councillor Kirby Young. Yeah. I, while we're going for it, I also had a point of procedure, um, and that was going to be that um, our. We're not able to bring up notices and motion of new business either because we ran on the clock on that and that was also referred to December 14th. Is that correct? Yes, that is. I'm seeing nods from the clerk and from okay. the city manager. Okay, I thought I'd ask in case Councillor Fry could get that one on that we could do notices and motion too, but thank you. <laughs> yeah, no problem. So um, uh, all of that was um, after we adjourned. <laughs> so at well, least we had the motion to adjourn. Um, uh, oh, actually, I think it was didn't confusing. It we didn't actually, I think there was an attempt to adjourn, um, but it was intervened uh, with uh, with Councillor Fry. So I'm now looking for a motion, motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Ah, perfect, Second. Councillor Hardwick. Second. Okay. Second. Seconder. Councillor Was that Kirby? Yes. Yeah. Um, and all those in favor say yay. Yay. Any opposed say nay. The motion is carried unanimously. The meeting is adjourned. Well done, Council. Well done, Thanks, staff. staff to you. Thank you. See you tomorrow night. Yes. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Bye.